All right, good morning um, from Garden Grove, California. My name is Mark Gorelnik, I'm chair of the council and I'm pleased to call to order the 269th meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council in Garden Grove, California. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during this meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and to provide the council with comments on issues before the council at this meeting. Please note that the webinar chat feature should not be used for technical issues and not used to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on the November Council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed to the person in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. However, when there are many folks wanting to comment in order to allow everyone an opportunity, those times can be reduced both for groups and for individuals. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please submit them in electronic format to the electronic portal when you sign up for testimony. Written comments must relate directly to your oral testimony to be accepted at this stage. After you speak to the agenda item, the comments will be posted and made part of the official record of this meeting. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recordings will be available by contacting the council office, or you may purchase audio recording copies from the meeting recorder, Mr. Craig Hess. Let me remind council members and our microphones so all can hear and also means you need to turn on the microphone when you speak and turn it off when you're done. Lastly, I ask that all council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on their cell phones and mute your connection while the council meeting is in session. I'd like to welcome to this meeting, Ms. Marlene Bellman, a new staff member of the council. And at this time, I'd like to ask Executive Director, Mr. Merrick Burden to call the roll of council members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will now call the roll of the November 2022 meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Phil Anderson. Here. Michael Clark or Benjamin Cross. Here. Robert Dooley. Here. <clears throat> Brett Edinger. Here. Danny Evanson. Here. Mark Gorelnik. Still here. Heather Hall. Here. Dave Hansen is absent. Pete Hassemer. Here. David Hogan. Virgil Moore. Here. John North. Here. Joseph Oatman. Brad Pettinger. Here. Corey Ridings. Here. Butch Smith. Here. Krista Svensson. Present. Ryan Wolf. Here. And Marcy Uremko. Here. That concludes the roll, Mr. Chairman, and you have a quorum. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we get started on the agenda, we'll need to approve the agenda, which is item uh, A4. So I'll, I'll look around the table and see if there are any uh, additions, corrections uh, to the agenda. And if not, I'll look for a motion to approve the agenda.
Oh, Mr. Moore, please. I move that we accept the agenda. Is there a second? Seconded by Bob Dooley. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? All right, we have an agenda. Thank you very much for the motion. So now that we have an agenda, we'll go on to the next item on the agenda, which is the executive director's report. And I'll turn to Mr. Eric Mer Merrick Burton. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things uh, to report to you. One, uh, as you've already made note of, we do have uh, some staff changes that are underway. Uh, we do have uh, our friend and colleague John DeVore is retiring uh, at the end of this year, and this is his last council meeting. Uh, he's put in uh, 20 years uh, with the council and has uh, supported the council quite well through his tenure. We are welcoming uh, Marlene Bellman. This is her first meeting as council staff. I believe many of you know her. Uh, she has been around our process for several years. I've personally known her since graduate school days, uh, and I think she will do quite well and she is uh, uh, shadowing John at this meeting um, and is gearing up to staff the SSC. So she'll play a very important role uh, with our office. Now, there are several uh, informational reports that I'll flag for you. I don't feel the need to summarize them, but there are some matters that may be of interest, ranging from IUU fishing to uh, salmon habitat and some other matters. And we also have, uh, shifting gears a little bit, we also have some alternates at this meeting and as a has become standard practice i'll uh, mention who those alternates are and who they're sitting in in for at this meeting so starting with the uh, cpsas we have mark fina sitting in place for anthony buoso on the hmsmt we have eric anderson sitting in for jessica watson on the odfwc on the stt we have grace easterbrook sitting in for candace morgenstern on the cdfw seat on the SAS, we have Mark Newell sitting in for Darius Peak on Oregon Troll seat. On the SAS, we have Steve Solstrom, who is uh, in place for a seat that is currently vacant on the Washington Charter seat. On the GAP, we have Paul Moranti sitting in for Steve Westrick on the Washington on the Washington Charter seat. And on the GMT, we have Mr. James Phillips sitting in for Carolyn, Caroline McKnight on the CDFW seat. Um, that's all I feel uh, compelled to speak to at the moment, Mr. Chairman, but I'm happy to uh, address any other questions. All right, let me see if there are any questions for Merrick Burton at this point. I'm not seeing any hands, so good job. Um, our next uh, item uh, is uh, open public comment. I believe that we have three folks signed up. Uh, I don't know who is in the house and who is remote. Actually, it looks like the first two are remote. So if you'll raise your hand uh, in the Ring Central feature, it'll be easier for our staff to find you and enable your microphone. And we'll start with uh, Austin Newcomer, followed by Bill Blue, and then Nicole Baker will take us home. So Austin, are you with us? Yes, I am, sir. I can hear you, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the council. My name is Austin Newcomer. I was born and raised in Coos County, Oregon, and I do have friends and family, both formerly and currently employed in various sectors of the commercial fishing industry. And we, of course, all very much enjoy the many recreational fisheries Oregon offers. I'm currently a Master of Public Policy student at UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, where I'm specializing in marine environmental policy. I apologize for not being there in person this morning, but I do have midterms this week and I just couldn't get away long enough. I'm actually here today as part of an assignment for a course I'm currently taking at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which requires public testimony on a matter of ocean policy. I should also mention that I am an active duty officer of the United States Coast Guard, having most recently served as the Living Marine Resources Officer at Sector Columbia River in Astoria, Oregon from June 2019 until earlier this year. So I must say that uh, the views I share today are my own and do not reflect those of the Coast Guard or my university. Uh, and in that spirit, rather than comment on a potentially controversial agenda item, I chose to come to your open comment period today with an admittedly uh, unsolicited uh, rulemaking recommendation I'd like to see you put forward to NOAA. 
It's one that I believe would move uh, fishery science, management, enforcement, transparency, as well as the safety of life at sea in a positive direction with little or no downside. Uh, the recommendation entails beginning to transition away from the vessel monitoring system and towards leveraging and adopting the superior automatic identification system technology. Specifically, in the short term, I'd like to see a rulemaking which would accept AIS in lieu of VMS. Uh, this would therefore start as a voluntary program. Uh, I know there will be those here today that disagree with this idea, but please let me briefly make the case that it's at least worth exploring. Uh, I'll do so mainly in the context of uh, NOAA's national standard guidelines to councils in the development of FMPs. Uh, of the FMPs for which this council already has required VMS, namely groundfish, I believe transitioning to AIS for remote monitoring would position the council to better espouse at least three of those guidelines. National standard two requires uh, the best scientific information by pinging as often as every two seconds, AIS data offers magnitudes greater spatial resolution than VMS data, which only recently improved to a 15 minute ping rate. So for each vessel that would begin reporting position information to NOAA via AIS, the scientific data generated would be vastly improved and would ultimately support more informed decision-making by this council. National standard seven requires minimization of cost and avoidance of unnecessary duplications. Transitioning to AIS for monitoring would reduce cost to industry and NOAA. For the fishermen, VMS has a cost to install and a subscription cost and is of no direct utility to them, where AIS only has the installation cost and is extremely useful to the fishermen. As for NOAA, I don't know exactly what they pay to administer VMS and run VTRAC, but that could be reduced or eventually eliminated. And I do know that the U.S. Coast Guard Navigation Center is going to continue to maintain the publicly available national AIS system at no cost for these purposes. Commercial fishing vessels 65 feet or longer are already required to have AIS. It's not an exact one-for-one -one duplication because VMS includes a declar declaration where AIS does not. However, in my experience, the declaration is a very low value because any experienced fish manager or enforce enforcement person could look at AIS position, track line, season, landing data, and, and easily ascertain what the fishery engaged in is. Also, the fishermen very often forget to update the declaration, which badly taints the data. So I think there's a strong case that this is, in effect, a duplication at a cost with no or little added value. Finally, National Standard 10 requires the FMP to promote the safety of life at sea. As I mentioned, VMS is of no practical use to the fishermen, where AIS has real and tangible benefits. It greatly enhances situational awareness, reduces the risk of collisions, and aids search and rescue assets in locating a vessel in distress. So it's just to everybody's benefit. The more AIS in use, the better. And finally, it's not exactly explicitly mentioned in the guidelines, but transparency is an increasingly important quality in our fields, and AIS data is publicly available information and is therefore far more transparent than private BMS data. So I'm a huge fan of what this council has done with the groundfish fishery, and I know VMS was a big part of that, but I do feel like something better is sitting in front of us. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today and for any consideration. I will be on a temporary break from the Coast Guard at UC San Diego for the next two years. So if anybody thinks there's any merit to this idea and would like to work out the kinks with me, that's the kind of thing I'll be looking at for the next two years. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. All right. Thank you very much, Austin. Are there any questions for Austin? Bill Anderson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Mr. Newcomer, for your testimony. Wondered if you had any uh, perspectives on Class A versus Class B AISs for, um, and whether uh, either one of those uh, would work for what you're thinking about, or whether there's any differences between the two that you think would be important. Am I still unmuted? You are, yes. Yep. So I'm not a, an expert on the technology, but I do know that Class A's are considered superior, but currently the, the Coast Guard regulations that mandate uh, AIS do allow for Class B's for fishing vessels, and I think that that would be sufficient for these fish monitoring purposes as well. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you, sir. Thank you. Anything further? All right, thank you very much. 
We'll next hear from Bill Blue, followed by Nicole Baker. Bill, welcome. We're not hearing you, Bill. And you're unmuted on our end. All right, well, we'll give you a moment to straighten that out and we'll go to Nicole Baker. Welcome, Nicole. Yeah, come up to the table there and make sure the microphone is on. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Baker. I'm the owner of a business that's called Net Your Problem, and I'm here with my colleague, Sarah. Net Your Problem recycles old fishing gear, and we are here at this meeting today to start laying the groundwork needed to provide the West Coast fishing industry with a better way to dispose of trawls, gill nets, seines, lines from pot fisheries, and soon-to-be longline gear. Uh, this feels a little bit silly to say now, my prepared remarks, since there's nobody else in the audience besides Sarah and I, but I was hoping there would be. Um, and so I was going to say that whether your organization represents members who fish or if you fish yourself, please come and find us and talk to us in the hallway over the next two days or at the reception tonight, because it's our goal to work together to improve waste management for the industry while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy use related to plastic production by bringing fishing gear into the circular economy. We are currently doing this in partnership with another company that I think a lot of people would recognize, which is Grundens. So they've been helping financially uh, support our collection program in Bristol Bay and then also making some of their new apparel out of recycled fishing gear, which that will come to be available to the public in April. We have already been successful at this in about 12 different ports in five states. Uh, the amount of gear that we've collected so far and diverted from the landfill and environment is 1.2 million pounds. And we are excited to start working with the Port of LA and a group called LTC to collect gear in LA and Orange County. So that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. All right, thank you very much for that, Nicole. Any questions of Nicole? Obviously it's great to see stuff getting recycled. Krista. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming. Um, definitely interested in your project coming from industry um, and wondering, you mentioned 12 ports, just if you wouldn't mind giving an idea kind of what those look like. And then uh, kind of the follow-up question for that is um, how clean does your gear need to be? Meaning can you include lead lines and all of that with it? Or did people have to strip their nets beforehand just so that if we're talking about it or thinking about it, we have an idea of what your capacity is. Okay, yeah. So the states that we're currently operating in are Maine, Washington, California, Florida, and Alaska. We started in Alaska, so most of those ports are there. Um, and basically it doesn't, our collection programs don't have to be associated with a specific port, but we're just doing collection in 12 different communities. Um, the Port of LA is obviously with the port. We're also working with the Port of Seattle in Washington, where I live. So, um, yeah, the collection program doesn't have to be, you know, formally with the port, but um, there are programs that either we're running the collection ourselves or partnering with other tribes or community groups that are the ones doing the collection. And with regards to how clean the gear needs to be, the name of the game in recycling is that you have to sort stuff just like we have to sort you know, plastic, glass, paper in our household recycling. Fishing gear is typically made out of three different kinds of plastics. So polyester, polypropylene, polyethylene, sorry, four, and nylon. So the gear needs to be separated into those different categories. And most of the time, that is something that fishermen are already doing in their normal operations. So if you think of a gill netter, for example, they're replacing the web and reusing the cork line and the lead line. And the web is all pure nylon, which is the part that we're interested in recycling. So I think um, for trawl nets, it's a little bit different. That's something we're figuring out how to take those apart, working with the companies that build them. But that's, it's more of plastic types than it is about 
like how clean something is. That's what we need to consider for recycling. Go ahead, Krista. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So one more question mm -hmm. on that. And I, I fully understand uh, it needing to be cl clean. I'm not talking about more animal particulate, et cetera. But in terms of who is doing that, if somebody has a trawl net or a purse net, which they may cut sections out, mm -hmm. but they may not. They may say, you know what, this net is done. Do they have the ability to say, hey, we've got a net for you, you all deal with it, or are you asking them? And it, and it really depends upon how you recycle, right? So when I lived in Seattle, everything had to be in its own separate bucket. Where I live now, we throw it all into one bin, they take it, they deal with it. So is this, hey, we'll take a net and we'll deal with it, or is this, no, we're gonna, we'll, we'll take your net, but you need to do a whole bunch of work to make it at a level we can accept it? we will take it and deal with it. And we realize that that is what needs to happen. Otherwise, fishermen are not going to do this. So we've been doing this for five years and realize that it needs to be easy or people are not going to participate. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so being a port commissioner for Port of El Waco, I can, I can tell you that we're probably not alone, but there's ports at least up and down the coast that have ports that have derelict gear that have been abandoned on land not on sea mm -hmm. and um, when, you, when you do get up and run I, I would suggest that you um, maybe make yourself real mobile in the ports that you don't necessarily work out all the time uh, visit visit the ones you don't because they probably got plenty of gear they can uh, donate to the to the cause that that's for sure so that that uh, um, appreciate what you're doing it's uh, sounds like a really good good business or project now and and uh, wish you the most most luck appreciate thank that thank you anything further all right thank you very much for your public comment we'll come back to uh bill blue and bill if you're with us i'll give you another shot here i see you on the attendee list i note that you're unmuted on our end <laughs> but we're not hearing you. Mr. Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got a note from, from Bill Blue. He can't for some reason hear. What he's got to say is pretty important, I think. Um, I suggest he get a hold of Chris Kleinschmidt, but I don't know how the, okay, it works go. if he's not there. Can we somehow make that work? Well, I think he can get a hold of Bill. Uh, he can get a hold of Chris, but we're gonna move on with the agenda. Yeah. So a, um, uh, it's, a, it, we're just starting this meeting. I'm sure Bill will have another opportunity to comment. And in the meantime, he should reach out to Chris Kleinschmidt, whose contact information is uh, on our council website. And I'm sure Chris will get him straightened out, straightened out. Chris straightens out everybody. So I think that concludes our open public comment. Um, and will take us to agenda item C1. And with that, I will pass the gavel to Deputy, or to Vice Chairman Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're on agenda item C1, Council Coordination Committee Report. And so I am going to immediately turn to Executive Director Burden to introduce <laughs> and talk to us about this. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, so this matter concerns the recent Council Coordination Committee meeting that was held in Washington, D.C. from October 18th through 20th. Uh, several of us uh, attended in addition to rep uh, representation from the NIMS West Coast region. Um, and we do have a couple of attachments that I will point you toward. Uh, one, we have um, a draft uh, agenda of what was discussed at the Council Coordination Committee meeting. We also have a draft report, which has not yet been finalized, but uh, is near final, uh, included as a supplemental attachment too. And we have a couple of attachments uh, that stem from that meeting and some efforts of the uh, CCC over the last few months that I've referenced in um, uh, prior council meetings. 
uh, concerning uh, policies around uh, harassment. Uh, one of those attachments concerns harassment as it pertains to council employees, and the second concerns harassment as it pertains to uh, participants in the council process who are not council employees. And I'm happy to speak to that more uh, as part of our um, CCC meeting report. I'm happy to take any questions about the overview, Mr. Vice Chairman. If there are none, I'll just go ahead and proceed with the meeting summary. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, any questions on the overview for Merrick? And I don't see any, so please continue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I uh, refer you to the draft uh, CCC meeting report. I'll walk through that report quickly. Uh, we started off the day uh, talking about NIMS updates and uh, priorities, and we will hear more about uh, that matter at this meeting later this week. Uh, when Janet Coy joins us in addition to uh, leadership from the region. Uh, there are several policy updates uh, given by Ms. Kelly Dennett, um, one of which got the CCC's attention um, and the CCC expressed interest in hearing more about it and discussing, discussing this matter at the May meeting. And that, that was a policy that pertained to allocation and review of allocation decisions. We spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about budget and funding. A um, couple of notes there for you in the uh, in that in that draft report. The bottom line here is that council funding is expected to be basically flat. Um, it's been flat when we take into account inflation, uh, and NIMS budgets um, have been flat and declining over that same time period. We spent some time discussing uh, funding uh, outlook in the context of. Uh, both inflation and then also in the context of um, the recently passed uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which has a lot of funding in it uh, pertaining to climate change and whether some of that funding uh, could be directed to the councils and how it would be used uh, by NIMS. We received a NIMS science update. Um, there's quite a bit of discussion there, of course, about some of our baseline uh, research that we rely on in the form of fishery independent surveys. And as we all know, <clears throat> there's been some trouble staffing some of the white ships. Uh, and there has been uh, continued uh, interest in expanding surveys for uh, some of our data limited stocks. Uh, we also spent some time talking about NIMS science updates as they relate to climate change and the regional climate action plans that we've discussed uh, here over the last uh, several months. Uh, we had a legislative outlook. Uh, we had Representative Huffman join us, <clears throat> and he gave a brief summary of the recently um, introduced um, legislation to reauthorize the Magnuson Stevens Act. He spent some time reflecting on his collaborations with uh, Mr. Don Young and uh, his growing collaboration with uh, Mr. Young's uh, successor, uh, Mary Peltola. Um, we also spent some time hearing from Dr. Fern Gibbons, who is on the uh, Senate Commerce Science and Transportation Committee, and she reflected her outlook uh, from the Senate perspective. After that, we spent some more time talking about climate change. Uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of things going on here on the East Coast at the moment, one of which concerns climate governance and how um, councils, adjacent councils will work together as stocks are moving across different council boundaries and different governance issues pertaining to that. We also spent some time talking about scenario planning and the efforts that the New England and Mid-Atlantic councils are undertaking at the moment, <clears throat> which looks very similar to the effort that this council uh, recently wrapped up um, about a year ago or so. Um, then we spent some time talking about what, what comes next, what comes up after that, and uh, no conclusions were reached, but um, there is appears to be continued interest in taking steps forward to address climate change. We spent some time talking about hybrid operations, um, and most councils have been embarking on hybrid formats of some kind. Uh, we spent some time first talking about what do we mean by hybrid, and there are various definitions of what that entails. Uh, NOAA had walked into this meeting hoping to help us craft some best practices of hybrid meetings. The response from the councils was essentially we want to go in person as much as possible. Our processes work well, and we're not ready to uh, to specify best practices at this moment. We're still learning how to do this, um, and that's where we left that discussion. 
Uh, we talked a bit about um, preventing harassment in councils, and by this we mean both the council meetings themselves and within uh, council staff offices. And so as I indicated earlier, there are two policies that have been developed <clears throat> uh, going back almost a year ago is when we first uh, began developing these policies. Myself, in addition to a couple of other executive directors, worked uh, closely with some NOAA Sustainable Fisheries staff and uh, NOAA General Counsel as well as DOC General Counsel. And what we've crafted are two policies, uh, one that applies to council staff, one that applies to what we're calling council participants. And the intention here is to make sure that our policies uh, are up to snuff um, and help us address uh, legal issues that arise uh, out of any harassment um, uh, um, activities, for lack of a better word. But unfortunately, we do have uh, these issues in our council. Um, so the CCC formally uh, finalized those policies, and the next step here is for the councils to take them and incorporate them into our personnel rules, into our SOPPs and our COPs. And so um, as part of this agenda item, I would be looking for a head nod from this council to have staff go ahead and do that and bring revised documents back to you for final approval as they pertain to harassment policies and updating our policies around harassment. As part of the harassment agenda item, NOAA is also offering uh, training um, and a few of us, a few executive directors and I have had a chance to uh, take these trainings and see how they work. I would say my personal opinion is that they are quite good. <clears throat> so they have offered, NOAA has offered these trainings to uh, the councils. Um, and so I would like to offer this to our participants and uh, council staff as well. Um, we do have a limited number of uh, slots available. And so the first priority, in my opinion, would be folks that are um, not part of an agency, as I understand most agencies provide harassment training to their uh, staff. After that, we moved on to international issues. We heard a quick update from Ms. Alexa Cole. A lot of the discussion there concerned biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, mostly the Western Pacific uh, is affected by these, these issues. We spent some time talking about equity and environmental justice. Uh, we do have a CCC working group that's been working on uh, the CCC perspective as it concerns EEJ. And we also heard uh, from Mr. Sam Rausch about uh, the NIMS EEJ strategy um, that we all have heard about here over the last couple of council meetings. We then discussed the America the Beautiful initiative. Um, the CCC has an area-based subcommittee that's been <coughs> busy. Uh, they have a report, <coughs> excuse me, they have uh, a report that they are finalizing and they have been embarking on quite a bit of GIS-based mapping analysis uh, outlining where conservation areas exist uh, in the US EEZ um, and uh, they have developed a particular definition of what a conservation area is, which is still a big part of the debate around the America the Beautiful initiative. So this committee is uh, moving forward and uh, will be attempting to publish in a peer reviewed journal the paper and then also make uh, a report available on the CCC website as well as all of the data that's been used uh, to develop that analysis. Let's see here. We heard from uh, <clears throat> the Mid-Atlantic regarding the Northeast Regional Marine Fisheries Habitat Assessment, which is a mouthful and it is a very impressive tool that brings together a lot of different information on EFH, on climate shifts and a lot of different spatial uh, views of the world. Um, and um, no action was taken there. And we heard an update from the CCC Habitat Work Group. No action was taken there. We heard a summary of the uh, seventh uh, scientific coordination subcommittee meeting. Um, Ms. Diana Evans from the North Pacific Council staff uh, summarized that as they were the host council. And there are a few key findings there in the report. And then we have a CCC communications group as we all of the council staff work together to try to help one another on communications. And uh, we agreed to allow them uh, to put together a meeting um, and um, bring focus on several items that are summarized there in four bullets. 
We did have um, representation or participation from the councils on our recent FAO meeting, the Committee on Fisheries, and we heard a summary of <coughs> actions there concerning different things like uh, IUU fishing, climate change, and biodiversity. We heard an update on a National Standard 1 technical guidance work group from Dr. Rich Mathot. We heard an update on Fish Watch. And we discussed the integration of the Endangered Species Act and the Magnuson-Stevens Act and this council's experience with the development of several uh, actions has continued to be uh, referenced as a model way forward. Um, there's been talk, for instance, of the work group established on Southern killer whales uh, that uh, recently concluded its activities and as a model that other councils may want to follow. And Mr. Vice Chairman, I think I uh, will stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Merrick. Any questions for Executive Director Burden on the CCC report? And I'm not seeing any questions there. So let me check my... I have a comment. Though. Oh. Uh, Chairman Grelnick. Yeah, I just... Uh, it was a good meeting, but I think that getting back to best practices, um, it was NIMS who was sort of... Uh, imposing is not the right word, but directing the council in the direction of best practices. And the feedback NIMS got from the councils was that NIMS itself needs to work on its own internal best practices because um, there are apparently still some travel restrictions and or um, making travel optional. So a, a number of reports, and it's not as much an issue here as it is, has been at other councils, although it's still sometimes an issue here that that if, if NIMS folks are not going to attend in person, that they need to <clears throat> adopt some best practices with regard to their audio, um, because oftentimes what we heard from other councils is that folks would call in to give a NIMS report or a Science Center report or some such, and then the audio quality was difficult. So um, I think uh, NIMS, I think, took that to heart, and I think they'll work internally to make sure folks aren't appearing in person that at the very least um, they can clearly communicate their presentations. Thank you. Uh, Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. This is a comment, so I think it's okay time. Um, I wanted to thank council leadership for attending the meeting. I got to tune into a good portion of it and was um, just appreciated the remarks that were made and, and your participation there. Um, I wanted to tune in, as Merrick noted, uh, the CCC received a presentation from NOAA about preventing harassment and provided the model policies. Um, overall, I think it's just really good work and a great place for the council to potentially start some work from. Um, I guess this is my head nod uh, to the council staff to hopefully work on some revised documents and bring those back to the council for consideration and possible revision. Um, in terms of looking at them, a couple, a couple issues came to my mind. Uh, the first was thinking about retaliation. So just thinking about how can this policy or whatever the council decides to do here um, kind of double down and ensuring that retaliation in any form doesn't happen. Um, so that our participants can feel comfortable reporting um, and make sure that that uh, ensures the council ability to remain an open platform for everyone to speak freely. Um, also, I know that the reporting that was noted in that model policy um, talked about reporting to the council director or deputy director and the chair or vice chair. Um, I think maybe NIMS could consider strengthening their own role here. Um, harassment can come from council members themselves. Um, including members and in positions of authority and um, power dynamics between council members and participants is um, always a dynamic, so even without harassment. So thinking about that and um, considering the role that NIMS should play, uh, I think is, is in mind. Um, finally, I think it was Adam Eisenberg who presented on this uh, with NIMS GC, and he noted that this policy does not cover uh, what he termed incivility, and I, I thought that was an interesting word and honestly one I, I'm not totally familiar with, but I think it was a good encapsulation and um, 
he noted that he thought this issue probably should be addressed by councils, but wasn't encapsulated in this particular process. So just wanted to mention that and hope that we can address that at some point in a larger process. So thanks again. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we go forward, appreciate those comments. I, we don't have any uh, management uh, entity or advisory body reports here. So I think we'll just continue with the discussion then on this. We had heard one nod uh, in response to what uh, Executive Director Burden was looking for on moving forward and having staff start to incorporate those two policies into our policies, the SOPs, the COPs, and other appropriate things and also then on the training opportunities that are available. And I'll just add the comment to that NIMS has bought the license to provide the training and there are a limited number of spots. I don't know how many we had, but uh, just looking for any guidance or further head nods on that. So, Virgil. Certainly, I give a head nod on that, but a question that I have is, is this in-person training? Is this a rem remote training uh, online? Uh, how is that training conducted? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, these, are, these are trainings that are available online, and as I indicated, I've had a chance to, uh, to, to take them. Um, there are two different levels. I apologize, I'm forgetting if, if Noah is offering both levels, but um, there are two different levels depending on um, how deep you go and your, your role as a supervisor or as a staff. <clears throat> um, the training, if I recall correctly, took about an hour, um, but it was, it was quite good. Um, I, I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah. Go ahead, Virgil. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman and, and uh... Merrick, the, I guess my comment would be that <clears throat> like all training, whether physical or mental, continuing it is always needed regardless of the state that you're in. I probably would benefit from being uh, tuning up as well. I know that's true with the training that I take with computer best practices. You know, it's, it just constantly reminds me of what is current in the thinking. And I certainly would like the option to participate in this training uh, myself if and when it becomes available. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Phil Anderson. Yeah, just briefly, Mr. Vice Chair, I t totally agree with uh, Virgil's perspective there taken a number of different trainings um, on, in this area. Um, and I, I think it's always useful to um, refresh uh, yourself by taking the training and periodically. Um, so if the training uh, does become available to uh, council members and others to, to take, uh, definitely would appreciate knowing about that and how to access it. Thanks. Thank you. Other direction or guidance here on that? I've, I've heard a couple of head nods for moving forward, having staff look into the policies and update that relative to the NIMS policies. Uh, Merrick, anything else you need here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, well, based on this council discussion and feedback, uh, what we would intend to do is update our policies and bring them back to you when ready. I'm envisioning either a March or April meeting for your review and uh, either continued feedback or approval at that time. We also do have the trainings. Uh, we have a deadline uh, for completing those trainings, which looks to be late March based on just funding that NEMS has provided. <laughs> to this provider. Um, and so I will be moving forward and providing NOAA with, with a list of names uh, and the way that we are envisioning it as council members and then focusing on our advisory sub panel members 
Um, and then I think we will run out of room at that point. And the assumption I have is that our technical staff work for agencies which tend to provide this sort of training to them. So they would be a third priority. That's how I would move forward unless there's uh, other guidance to the contrary, but um, that's how I'm, uh, that's what I'm taking away from this discussion. Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, I'm just curious, the, <clears throat> the number, maybe you said it, I missed it, of <clears throat> opportunities on this to do this, and perhaps maybe your strategy. It <clears throat> Once again, assuming it's not a good thing, it, but I would assume that the, the state representatives are probably well versed in this, uh, being that they're they're represented by you know they're, they're agency type people, uh, maybe more uh, targeted approach. I know I I would volunteer to do that, but to, to be part of it. But uh, I think it's well well um, thought out. I think it's a good idea. So um, I was just curious what your what your approach would be and and the numbers available in this first go round. Go ahead, Merrick. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Dooley. We have, uh, across all councils, we have 500 spots. And so we do have to, uh, I have in my mind this priority ordering that I, I just spoke to, because we'll have to negotiate with other councils for these spots. And our council, uh, our process is very large compared to some other councils. So I would anticipate us taking up a big chunk of those, but we may run out of room. And so uh, it sounds like my thinking is aligned with yours um, that we uh, assume, and I think it is a safe assumption that agencies, state or federal provide, f provide training, generally speaking. And so we would prioritize non-agency folks and start with council, start with our advisory sub panels, and if we have more, we can continue to add from there, but I don't expect we'll have more spots beyond that. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion or guidance on this topic? And I'm not seeing any hands, so I believe, Merrick, you have everything you need to proceed. Yes, Mr. Vice Chairman, I believe we have all that we need on this agenda. All right, thank you, then that closes this agenda item. And we are going to move then to agenda item C2, the National Marine Fisheries Service, National uh, Policy for Saltwater Recreational Fisheries. I want to note uh, Mr. Frank Lockhart has joined us at the table for NIMS. And I will first turn this over to Kelly Ames for an introduction. Thank you, Vice Chair, Council Members. <clears throat> the National Marine Fisheries Service is soliciting feedback to inform revisions to the 2015 National Policy for Saltwater Recreational Fisheries. The policy provides NIMS with a set of goals specifically for recreational fisheries and establishes operating principles to achieve those goals. After the 2022 National Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Summit, NIMS identified the need to update the policy to address changing ocean and fishery conditions, as well as the evolving needs of the fishing public. As such, NIMS has provided a discussion guide to facilitate consideration of updates to the policy, which is included in your materials as attachment one. NIMS is also soliciting input via a public comment period, which is open until December 31st, 2022. Under this agenda item, the council should review the existing policy for saltwater recreational fisheries and the agency presentation. The council should discuss the questions raised in the discussion guide and feedback provided by the public and advisory bodies and consider whether, rec whether to recommend to NIMS changes to the policy. Reference materials in front of you today should include NIMS report one, which is the NOAA call and inviting folks to comment on updates to the existing recreational fisheries policy, as well as NIMS report two, which is the PowerPoint that Mr. Russell Dunn will be providing to the council next. Additionally, you will find a supplemental gap report and uh, public comments listed on the e-portal. I'd be happy to take any questions about the agenda item overview. Otherwise, I would recommend proceeding with Mr. Dunn's presentation. Thank you, Kelly. Any questions for Kelly on the overview? 
And I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to then turn to NIMS, uh, Mr. Lockhart. Frank, uh, please introduce your panelist. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, happy to introduce Russ Dunn, who is the National Policy Advisor for Recreational Fisheries, and he has a presentation to give to you today. Thank you. Thank right. you, and welcome, oh, Russell. And thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the council. I It's good to see most of you again. I just saw Mark last week, I think it was, in New Orleans. We've been all over the place. Uh, and uh, it's good to see you all again. So um, as mentioned, I'm Russ Dunn. I'm the National Policy Advisor for Recreational Fisheries. And we have undertaken an effort to uh, update the recreational fisheries policy in an effort to maintain relevance. So. Let me give a, a quick little bit of background on where the policy came from and, and then we'll we'll run through it. What I would what I really hope to get out of this conversation is uh, if not here um, today, then prior to the, the close of the comment period uh, to urge the council to provide uh, inputs and recommendations on how we should best amend the any aspect of the policy. So uh, Taking a step back in time, in 2014, February of 2014, uh, a coalition of recreational fisheries interests got together and drafted what is referred to as the Moore Steel Report on um, saltwater recreational fisheries conservation and management. One of the recommendations in that report was that the agency develop a saltwater recreational fisheries policy. Uh, by chance, a month later, we are, were hosting the 2014 uh, Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Summit, which a number of you uh, attended. Uh, we host those every four years. We just hosted the most recent one in 2022. During the 2014 summit, the participants were um, expressed great support uh, in the concept of developing a policy, and we were able to commit to doing so. So... Uh, next slide, please. So fast forward to today. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we held the most recent, the fourth and most recent uh, summit in the in, at the end of March. We did that, uh, co-hosted that with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We had participants from all of the commissions. Uh, Barry Tom, who was literally his first day at the new commission, joined us as a facilitator and uh, moderator for some of our sessions. But during the conversation there. Uh, we quickly recognized that the policy had a number of uh, glaring gaps. For example, climate, it doesn't mention or reference climate in any way uh, in the policy. It also does not, in a really meaningful way, really address the potential for uh, ocean conflicts. And that balancing ocean, ocean uses there that you see under agenda topics is, uh, so it was sort of code for wind power and aquaculture, which were... Um, are uh, quite prevalent issues everywhere across the country right now. So we we just realized, okay, it's time to update the, the policy. And so we have begun that effort. Next slide, please. What you see here are just a set of sort of discussion prompts, if you will, uh, uh, questions to help you think about what aspect of the policy may need to be updated. Really just how can we best update should we update the, the policy statement, the scope of the policy goals, guiding principles? And then there are sort of two at the, at the bottom, which are more open. Are there aspects that are missing? Are there aspects that we should uh, consider for removal or a, a, a broad open, uh, any other suggestion sort of question at the end? Don't feel limited to these, but this is just a set of prompts. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna run quickly through the existing policy to give you a sense of it, to help sort of uh, you think through those questions that we just posed. So the purpose of the policy, in short, it serves as a guidance document for the agency. It's a tool that helps shape our, or spells out our sort of philosophical approach, uh, our basic stance, our goals and guiding principles to how we believe uh, we should pursue the goals of the policy. So while it serves as an internal touchstone, if you will. It also, I think, is serves as an important tool for the public to understand just how we uh, approach recreational fisheries. And, and I think it can help um, smooth the path during discussions because 
it, it, it provides a common framework of reference for during discussions on agency actions. Next slide, please. So the policy statement, the, the core of the policy is, is pretty straightforward. And, and it is uh, essentially spells out our commitment to accessible and diverse recreational fisheries. Nothing too complicated, just a, a basic uh, support for the, those concepts. Next slide, please, thanks. So the, the scope of the policy, for, for any policy, I think it, it's essential to really understand to whom or to what it applies, right? And what we, while we leaned, I would say heavily on the Magnuson Act's definition of recreational fishing, which is fishing for sport or pleasure, we wanted to make it as sort of broadly applicable and inclusive of the rec community as possible. Uh, and bringing in to the extent that we can sort of the shoreside infrastructure, bait and tackle shops, et cetera, tournaments, uh, which also support and contribute to or part of the whole universe of, of recreational fisheries. And this aspect, frankly, is one that we're struggling with now in, in terms of how broad or narrow to make it. Uh, and, and I say that in reference to, a, there's been quite a, a lot of conversation about the issue of subsistence fisheries uh, and how whether to and how to bring in uh, that concept into recreational fisheries. There's such a significant amount of overlap, for example, in data collection uh, that crosses the recreational fishery and subsistence fishers are often caught in that when they are caught, uh, not caught, but when they are sampled um, that data is, tends to be lumped in with recreational. So we're, we're struggling with how to deal with the subsistence issue and any guidance the council may have on that would be appreciated. Next uh, slide, please. So the policy goals, these, these again are, are very direct. Um, essentially first is supporting and maintaining the resources on which recreational fisheries depend. I think it's a pretty, there's a pretty clear nexus there no resources, no fish, no habitat, uh, no fishery. The second is essentially promoting wreck fishing for the benefit of the nation. That is really directly from the Magnuson-Stevens Act, the purposes of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And, and the third is, I think, a goal that, that we all share, uh, which is enabling long-term participation through science-based conservation and management. And that obviously we all wanna fish, we all want our kids to fish uh, and their kids. And so this is, I think, a, a sort of a universal goal. Next slide. So the guiding principles really serve as a, as a set of guideposts for us as we consider actions or projects uh, and how we can best advance the purposes and goals of, of the policy. And I'm just gonna briefly run through these um, in the next few slides and then we will open it up for discussion. So next slide, please. So supporting ecosystem and conservation. So without healthy ecosystems, we won't and we cannot, of course, have healthy fisheries. We just touched on that. And we believe it was really essential to recognize this in uh, the, the policy. Uh, we pursued this through many different projects, some of which uh, have occurred out here. For example, we've, we've teamed up with our Office of Habitat uh, at headquarters to fund a series of uh, cooperative habitat conservation and restoration projects around the country. We did uh, a few out here, I think Hood Canal, cut, coastal cutthroat distribution. Um, in Orange County, we helped fund a, a project to restore eelgrass with the Orange County Coast Keeper. Puget Sound, we helped support a project at Point No Point to reflood uh, some areas that had been cut off uh, from, from the sound. So there's a whole series of actions, distribution of descending devices, circle hooks, etc., supporting uh, this guiding principle. Next, please. So promoting public access to recreational fishing opportunities. We, we recognize that if anglers can't have access, can't access uh, or don't know about fishing opportunities, that we aren't going to get that participation that, that can can benefit them as individuals and, and, the, and the nation as a whole. Um, so we have sought to do this through a number of mechanisms. For example, 
during COVID, when we were all sort of locked down, we teamed up with Bonnier Corporation, which owns um, Saltwater Sportsman, Sport Fishing Magazine, um, Marlin Magazine, et cetera, to do a couple of national photo uh, contests, saltwater recreational fishing photo contests, just to try and keep NOAA fisheries and the concept of sustainable fishing, recreational fishing out there in front of the public. We had great success with those. The, la the second one we had, uh, well over a million uh, impressions, uh, two and a half million, I think, uh, impressions out there. So it was a, it was a great project. Uh, we pre-COVID we sponsored a number of sort of take a kid fishing type activities. Daniel Stud here in the room uh, has organized a number of those on the West Coast. Um, we developed videos highlighting fishing opportunities in other parts of the country. Next slide, please. So coordinating with state and federal management entities, and, and it's a little bit cliche, I think, but we all know that we're all in this together. And um, the policy recognizes that the, the best path forward and to success is working together. Um, yesterday, we were just down talking with the NIMS leadership uh, was down speaking with the state directors. Um, we have partnered again with the, with the states and the councils in, from the RecFish program perspective at the, at the summits, each of those summits, we had all the councils there, all the commissions there. Um, we're working with our other federal partners, Department of Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service through, there's a new federal interagency um, committee on outdoor recreation where we're partnering with all our other federal eight sister agencies to advance outdoor recreation. Uh, so there are numerous examples of, of trying to do that. Next, please. So advancing innovative science or solutions to, to challenges. It's an area that I think we recognize sort of goes beyond just the need to identify, but we actually need to try and help advance it. Um, this is something that we have tried to do with barrow trauma, you know, years ago, my program helped fund or funded a series of bear trauma workshops around the country. Out of that uh, came private sector development of the sequelizer. I think we all know what that is, the fisheries descending device. We've helped uh, work, we've worked with states and commissions to try and distribute hundreds of thousands of those around the country. We're working around the country on bycatch hotspot mapping to try and help avoid bycatch of, of uh, either overfished or rebuilding species. And um, it, it's a, it extends, I think, to the management realm as well, where we are as an agency sort of actively working with and pursuing recreational reform in the Mid-Atlantic Council, trying to find ways to comply with our conservation mandates, but, uh, but allow uh, uh, flexibility in the system to uh, continue allowing fisheries opportunities, fishing opportunities. Next slide, please. So providing scientifically sound and trusted information, this is a pretty core uh, function, I think, for a science-based uh, agency. And we've recognized that one of the surest ways to do that is through collaboration. Uh, and I think we've got a great example of that right now where we have teamed up uh, the Southwest Center. I was able to provide some funding for them to help uh, fill some data gaps with copper and quillback rockfish out here. And uh, some of the constituents here are, are participants in that. Uh, and and it's, it's an example where it's a win, win, win. The, the, the industry is benefiting from it. We as a management entities are benefiting from it and the citizens are benefiting from it. They enjoy participating in the science itself and we're getting good data, usable data out of it. Next, please. So communicating and engaging with the wreck fishing public. This is something that is always critical uh, and can always be improved upon. We know that we are not particularly good at this uh, as a federal entity, federal agency, but we do do a lot of work on this. We've got, you know, we, we reach out and engage through roundtables and the summits leading up to the last summit. We did a dozen public roundtable discussions that we held the summit. Uh, we have now, this is probably the, I think this is the 17th time we've done this discussion with uh, either the commission, states, uh, councils, or the public. Uh, last night, 
again, Daniel was good enough to put together an informal round table with a number of the recreational constituents uh, that participate in the council meetings. So it's just been, it's been a, an, an area that we are working on, uh, doing better at, but there's always a, a way to improve. So just quickly running through some of the inputs we, we have received today. Climate change, sir, this is in no particular order, uh, and I apologize for that. But uh, climate change, by chance, certainly is the one that we have heard most frequently uh, as we have gone around the country uh, and trying to address that, whether it is redrafting the policy sort of through the lens of climate change or adding that as a, as a guiding principle that it needs to be addressed. We, we're not sure, but we've had all those inputs. Education is sort of a broad one. It's not only educating, helping to educate the public on the regs and, and things like the uh, conservation best practices, but also the process, the management and science process. How does it work? Equity environmental justice is clearly a priority of this agency and administration. And again, that's really sort of where that issue of subsistence fishery has been raised a number of times. Access has come up from, from multiple perspectives. It, for some, it means how do I literally get out on the water with physical access infrastructure? And a lot of that comes from the Southeast where docks and marinas have been hammered time and time again after hurricanes, passes have been um, filled with sand and debris, et cetera. To others, it means the, fishing, the length of a fishing season or you know bag limit. Uh, or, or um, other regulatory issues. Agency accountability has really been expressed from the perspective of, don't just tell us what you're gonna do, show us what you've done. You know, put your money where your mouth is. And that's an aspect that after, in redrafting the policy, I think the way we're gonna address that is in a series of implementation plans that will have some metrics for uh, success. Conservation and discards is a pretty broad issue that comes up regularly uh, from all aspects. Uh, the discard and is that's a particular problem in Southeast US uh, and it sort of just falls under the conservation umbrella, but uh, isn't it is an issue that needs to be really addressed uh, from the management perspective. The EEZ permit is an interesting one. It's been raised from Maine to Texas, really, uh, there's interest in trying to quanti better quantify the universe of offshore anglers. And there is a, a growing interest from many directions in the fishery for some sort of offshore permit, whether that's a federally based permit or whether it's a state endor license endorsement or something similar, there's been a whole range of expression uh, of interest expressed, um, but that is an issue that comes up regularly. Data reporting and collection, it's a cross-cutting universal issue, whether it refers to socioeconomic or catching effort. Citizen science and collaborative research, um, again, is something that we've, we've heard from two angles. One is, hey, we wanna do more because we feel like we are part of the process and we gain uh, some trust in the process, but also, on the flip side, there's a lot of frustration in places where there may have been projects set up and then that data for one reason or another is not integrated into the process. Uh, and, and that is something that they want a very clear uh, understanding of exactly what it needs to be done in order to ensure that data are used. Depredation crosses uh, from sharks to marine mammals is an issue everywhere across the country of growing concern as those populations uh, rebuild. Enforcement is one where we are being asked most uh, specifically to address illegal charters, unpermitted charters that are occurring on a regular basis. And, and that has proliferated with social media and the internet where it's been extremely easy for people to set up a, um, an illegal charter. And transparency really sort of links back to agency accountability. Um, they wanna know how decisions are being made and, excuse me, um, how decisions are being made and, and what has come of those decisions. Tell us 
what the result of, of the process is, feedback on uh, any, any given process. So I think, oh, okay, next steps, very quickly. And I see the comma is in the wrong place in, after December. Uh, this is sort of where we've been and where we're going. So the comment period is open through the end of the year. Uh, we've had, like I said, about 16 of these discussions with councils, commissions, the public, some in person, some virtual. We've got just a handful of upcoming meetings that are planned, left. Um, I think our last council specific presentation is in a few weeks to the Caribbean Council, and we are trying to schedule another public webinar. We've done two of those so far. Uh, we have one more scheduled in November, and we have a, we're trying to, to schedule another one in December. We are hoping to roll the completed policy out in June, and then you can see some QR codes where you the first two will get you more information about the process. The third one uh, is is a comment portal that is very specific to those questions that we put up initially. And, and you, it's like a Google Forms portal. So you're locked into those. But then that I would suggest for the council, if you're going to submit a letter um, to the recreational.fisheries at noaa.gov, that, that there, that's just an email that is dedicated to the policy. And therefore, you can just provide attachments and, and your comments as you see fit. And I believe, next slide. So that's just to put the discussion questions back up uh, and I will turn it back to the chairman for any comment and questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. So I will look around the table for anyone with questions regarding the presentation or the policy update process. Mr. Grelnick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer. Uh, Russ, welcome. Um, to what extent um, should this policy, do you think, or do you think we should address serving underserved communities? Because obviously there's quite a spectrum of, of recreational anglers around the country and their level of participation uh, is not necessarily equal. So I'd like to get any comments, maybe things you've heard or thoughts you have on that. Thanks. Uh, so yes, this actually was a, a topic of conversation yesterday at state directors. And I think it was broadly recognized that, that sort of the subsistence aspect is really a primarily a state issue, right? There's a fairly thin nexus in many parts of the country between uh, the subsistence community and, and federal fisheries management. Um, and so we essentially pose the question to the states, what can we do? What should we, from the federal perspective, do? What can we do to help the states address this issue? And, and there were two responses. One was um, try to provide funding for a survey to, to characterize that universe of anglers to a degree. Uh, and the second was to provide funding for translation. So uh, my response would be to think for, for the council to think about that question from your federal uh, role as a federal manager and recognizing that that changes in every region, it's different. You know, it's very different in Alaska than it is in New England, that, that issue. So I would say think about what is feasible and appropriate from the federal nexus or perspective uh, in putting together comments. All right, thank you. Further questions? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Russ, for bringing this forward. It's pretty comprehensive. I appreciate it. <clears throat> My question is under your slide, comments received a date and your comments about data reporting and collection. And I mean, kind of we all know that uncertainty and lack of data is the enemy of getting adequate and true allocations to the users. Um, it seems to me that the data reporting burden is, you know, is really on the states and on the agencies to collect. There's no burden on the industry to, group to supply it. 
Um, have you have you discussed any of those type of things, like to to make reporting more robust and more accurate? And I guess it could even bleed into discards and things like that too. Yeah, a, a lot of the data uh, discussion has been around uh, resolving, reducing uncertainty in the recreational fisheries uh, data collection and estimate estimates. Um, you know, particularly on the East Coast, there's some real concern with the, the effort estimates that are being used to generate catch estimates on the East Coast. Uh, and so that's been the really the primary focus of comment is do more to help address uncertainty. And then that sort of opens a number of doors. Is that, does that mean increase sampling, uh, dockside sampling? Does it mean trying to shift the, the private recreational sector to electronic reporting? And if so, what's the best way to do that? Uh, so it's really focused on that uncertainty question and uh, trying to refine our estimates. Thank you. Further questions? And I'm not seeing any hands around the table, so thank you very much, Russ, for that. And I will turn back to Mr. Lockhart. Frank, does that conclude the NIMS report on this topic? It does. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Then we'll move on to the management entity reports, and I do not see any. Um, Yeah. Um, so there's no management entity, but at advisory body reports, then we have a gap report. So Mr. Louis Zim, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair members of the council. It's so good to see you all in person again. Uh, I've been missing you and missing all the uh, uh, wonderful social things that we do together. It's very nice to be back here addressing you. Uh, my name is Louis Zim, as mentioned, and uh, I will be reading from agenda item C2B, Supplemental Gap Report 1, November 2022. Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on NIMPS National Policy for Saltwater Recreational Fisheries. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, the GAP, received and discussed a presentation on the 2022 National Saltwater Recreational Fishing Summit by Mr. Daniel Studd, National Marine Fisheries Service Recreational Fisheries Coordinator, West Coast Region, and offers the following comments and suggestions. The GAP supports the overarching 2015 purpose and policy statements, scope, goals, and guiding principles. Under principles one, three, four, and five, we offer these suggestions. Encourage cooperative fisheries surveys and management in collaboration with Canada and Mexico. National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration Fisheries manages the harvest of many transboundary fisheries. Thus, high levels of scientific and policy collaboration are essential. Elevate collaborative research efforts between the public and state and NOAA fisheries. The growing citizen science movement should be discussed in the context of self-reporting catch applications whose increasing popularity is being driven in part by the work of conservation organizations. Provide additional funding for needed fisheries independent data supporting stock assessment efforts. Current data availability continues to be a challenge, especially with respect to areas where fishing has been temporarily or permanently restricted or access is limited by the distance or weather conditions commonly encountered. The GAP notes the need to increase federal support for the state managed enforcement bodies tasked with at sea enforcement. A higher level of at sea presence supports less restrictive regulatory measures. 
limited enforcement ability results in overly restrictive measures at sea. Enforcement advisors are compelled to strive for regulatory measures that can be enforced at the landing site and restrict pelagic fisheries with ground fish aboard. We need to minimize the current dynamic which unnecessarily constrains gear use and spatial access. Under principles two and six, the update would benefit from greater recognition of the food value of recreational catch. Recreational angling not only provides an opportunity for fun in the sun, but most often also high value food for the table. This is food for not only the angler and their family, but catches are often shared much more broadly with less fortunate anglers, friends and neighbors, as well as members of underserved communities through donation to food banks and other distribution entities. NOAA Fisheries and the Council should develop a process for engaging recreational fisheries stakeholders in a more in-depth discussion of optimum yield and how it can be used to identify and prioritize management, management objectives better suited to the cultural, economic, and conservation goals of the angling community. Policy and funding should support public outreach across diverse communities, cultures, and language on emerging fishing techniques and opportunities, which support regulatory compliance, conservation, and fishing success. Supporting fishing opportunities for youth is especially important for providing access to marine careers, such as commercial fishing, marine transportation, or many other related marine fields. Recreational fishing should be expressly allowed around aquaculture and wind energy structures. Marine conservation and recreational angler access often benefits from structures placed in the marine environment. However, this access must be expressly allowed as a condition of leasing the public space to private entities for any purpose. This follows public trust doctrine priorities. And that completes my, station, my uh, statement to the council. Thank you very much, Louis. Any questions for Louis on the gap report? And I don't see any hands, Louis, so thank you again. And thank you. That concludes the advisory body reports. I see we have two signups for public comment while that's being brought up. Just want to mention there was one public comment submitted via the web portal that was available for everyone to look at prior to the meeting. So public comment, we have Jamie Diamond and Wayne Cotto signed up. First, uh, Jamie Diamond, welcome. Good morning, Vice Chair Hasmer, Chair Gorelnik, Council and staff. Um, happy first day of Council. Um, I'd like to thank Russ for his presentation, Mr. Dunn, pardon me, for his presentation. Uh, today and and his presentation that he's given multiple times over the course of this year. Um, and and I'd really like to thank uh, Daniel Stutt for his work specifically on the West Coast here and his outreach because he really has um, worked hard to to reach goal six if you still have the presentation in front of you, principle six, which is communicate and engage with the recreational fishing public. Um, and and I believe, we've seen more of that type of engagement in the last couple of years than we have probably ever. So I want to commend them and, and thank, thank the staff and, and all of them for that. Um, I would like to speak to you about the principles and, and if you happen to have the, the presentation in front of you, it might help, but um, the principle number one, support ecosystem conservation and enhancement. Uh, we're all here because we do that, because we want that, um, because we believe in that. And so that goes without saying. Number two, which is promote public access to quality recreational fishing opportunities. Specifically under that, it says uh, they recognize the fundamental importance of broad, broad public access to fisheries. And my comment to that is we are facing increasingly decreased 
broad or access to fisheries. Um, we are finding ourselves getting um, pushed out more and more from from access and uh, especially facing things like the uh, different sanctuaries where sanctuaries kind of turn into closures, especially when they're on the coastline, you are decreasing public access to fisheries, um, especially the subsistence, especially the economically disadvantaged who don't have their own boat, who can't even afford a ticket on my boat, um, the people that shore fish. Uh, and that happens with fisheries regulations as well, um, looking at things uh, like like different seasonal closures, seaward uh, closures instead of shore, or shoreward closures and, and where you can only fish seaward of something. Um, so we're, we're facing more and more decreased public access um, to, to our fisheries, which is a problem. Um, number four, advance innovative solutions to evolving science management and environmental challenges. And I think we're, we're getting to a place of that, um, especially with uh, the collaborative work that's going on all over the place. Um, and, and I truly appreciate that. We also need to look at how climate plays a part in that and how climate will shift fisheries. And, um, and when we impose regulations on one thing, it's going to shift effort to another and the domino effect that that plays. And so um, the idea of an innovative solution being getting ahead of, of the game instead of being reactive, being proactive in fisheries management and, and instead of responding or reacting to a perceived problem, um, being more proactive and dealing with it, being able to look out ahead, how can we reduce that time frame, that lapse, that two to three years of, of, of data collection and, and uh, processing assessments and things like that? How do we reduce that? Because sometimes by the time that's done, the problem has already kind of remedied itself. Um, and so we're, we're managing something that's no longer necessarily an issue. Uh, also, the idea of provide it, well, number five, provide scientifically sound and trusted uh, social, cultural, economic, and ecological information. Um, doing the collaborative fisheries is definitely, or collaborative uh, sampling and collection and research is part of that. Getting the public buy-in on what what. The, what the data says when they are able to participate in it and they feel they have ownership of it, they're more willing to, to trust it and believe in it along with through the process. Um, and so I, I think that's also another really important point to make. Um, when it comes to the comments received to date, um, agency accountability, um, I think is, is something that, um, and this may be controversial, but hey, that's apparently something I do. Um, is 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 when so aid, so agencies have to turn the knobs down, bring down a fishery if there's an issue. Okay, but what happens when it's a perceived issue? Turns out it really wasn't, but it has already negatively impacted uh, the resource or negatively impacted the fishermen that use that resource. What type of recourse is there and what type of accountability is there? Um, and how can we, can we help? Because sometimes it, it puts people out of business. Um, and so just working from that as aspect, um, it's that, that's something that I think we can look at and oh, time's up, but thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Jamie, any questions for Jamie? Looking around, I don't see any. Oh, excuse me, Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Jamie, I just want to thank you for coming up, and I want to also thank you for uh, volunteering to be on the steering committee through the National Pollock, the National Recreational uh, Saltwater Fisheries Summit. And I think that your expertise in that is well, well, well taken. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Jamie, thanks for your comments. Um, you noted that the importance of better data and having faster processing and use of this data. Um, I know that you have personally been involved in doing different types of data collection. And I'm curious if you um, have some ideas or examples of how that has, has worked or ways you think that could be done better. 
So um, specifically right now uh, with the copper sampling project, we're working with uh, Melissa Monk and her team um, by using uh, this collaborative approach, we are not only having a cost savings of essentially $30,000 a day um, so that uh, assessment teams aren't having to go take a NOAA boat and, and go out and do this, um, but also we're able to do that while the scientists can stay in the lab and process the data. So we're able to essentially speed this process up instead of the teams having to go out, collect, bring it back, go out, collect, bring it back, go out, collect, bring it back, and then process. We're doing all that legwork um, and, and just getting them everything they need. And we're also able to say, hey, which is what we did this time, what do you need to have the most informative information? What, what if you could cherry pick everything you need, what do you need? And Melissa said, well, we need this, this, and this. And I said, great, let's do it. And so I think um, instead of trying to um, piecemeal a bunch of separate things to make it fit, if we can create what the gold standard of a sampling project should be, and then duplicate that. I think that would help. But really streamlining where, where we're reducing all this extra time, the scientists being on the water. I mean, there's times where there is collection that they will have to do, of course, on their own. But we're, we're really getting that straight to them and, and reducing um, a significant amount of the time frame for assessments by doing that. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Uh, Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and thank you, Jamie, for your testimony. Um, and maybe this was a uh, question for Louie, but I, I, it, it always comes up. It has come up since I've met Russell, done years ago, and, and, I, and I've often wondered, in the gap statement, they've said fisheries and NOAA fisheries and council should develop processes engaging recreational fisheries and stakeholders in, in more depth discussions. Um, I, I see you. I see Wayne. I think I saw Wayne. Um, I decided to ask you this question because Wayne can get grumpy sometimes. So, um, but he can he can come up and offer a <laughs> he can come up and offer a comment too. But the, the the statement has been there in forever. Yet you two are here, and I and I don't and, and I know Wayne represents you know quite a few people, and you do too, but. Uh, the the litany of people are never here, and this council goes out to towns every year for salmon process. And you know, other than the real high controversial years, you know, sometimes there's five or six people that show up. Um, probably half and half, one from recreational, one from the, or some from the commercial. And um, and we've opened this thing up on TV and the internet, and it's broadcasted all over. So uh, I I just um, I'm interested in in the ideas behind the statement. When we do it, when states and and the federal government do a lot of these things, but uh, nobody comes to the party, um, and so that's you know kind of my. And if you can't answer it, maybe think about it in some other time. But I, I just don't see that. I, I see this statement, but I don't see it ever. When when I think this process is open as transparent as any process in the country, um, not just fishing process, but, but any process. And so, so anyway, I, that, that just, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but, but that, uh, that, that's my comment or question or both. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. Butch, Mr. Smith. Uh, so I would say there's, there's a few different reasons in my personal opinion. Um, one is you have a group of, of longtime fishermen who feel like we've, we've fought the fight for years. We lose every time the odds are stacked against us. What's, what's the point? There's those guys, those people. Um, and then there's the people who, although this is open and it's noticed and it's available, they, they, the general public the people that come out on our boats, the people that take out their kayak fishing that have their own boats really don't understand this process. And that's something that um, 
that I think we all acknowledge. I mean, even people who have been through this process for years still don't always grasp exactly what's going on in the timeline of when things, when it's, when something starts to be able to get it done by and the ins and outs of that. Um, but one thing I believe is that by bringing in these collaborative fisheries projects like CCFRP and what we're doing on our boats right now for copper, you're allowing the general public into that, getting a, a glimpse into fisheries research and management, because then we get to have that conversation as to why we're doing it. And then we get to have that conversation is where does this information go and how does it go through the process and what happens? And they're paying a little more attention because they've participated in this and they have a little bit of a buy-in on it now. And they want to know what happens with that, with that copper carcass that got sent in or when they went out on that CCFRP trip and those, those fish that were measured and the data from that, how does that play out? I caught that fish how does that turn into something down the line that benefits me? And we can take that opportunity and start using more opportunities like that if we can grow these, these types of projects to have, you know, have agency partners there to, to talk about it. And we can bring up, you know, how they can participate in this process. Um, and, and I think that is part of, I believe, what was it, at the last meeting, um, we were talking about how you reach the people. And I was saying it's from the small level going and then going out broader, not coming broad and then talking down. So um, this is one of those grassroots on the ground, boots on the ground kind of ways of doing that. Mr. Chairman. Right. Yes, please. Thank, thank you for that, that answer. And, and, I, and I certainly, back when this kind of started, or when I remember it started in 14 or whatever, it was the, the, it was the, the big statement, at least on the West Coast, was the rusty door shut or some catchphrase that was being said. And, and, and I guess what I, um, you as a sport leader and, and Wayne and others that, that are in this process, you know, I invite others to come because it is not a rusty door and, and, and what you're doing on your boats for research and stuff is, is a great value and recognized. And I appreciate that. And so I, I just, you know, let it known that maybe, maybe it's a, um, a, uh, language barrier or something that's just not getting through, um, to others that are welcome to put their feet on the table, uh, at this process. And, and, uh, and we have MREP, you know, for, for education to help them get through that. And, and so anyway, I, that, thank you. And I take any more of your time. May I just one last thing. Yeah. This is a, it's a time and a financial burden to come here. And it's not necessarily something that the average Joe would necessarily do unless they feel personally invested in it which is what we're trying to do, which is what I think we can do, but it's still going to be on such a small scale. You're, not, I mean, um, I understand what you're saying, but, but there's, there's an aspect of they have to leave work to come here during the day to do that. Thank you. Further questions for Jamie? And I'm not seeing any hands now, so thank you very much. Thank you. And the Wayne Kodo. Welcome, Wayne. Morning, Chair Garolnik, Vice Chairs, Council, Council Members and Staff. Wayne Cotto with Coastal Conservation Association of California, representing the recreational angling community. You know, we've, uh, we participated in that, that summit in Washington, and we took a pretty good size West Coast contingency out there. And I'm happy to say that they're hearing us. You see their bullet points that represented things that we brought up. You see what happened with SAC and, and what we're doing with the stock assessment out there and the survey work, and that is a direct result of conversations we're having. So that's enlightening to us, it, it, it's positive. You know, we wanna thank uh, Ms. Coy, Mr. Dunn, Daniel, over back there, for all the outreach and engagement, because it is important. We, we do feel sometimes that we're talking to a wall and it's, it's, it's there, right? We're happy that we're starting to see those items put on the uh, on the list that we're being listened to, that we're not the enemy out there. We are trying to find solutions. We're trying to find engagement opportunities. I, I think the piece that I, I didn't hear was there is this issue of trust. We have this at all levels of government, 
between the community, the, the, the people and the government organizations. It's just there. And we have to rebuild that trust. And the things that we're trying to do now by finding solutions to these problems that we're working on, I think is part of that engagement that Butch is talking about. I think that what we have a problem with is the outreach and communication side. When the government says, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, we all laugh. That is not the point of outreach that is going to get down to every person out there. That's why groups like ours exist. We're the outreach group. We're the community partner out there. And we are doing everything we can to get our message out there. But we got to stop doing only fire drills. The sky is falling. Only time we engage hard is when there's an issue that we want everybody to go out and, and light the fire. And that's the wrong approach. We got to be more positive in the good things that we're trying to accomplish. That being said, when we have things like descending devices, which is such a positive thing for our fishery, we need to be rewarded for those and get that out there and, and reward the anglers for that. That's, that's important. And those kind of programs are being driven across the United States in other fisheries. The things we do here in California or on the West Coast are setting the stage across the country. And I think that's very positive. We need to, we need to put that out there. Flexibility was a big theme in Washington. And that flexibility is something that we all struggle with here. Our fisheries management plan are hard. The timelines, the processes, the stock assessments, it's very difficult. And if we're going to really combat the issues out there, we have to figure out how to be more flexible within our processes. When we see something broken, we need a pause button. We've said it before. There's just not this way to do that. And we're trying to figure out how to bypass things, right? We know there's data missing, engage us in it. We want to help. And that's what you're hearing from SAC, the sport fishing fleet, trying to figure out what data was missing. How do we get it? How do we help? And those are the things that we're trying to be more proactive on. We need to be able to forecast the future better so that we don't run into the problem and we stop being reactive to everything that we're doing. Because once we're reactive, it's three, four, five years down the line, it seems like. It's that's the process. So how do we do that better? Marine spatial planning is a big theme. Out here on the West Coast, it's going to collide. What's going to happen out there? Wind farms, national marine sanctuaries, aquaculture, you name it, it's coming. MPA decadal review for the state, the uh, 30 by 30, all of those things are going to collide. What is happening to the recreational fleet? What happens to the access to those underserved communities when we start shutting all that down? Where do they go? What happens to us? How do you mitigate that? That's the question. We don't know the answers. We haven't figured it out because there's just too many collision points. That crystal ball is fuzzy right now, and it's all coming at us. Climate change is going to happen. Again, going back to flexibility, how do we react better when these things happen? I think we learned a few things in the state with the MPAs and the inflexibility within those MPAs when the warm blob happened, and we're going to have to fix that. That is what adaptive management is for, but we need to be able to have the tools to do that. Descending, the car, the descending devices, I'm glad that we're finally starting to recognize that. I hope that we get to the, the point where we're going to get recognized for the, and award us for that. Again, outreach and communications is huge. Got to give hands up, uh, uh, accolades to the MREC program. I was a late bloomer to that one. I'm glad I went. I did learn a lot. Um, I, I thought I knew a lot more than I did, but that, that's good, and I'm glad. And I, I honestly believe I think a lot more of our uh, sport fishing fleet should go to MREP. I think they would learn a lot more and then they are, they will be the outreach because they're the touch point to the customers, the anglers. You heard Jamie talk about it, about her people talking about what they're doing with the, with the assessment programs out on the boats, but the more they learn, the better they're going to be able to outreach and that we got to train the future. And that's what that program's about. I think we need help with the data collection, right? What are those points that we're missing and how do we engage better in stock assessments or survey work, or how do we get more things that are going to help the process? We know budgets and staff are limited and it's only getting worse. The workload is always the problem, but we have a, an angling community out there that want to engage, but we just don't know how. And we're trying to figure that out, but we need help. How do we realistically put a program together 
that can be used to help us in the future. And that's what this first step that, that Jamie talked about with SAC. Um, and again, we're trying to be proactive instead of reactive. You know, the citizen science is there to help. Um, and I think that's the majority of, of this comment. I, I'm just happy that we're finally having these conversations. So thank you. All right, thank you, Wayne. Any questions, Butch Smith? Yeah, Wayne, um, not, not a question, but a, a comment, uh, appreciating all yours and Jamie's hard work and what, what you do and, and how you conduct business. I, I think you're encompassing, um, you know, high level sometimes and, and on the boots on the ground most of the time approaches uh, what this council likes to appreciates. And I, I want to thank you for that. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other questions? I'm not seeing any hands, so thank you very much, Wayne. That concludes the public comment. Um, before we proceed here, I'm optimistic that when we conclude this agenda item, our chair will give us a break. So we're going to push forward with council discussion on the topic. So I'll look for any hands to kick that off. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off. I've, I've had the um, benefit of hearing this presentation a couple of times um, and appreciate Russ bringing us this presentation to think about um, updating the national policy. Uh, I think we had really great um, input from the, um, the gap in their report. I appreciate that they took the time to discuss this and present a report in the public comment, I just thought was uh, really helpful too. Um, as I've been thinking about this uh, policy and updates that might um, improve the policy for the future, I guess starting with, I, I think the policy is really fairly comprehensive as it is as a national policy, um, definitely support um, the inclusion of competing ocean uses, um, that was brought up in the presentation and climate change and, and updating those elements of the policy, I think would be really important. Um, one of the things that I think about with the national policy is, you know, the really good guidance it provides to the nation, but then also thinking about its application to the different regions, how regions are very different from each other and thinking about, um, implementation at a regional level and what makes sense for the Pacific region um, in particular. And, and a couple of things uh, resonate with me and, and that is science and the need for funding to support our stock assessments and seeing that in our last uh, stock assessment cycle and the need for more data for near shore rockfish um, to improve that. And I think that really, when I listened to Jamie and Wayne uh, spoke to one of the comments Jamie made about um, the policies and number four in particular, and the idea of helping us look ahead um, rather than being so reactive. And Wayne said this, the same thing. And I think that's all based in our understanding of science. And so um, maybe a little down in the weeds from the national policy, but thinking about the application and into what we actually do day to day on the council. Um, I think that can really help us in, in regard to uh, being less reactive is improving the science that informs our management. Um, those are my comments for now to maybe that'll inspire others to contribute. Thanks. All right, thank you. As so I give others a chance here to to raise their hands up. Marcy Yarmko, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, first, certainly want to acknowledge the work of NIFS to um, revisit the policy and keep it fresh in our minds um, and take a look at uh, making some needed modifications uh, since the 2015 um, development of the policy. Um, it's nice to keep wreck fisheries front and center. Uh, oftentimes um, our agendas are um, very heavy with commercial fishery um, items and we're very much in, in a great level of detail. Um, 
Uh, and that I think holds true across uh, our fishery management plans that the focus generally is, is largely on commercial fisheries. So having a chance to take some time and step back and look at the importance of the role of recreational fisheries uh, to us and to our FMPs uh, here in this agenda item uh, on a recurring basis, uh, really appreciate that opportunity. Um, I'm thinking about remarks from, from Jamie and Wayne, um, and particularly uh, Wayne's um, comment about, um, you know, how can we help? How can we engage? Um, how can we um, get folks involved um, over the long term so that their engagement um, is, is recognized and is making a difference? Um, I want to say that... Um, I'm thinking about our ongoing monitoring programs in the state of California and particularly our California Recreational Survey um, program, um, which is um, federally compliant with um, MRIP and provides um, at the federal level an awful lot of information that allows us um, an exception from a federal fisheries license requirement for recreational fishing. Um, I just want to acknowledge that um, both SAC and CCA Cal and other uh, California recreational organizations have been absolutely awesome in cooperating with the ongoing implementation of, of these basic data collection programs. Um, we monitor uh, CPFVs, uh, CPFV operators take us aboard in many cases throughout California. Um, where we have samplers uh, observing both catch and effort of anglers while they're at sea. Uh, we also have dockside monitoring of CPFVs that happens um, in other ports of the state. Uh, we have a very extensive coded wire tag collection program for recreational salmon fisheries, both on the charter boats as well as at the launch ramps. Um, we even have surveys that take place in our, um, our back bays, um, and on our beaches and banks. So um, I just want to acknowledge your role in getting the angling communities comfortable with complying with our request for data um, collection in the field. Uh, we have a very high um, uh, compliance rate when we ask for folks to provide us either with their salmon heads or to take a survey um, when they've completed their fishing activity for the day. Um, so that may be one thing that uh, might deserve a little bit more highlighting um, as we look forward in, in revising the policy. Um, uh, maybe some just basic information about how, um, how extensive these data collection efforts are and how critically important they are. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes recreational anglers don't realize that they've made a difference until something bad happens, a rule change comes about that they, you know, is, is you know, disappointing to them. Um, but I, I kind of, I like to flip that around and think about how much good information, you know, decade in and decade out, um, your organizations and your participants have supplied into the process. And um, I think it's a huge success. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Further discussion, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, and again, looking at the guiding principles, um, the second one was the one that related to public access to quality recreational fishing opportunities. And I, I can't say that I remember this specifically, but I think that that particular principle has been a part of the guiding principles since they were developed. And the, the challenge with meeting that principle of, of, of having public access to quality recreational fishing opportunities is a much bigger challenge today than when it was, than it was when this was written. Um, and hidden in, in there, or, um, uh, or when you lift up the rug on that one, uh, the development of wind energy hits 
me right in the face. Um, recreational fisheries, I know off Washington, and I gather, I think, from off of Oregon and California well, as well, have have changed over time and the areas in which they fish has, have changed. And there's a lot more offshore type fishing by the recreational fishery over time than there was 30 years ago. Um, and so um, that particular policy that is within National Marine Fishery Service saltwater uh, recreational fishing policy is a is really an important one, and I and I I hope that NIMPS leadership um, will be able to advocate for access to recreational fishing. I've said the same thing about commercial fishing, so it's a I'm not singling them out, but I do believe that some of the wind energy uh, proposals that are out there uh, will. Uh, very much adversely affect recreational access to um, areas where they're fishing now. That's the other comment that I uh, wanted to make was relative to, to principle five, and it has the word trusted as associated with science. And I think therein lies one of the biggest challenges um, when you think about uh, trust and trust in what the science is telling us and trust in how management responds to science, if you don't first recognize that fisheries science is, in, is an inexact science and we are going, you know, regardless of how robust us, um, a uh, stock assessment is, it's going to be wrong. One way or the other, it's going to be wrong. Some by, by a little, some by a lot. And we learn as we go through time about, um, about those um, uh, deviations and variations with the output of a stock assessment. And you, you don't have to, you know, you think about cow cod. At one time, we didn't think it could ever be rebuilt by one assessment. I think about yellow eye and the rebuilding time frame being you know, 20, whatever, it's 2084 or whatever it is, and now it's 2030 or something. Um, canary rockfish, uh, there's, a, there's a number of examples where uh, the, the science um, and, what they're, and what, how that science informs management changes over time. And you can easily use those examples as a, to, to formulate a basis for lack of trust on the science. And I know Jamie used the word perceived uh, several times. Um, to, to me, uh, in, uh, the implication was that we perceive we have a problem that really doesn't exist. Well, that's a two-sided sword. There, there are times when we think things are okay and they're really not. And um, so I just, on the trusted side, it, I think there's just more and more, the more education that we can do about the science and its limitations and how we can, we are, we, the, the, the management uh, uh, regime in its broadest context are continually trying to improve our science. And as we do that, sometimes that gives us a different perspective on the status of a stock than maybe what we had a year ago or five years ago. And if you're not willing to accept those kinds of differences, um, then it's hard to build trust into the system uh, if you don't have that fundamental belief that the scientists and the managers are doing their level best to bring the very best information to their decision making. And if you don't, if you know, that's the piece where I think we need to do uh, to focus on and do more work so that we can build a higher level of trust. Thank you. Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And, and while Mr. Anderson was talking, I, I uh, you know, uh, something came into my mind, which is dangerous sometimes. Um, but I, I think that the communication piece 
which I perceive there is a problem when we do have um, bad news. I think the, um, the translation down to the general public that, or the explanation how we got there and why we got there is um, not as it could be, good as it could be in this process. Um, you know, some of the documents that are, that are written that come out of here are beautiful documents if you have a PhD, but not, not, so, not so easy to read if you're, uh, you know, a, a electrician and not a, and not a biologist in, in fisheries management. Um, and so I, you know, maybe, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's part of the missing link is the explanation why, why we got here and maybe, uh, eighth grade math instead of, uh, instead of, uh, doctorate, uh, trigonometry or, or whatever you might rocket science. But, but I, I think that might be, um, a, a piece of the puzzle too, that, uh, because I know I have fishermen that are in this process come up to me and say, what does this say? <laughs> and they're intimately involved in that particular fisheries. And so uh, fish management is hard and we have hardworking people um, that are great, some of the best science in the world on, the, on, on these issues. But, but maybe some of the translation is, uh, is lost of why we get here and how we got here. So anyway, that's just maybe a suggestion, um, the, the comment that I have. So thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Chairman Gorelnik. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hessemer. Um, good comments all around. Um, I, I did want to respond to a question that uh, Bush Smith had asked of, I'm not sure if it was Jamie or Wayne, about we, we have these opportunities for engagement where our, and I think you kind of touched on your last comment, you know, recreational anglers um, by and large, um, you know, are working 40 to 50 hours a week, you know, to pay the mortgage and whatnot. Um, and aside from any uh, technological or uh, science-based hurdles, um, they just got other things going on. So it is, it has always been hard to get those folks to engage. Um, but it's, and, and I'm glad we do have some engaging, but that that's, that's a constant battle. And I think when it comes to engaging with the recreational community, um, just like we'll, we try to engage with the commercial industry when, you know, they're not on the water. We, we don't do our salmon management um, during salmon season, right? We, we do it before and um, it, it might be necessary to do some engagement in the evening. And it's, it's, it's sort of like along the lines of how we are going to engage with underserved communities. Sometimes you have to meet them halfway or a little bit more to have that engagement. Um, and then I'd also like to comment on, on uh, Phil Anderson's comment about trust. I think it, trust is important, um, but I think that, you know, we've, we, there's, it's twofold. And I think uh, Heather hit, hit the nail on the head where we, we don't really have the data. We don't have the fishery independent data to make trustworthy stock assessments uh, in large part. And even if the scientists and the assessors are doing their level best job, uh, if you don't have the data, you can't really provide um, uh, a trustworthy answer. And I think that it's also true with regard to the stocks that have consistently we built well in advance of forecasts. And while the assessors, I'm sure, are doing their level best, if you are on the water and uh, you're, you know, being prevented from accessing certain areas or retaining certain fish, um, you know, you want to make sure that's being done on the, on the, you know, with the best available information and, 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 and a balanced assessment. And if we're consistently exaggerating how long it takes these stocks to rebuild, then that's not a good way to, to build trust. Uh, you know, there's nothing sinister going on. It's just that, you know, maybe we need to, uh, to take a better look at how we're doing those assessments so we're not consistently, um, whether it be the canary or cow cod or yellow eye or the other stocks that are important to uh, provide access to these fisheries. Thank you. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I listen to the comments and agree with them all around the table and it brings me to my favorite subject of MREP. And, and how we see people that have gone through that program coming forth that don't necessarily underst prior understood the pro understood the process, understood that they just can't come in and make a comment and I have a problem, fix it. 
and then they don't get results. And so lack of trust, lack of all of these things we're talking about. But, and I'm not saying MREP's the, the sole uh, source of doing this, but that per, that prod, uh, procedure, that way of getting people integrated into the system to understand how it works from stock assessments to data collection to council management um, it is really important to building trust. If you don't understand the system, it's pretty easy to doubt it. And, you know, I, well, as I say, my favorite subject, MREP, it's, uh, it, it, I've seen almost, ex, you know, unanimously people that come into the room in our, in our science management part, doubting the science, doubting the, the viability of that science and the, the people doing it. It's almost unanimous around the table. And then we do a, a follow-up to that at the end of the meeting and people go, wow, these guys know what they're doing. I had a beer with the guy. The guy's a good guy. He's not, doesn't have evil, you know, uh, intentions. This is, this is good stuff. And, and I, now I understand and I also understand how to, how to be part of it. And the same thing with management. I think to get more recreational fisheries involved, it takes people like Wayne and Jamie to actually build the fire and get people to attend where they can, understand Mark's comments totally that not everybody has time, but you find those people that do have time that, that can, be the, can be the trusted uh, resource for people that aren't involved so they know how to interact. And I think that's building a community. But I know the first time I sat over there at that table, testified and knew nobody around here dressed in suits and nice uh, attire, it was intimidating. And the same thing is approaching scientists that speak a language that you don't understand. It's intimidating. But once you get to know them, you can sit at that table all day long and you can talk to people you know and you trust. So I, uh, I think that it's a, it's a cohesive effort we have to do. It ties into EEJ, it ties into all of those things. That, but, it, but it is, a, like Jamie said, it's ground up. It's not top down. And I think, but we have to meet halfway too. So I think there's, that's my comments. I appreciate this report and what it, what it brought forward. Thank you. Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to echo, I think, what Heather noted about the GAP comments being excellent. Um, look, thinking a little bit more about EEJ, um, I heard uh, Mr. Dunn talk a little bit about the fact that they were uh, struggling about the relationship between recreational fishing and subsistence, and just wanted to note that um, subsistence fishermen on the West Coast um, are important and that their relationship to this process and recreational fishing and subsistence fishing um, and commercial fishing is very important. So I encourage Mr. Dunn, I, maybe the council can in our letter, just to note that I hope that the special relationship that exists on the West Coast, which is different than other coasts, is, is taken into account as those um, words are considered. Uh, I'd also like to note um, the importance of translation services. Um, this is not in the existing policy, but as the agency considers this, um, many of our recreational fishermen, English is not a first language. Um, I suspect this is not just an issue for the West Coast, but it is an important issue for the West Coast. Uh, so I would en encourage that as part of the policy update. Uh, I agree that developing a deeper connection with the angling community and the science is important. Other folks around the table have already sp spoken to that, but I, I strongly agree that's Critical not only because, as Jamie noted, it can it can make our science better and faster, uh, but as Wayne noted, it builds trust. Um, finally, uh, Jamie noted in reference to principle one that conservation quote goes goes without saying. Uh, this region has a strong history of basing decisions on science and doing our best regarding data collection, um, even given the size and diversity of our coast and our ecosystem. Uh, but not all regions do. Uh, if we decide to submit a letter, um, I think there should be some horn tooting <laughs> and provide examples about how things are working. Uh, for example, programs that Jamie mentioned and some of the data structures that Marcy noted. 
Um, I'm not saying that we can't do better. I think we can <laughs> in pretty fundamental ways, but noting from a national perspective uh, that this council on the West Coast saltwater recreational community has, has been a leader. So stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Um, with that, I don't want to cut off discussion. I want to take a pause just to refresh our action and, and reference something we heard there from Ms. Ridings about a potential letter. So uh, I do want to um, remind you that's part of our action here. Consider whether we want to send that. There's been a lot of good discussion and comments, and I'd like to know if there's any desire to have the executive director and the staff compile that discussion and the public comment into a letter. The comment period closes December 31st, so that's before our next meeting. So a consideration also of the process for sending that out, whether you'd want to see a QR process or something different. So just looking for head nods. I don't think we need a motion on that, but um, if there's any desire to Set, prepare a letter and send that out. And I'm seeing some, a, a number of head nods around the table. So then I will ask Executive Director Burden, uh, not to summarize uh, everything, but uh, have you heard enough to assemble a letter? And then how would you like to proceed with uh, delivering that to NIMS? Yes, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Vice Chairman, and I would also invite uh, Deputy Director uh, Kelly Ames to comment as well. Um, so what I've heard, I, I believe we have enough to draft a letter. Um, the last time we did something like this was at our last meeting on the topic of EEJ, and we pursued a QR letter process. My personal feeling is that uh, it's probably overkill um, and that we could do something simpler this time if you would prefer that. Um, and what I would envision is staff drafting a letter and consulting with council leadership on that letter to the extent uh, to make sure that we're all clear there and then going ahead and transmit. Uh, that would be my proposal, but certainly happy to follow the QR letter process again, if you all would, would like to do so. Um, and then I guess I would look at Ms. Ames to see if I've butchered anything or missed something. All right, thank you. Nothing to add there, Kelly, on that. So uh, with that suggestion from the executive director, uh, is everyone comfortable with uh, the preparation of that letter and then review through the leadership team rather than the QR process? And just looking for head nods or would you like to see that? Okay. I'm seeing some agreement that uh, you can go ahead and prepare that letter and uh, the leadership team will review it and you will send that off prior to the deadline. So thank you. Is there anything else, Kelly, that we need to cover on this topic? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think I have good instructions and I look forward to drafting the letter to submit on behalf of the council. Thank you. All right, I thank everybody for their comments and discussion on this and I will turn the gavel back to our chairman. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna take a break here uh, till, until 11.30 and at 11.30 we will begin salmon and I will preemptively pass the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger because he will take the gavel for that agenda item. So we'll see everyone back here at 
Okay, if we could uh, get, take our seats, we'll get started here. All right. Well, it's great to hear uh, everybody, uh, the laughter, and everybody getting uh, reacquainted after a period of time. We uh, a lot of us have been away from each other. Um, okay, um, we're going to start it on uh, D one, and I'm going to turn to Robin to uh, kick us off. Robin, are you there? I am. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D one, where we're talk about the National Marine Fisheries Service report. We have a report from NIMPS that just helps the council be informed on any relevant uh, salmon fishery issues or topics of interest to the council. There are a couple of documents uh, for reference under this agenda item. We have Susan Bishop here to go through the NIMPS report one. Uh, we also have a NIMPS report two, a supplemental report, uh, which I guess could have been an attachment uh, to the NIMPS report one, but uh, Susan will walk us through both of those. And we also have a report from the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I believe we have Grace Easterbrook here to uh, provide information on that. So your council action under this agenda item is uh, pretty much just discussion and guidance as needed and uh, receive or hear any public comments that may come your way. So that concludes my summary of agenda item D1. Okay, uh, thank you, Robin. Questions for Robin on her overview? Okay, seeing none, uh, with that, I'll turn to Susan to, for the next report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. Um, I will be reporting on recent developments with potential impacts for salmon um, management, and that is agenda item D1A in your briefing book. Um, as uh, Robin mentioned, and there's also another supplemental report that is directly relevant to the first topic that I'll be covering. Um, in general, these topics, these four topics are just updates of issues that uh, have come before the council before. And I just wanted to keep you updated on where things are with those. Um, so the first topic is the stock status determinations. Um, NIMS West Coast Region recently informed the council, and that is the, the second document that's in your briefing book under this agenda item uh, regarding the salmon stock status determination under MSA for the Hood Canal coho stock. Um, so as you might recall, in 2021, NIMS determined that one stock of salmon, Hood Canal coho, was approaching an overfish condition based on an assessment of data in pre-3 for 2021. That assessment included escape, spawning escapement data for 2018 and 2019, and then what was forecast to return at that time in 2021. Um, um, and based on that information, uh, we had concluded that the stock was approaching an overfish condition. Subsequently, um, when information became available in 2022 and was reported in pre-3, um, and that information included um, final estimates for uh, 2019, 20, uh, 21, 2020, and 2021, it resulted in an increase in the three-year geometric mean spawning escapement on which the stock status determinations are made. Um, and the results of that was an escapement level greater than both the minimum stock um, threshold and the SMSY level for the stock. And so therefore, Hood Canal Natural Coho stock um, has, be, has now determined to be not overfished. And that's what's basically captured in the letter to the council. Um, just as a reminder um, of the original five stocks declared overfished in 2018, NIMS determined in 2020 that the Sacramento River Falls Chinook were rebuilt um, and in 2021, that Snohomish coho was not overfished rebuilding. So good news on two of some three stocks. However, the Snohomish um, coho stock, as well as the Queets River coho, Klamath River Snook, and Strait Juan de Fuca coho salmon stocks continue to be managed under uh, rebuilding plans. I'll just pause there for a moment in case there's any questions on that agenda or that topic. Questions for Susan? 
Okay. Uh, the second item I'd like to update on you on is Amendment 23 to the Salmon um, FMP. Um, so as you recall, the council had been engaged for 18 months or two years in a process to develop new harvest control rules for the um, Southern Oregon, Northern California coho uh, salmon ESU. Um, that was concluded successfully last winter and the council transmitted its recommendations for Amendment 23 to NIMS on August 10th of 2022. Um, just reminding you that that included two control rules for the ESU, one that would apply to um, five of the six stocks for which sufficient data were available, and a second harvest control rule for the Trinity River itself. Um, and that was uh, transmitted as Amendment 23. It's established or, um, and included all both freshwater, anticipated both uh, impacts in the ocean as well as freshwater. Um, NEMS published a notice of availability in the Federal Register in August subsequently for public review um, and concluded that public review in mid-October. Um, we received very few comments. I think we, we've, we've received four comments, one from the EPA, one in support of the, um, of the amendment, and two that were not related to the topic at hand. Um, so of interest to you is that NIMS will make its decision on Amendment 23 by November 17th. So we're required to do that within 30 days of the close of public comment um, and consistent with the provisions of the MSA. So in that case, we will either approve, deny, or partially approve the amendment. Any questions on that topic? I'm not seeing any. The third uh, topic of interest is the status of the California Coastal Chinook consultation. Um, on March 29th um, of this year, NIMS reinitiated consultation on the effects of ocean salmon fisheries on California Coastal Chinook. Um, when the 2021, uh, 2021 ocean salmon fisheries exceeded their take limit for the ESU. Uh, the consultation, just wanted to let you know, the consultation is on schedule for completion prior to the 2023 ocean a salmon fishing season, um, and that NEMS is working closely with uh, our Southwest Fisheries Science Center and the California Department of Fish and Game to explore the implications um, of that uh, consultation for the 2023 salmon fishing season. Um, and the results of that consultation uh, will be reflected uh, in our guidance letter next year as well. Are there any questions on that topic? I think you're good. Okay. And finally, um, uh, is a, an update on where we are with Central Valley Spring Chinook with regard to the 2023 ocean salmon fisheries. Um, uh, the council relies on management, the management framework developed for Sacramento winter uh, Chinook along with regulatory measures in the FMP to limit impacts to Central Valley Spring Chinook. Uh, in a manner of uh, sufficient to avoid jeopardy. Um, if you recall this last March, uh, NIMS's Southwest Fisheries Science Center presented information to the council um, indicating the potential for very low abundance for brood year um, 2020. So fish beginning to return in primarily 2023. Um, consequently, the fisheries in 2023 are likely to encounter a, ver a very weak um, Central Valley Spring Chinook cohort based on the information that we have. Um, because of actions taken to offset poor anticipated freshwater survival for both Sacramento uh, Fall Chinook and Sacramento Winter Run Chinook, um, the 2023 forecast for those stocks could be higher than they would otherwise be, um, given that we're hopeful that those actions would be successful in uh, increasing the survival of those fish. Um, however, um, uh, the, those actions or the benefits of those actions would not likely be reflected uh, in the natural origin productivity that the Central Valley Spring Chinook experienced. Um, the, at that time, the Central, the Science Center reported, report described additional technical work that could be helpful to the council in its 2023 management de de deliberations on the stock, um, and particularly the Central Valley Spring Chinook. Um, one of those analyses was a, look, a closer look at potentially helpful environmental indicators that would give us a better sense of the strength of the incoming cohort. And I wanted to let you know that at this meeting, the Habitat Committee will report out on its work to refine those indicators 
um, and that this work together with other available information would um, inform the status of uh, brood year 2020 returns uh, and what that might mean for the fisheries in 2023. Um, and I understand uh, from the uh, email from Corey Green this morning that they have made a lot of progress. And in fact, the Habitat Committee was discussing those this morning and we'll be reporting out later. Uh, any questions on that topic? Okay, any questions uh, for Susan on the, that or the any other part of report one? I think you're, you're doing well. All right, well, that concludes my report. Okay. Okay. All right. And with that, um, next up would be the uh, CDFW report. Ooh. Yes, Phil. Sorry. Um, I'll wait a minute. Uh, just a question um, for Ms. Bishop. Um, on the Central Valley Spring Chinook piece, um, it, is this is this in just in well not just but in part intended to give us an early heads up that the situation has changed with respect to that stock and um, that it may provide some management challenges for us in 2023. At, to the vice chair, um, yes, Mr. Anderson, that is our intent. Um, the indications, as we reported in March, are not good, um, but there, you know, we've we've also had indications for other stocks that marine survival is higher, um, has been good. So we want to look at all the information that we have going into 2023. Um, it may not be challenging, or it may be that management actions that we are taking for other associated stocks might be adequate. Um, so, but we want to make sure that council is aware of our concerns and that we're looking at all the information that we have um, going into next year. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Anyone else? Okay, out of the CDFW report and uh, Marcy Ripko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. That was a very nice introduction to the CDFW report. Um, as Susan mentioned, um, NIMS is definitely interested in exploring all information that might be available to inform their assessment over winter on the, the strength of the uh, 2020 brood year for um, spring run Chinook. So um, with that, we, we did a little homework and a little data mining and um, have a report to offer you here uh, to the council. Um, I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, Grace Easterbrook is online prepared to give our report. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Grace, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So this is agenda item D1B, Supplemental CDFW Report 1. California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on Central Valley Spring Chinook. The National Marine Fisheries Service report, agenda item D1A, Supplemental NIMS Report 1, references ongoing work by the Southwest Fisheries Science Center to examine the status of brood year 2020 Central Valley Spring Chinook. The council was first alerted to this work in March 2022, with the authors noting that multiple lines of evidence point to the potential for very low abundance for brood year 2020. The March report also concluded that 2023 fisheries, and to a lesser extent, fisheries late in the 2022 management year, are likely to encounter a weak brood year 2020 CVSC cohort. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife offers an initial examination of age two CVSC coated wire tag recoveries over the last five years, table one and two, and the number of hatchery releases for the corresponding brood years, figure one. While the 2022 tag recovery data is not yet complete, in the 2022 commercial and recreational ocean fisheries, 36 brood year 2020 age, age two tags were recovered, 47% by number of the total tags this year. Furthermore, brood year 2020 releases were substantially less than recent years, totaling just over 1 million. Although raw coated wire tag recoveries provide no information about the natural origin CVSC, the number of H2 CVSC recovered this year, paired with fewer releases by the brood year, suggests the hatchery component of brood year 2020 
may not be as weak as anticipated. CDFW encourages NIMS to explore the coded wire tag data further and offers to assist with additional analyses. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Grace. Um, questions for Grace on the CDFW report? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you. That'll take us to, um, let's see, no reports or no management bodies. Do we have any public comment here? I don't see any. Okay. There's no, no public comments. So that'll take us to uh, council action, which is a discussion and guidance on the, on D1. So with that, I'll open the floor up. Thank um, National Marine Fishery Service for keeping us up to date um, as the uh, California Coastal Chinook uh, consultation work continues. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to engage in ongoing dialogue uh, with you on this topic. Um, feeling um, good that the work is progressing, um, though we haven't really seen any uh, initial outcomes yet. We do have um, pretty good um, information available to us that's presented in the STT report three on the work that's gone on looking at the Klamath Ocean Harvest model and how um, our projections out of that model um, play out in terms of the effectiveness in achieving the, uh, the ESA constraint. So um, I'm encouraged and I appreciate the ongoing dialogue on that topic. Um, regarding Central Valley Spring, um, as the NIMS report describes, uh, they first alerted the council to the situation back in March. Um, we've been, um, this has been on our radar after the, the signal was sent back in March that this might be a topic of um, interest. Uh, but as um, you've just seen in the CDFW report, we, um, we may have other information, uh, at least uh, initial information out of our 2022 uh, fishery activity and the tags that we've been able to recover and process to date that potentially at least the hatchery production uh, portion of the brood year um, may not have uh, fared as poorly as uh, what might have been suggested um, in the NIMS report back in March and then again here in this report. So um, we're looking forward to um, some additional work um, prior to NIMS finalizing their guidance letter. Uh, hopefully we'll have the opportunity for more dialogue and bring some other folks to the table that um, can contribute to the discussion from CDFW as well um, to uh, do just as, as Susan indicated, um, pull as much information as we can uh, into the discussion before um, uh, decisions need to be made about additional uh, protections for the 2020 brood year. So um, anyway, again, appreciate the, the ongoing work. Um, but I think, you know, our initial look is that maybe we aren't um, as in a dire situation with this brood year as, as might've been presented back in March. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I would just sort of echo the appreciation for the collaboration with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, you know, sort of engaging early and proactively um, and sort of making sure all the right people under really understand the data are in the room to talk about this um, so that we have a clear sense going into next year's preseason planning, what we're uh, thinking of doing. We have access to all the information. So very, very appreciative of um, of Marcy and her staff um, reaching out to us. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Robin, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think we have had a good discussion on these topics. It definitely helps us prepare for next year and gives us an idea of uh, what is 
been happening with some of the work we've already done. So under this agenda item, I think uh, the council has uh, completed their work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Um, that concludes D1. Um, if we stop right now and come back at one o'clock, we'll be on schedule and uh, we'll start D2. So uh, we have a few extra minutes here, so we'll take advantage of that. So enjoy your lunch.
Hey, Chris, this is John Carey from the STT. Just want to do a quick mic check. John Carey, is that you? Yep, thanks. I was just doing a mic check. I think it's oh. good. <laughs> I was like, what are you, who, how are we talking right now? Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're good. All right.
we'll get uh, started here just shortly. Okay, welcome back from the lunch. And um, with that, uh, I'll turn to uh, Robin to start us off on uh, D2. Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this is agenda item D2, the final methodology review. Um, every year, the council uh, looks at the methodology review for salmon uh, consistent with council operating procedure 15. We have the SSC and the STT uh, take a look at any new or modified uh, methods that are used to estimate salmon impacts to make sure we're using the best information available. Uh, we also use this form to review any updated stock uh, conservation objective proposals. And uh, it's also been a really good vehicle to help work through some of the salmon topics uh, during uh, the off season of uh, salmon preseason items. So the review is in prep for the council adoptions here at this November meeting uh, so that everything that's changed or is different or wants to be considered is done and taken care of before we start our preseason planning process for salmon uh, come March and April. So we want to make sure that we get all those things uh, done and considered uh, before we get to that stage. At our September 20. 2022 meeting, the council did approve items for this year's methodology review. Uh, those five are listed here in your situation summary. Um, I would also uh, correct the SITS. Um, uh, there are five items, not four. And one of the items, um, which is item number three, that has to do with the Sacramento index forecast, uh, that would actually be a methodology review. And you're Sit some, it says that none of the items are technically a methodology review, but item three does qualify as, as such. So um, as the methodology review took place in October, there were technical documents that were related to each of these items. Those were submitted to the SSC Salmon Subcommittee and the STT prior uh, to the start of that meeting, which was in October 12th through 13th in 2022. And the results of that meeting are going to be provided to you here. And um, we have a list of reference materials. Um, we have a report from NIMPS, a report from the Model Evaluation Work Group. We have three reports from the STT a report from the SSC and from your advisory bodies, you have a report from the SAS. Your action under this agenda item is to approve any new or modified methodologies as appropriate and then provide any guidance as needed for any unresolved methodology issues. Uh, with that, I think I've covered everything underneath the SITSUM and we'll hand it back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Robin. Uh, questions for Robin on her overview? Okay. Seeing none, I'll go to the, uh, the NIPS uh, report. We have a PowerPoint, I believe. Uh, Jeremy, are you going to be doing that? Very good. Oh. <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate the microphone. Hello again, everyone. Appreciate um, the opportunity to be with you here today to present uh, what you see online as the supplemental NIMPS presentation one underneath agenda item D2A. And for um, folks following along online, we'll get started now. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So diving in, trying to also be mindful of uh, the conversation the council had this morning for consideration of what is digestible that comes before the council. I'll try and keep uh, today's presentation as simple as possible. And the purpose today is to provide both the public and the council an overview of the um, process that was adopted underneath <clears throat> Amendment 21 in anticipation that updates would occur for the models that are used to um, develop and uh, report on the abundance threshold. I don't have a lot of slides, but do hope that this lays out the scope of what was done, what was expected and what the changes uh, do. So next slide, please. So recall back in 2020, the council established the threshold and incorporated it into the FMP, which uses salmon abundances off the West Coast in the North of Falcon area specifically, and that when triggered would require additional fishery management measures enacted in that particular year uh, of triggering. Now, during the selection of the preferred alternative, the work group tasked with advising the council also advised that the actual numerical values uh, that were calculated at the time would change as the models were recalibrated. And you can see on this slide in particular, I've pulled the table from uh, the description of the material that was presented in that agenda item, highlighting the footnote for uh, folks at the meeting that the preferred alternative selection occurred. And next slide, please. So you may also recall earlier this year at the March meeting, we advised the council that the underlying models used to calculate the threshold uh, were at a point where we, in, we anticipated that updates were expected to occur. And as such, we recommended initiating the technical review process that was outlined in the FMP. At the September council meeting, uh, the council approved evaluating those recalibrations and the up, as the updates became available. Now, while our recommendation was not a review of the threshold itself, our expectation is that by continuing to utilize the years that are highlighted here in yellow on this slide, that, that the threshold would remain responsive to the SRKW uh, needs and biology that was associated with the choosing of those years in particular at the time that the threshold was established. And those include consecutive years of low abundance, a mix of killer whale status, various ocean survival scenarios for Chinook abundance, the one year lag relationship association between Southern residents and Chinook abundances. And therefore, I just wanted to stress as this slide does with its highlighted text, the importance of continuing to rely on those exact years for the calculation. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll start um, with what was updated. So the FRAM recalibrations um, are part of the construction, or excuse me, the FRAM itself, Fishery Regulation Assessment Model for those online, is constructed and estimated um, using both it and the Shelton distribution model. And so this slide indicates that we are going from version 6.2 to version 7.1.1, which will be used by the co-managers for this salmon fishery setting process and Mr. John Carey provided a summary of these updates through the review process to the STT and SSC. And I'll uh, refer you to those materials that will be presented later on in this agenda item. Next slide, please. So for the Shelton model, which is the model that distributes the Chinook uh, spatially uh, along the coast, 
there are boxes that you can maybe pick up on this slide on in the graphic. Um, it does both spatial and temporal distributions. So new distributions derived from 2021 version of the Shelton model are available and expected to supplant the 2019 version. I'll also mention that covariates were incorporated into uh, the new model, but they are not presently used to calculate the abundance threshold and nor are they anticipated to be. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so during the review process, uh, Dr. Ollie Shelton from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center provided the overview of the updates in the Shelton model to the STT and SSC. This slide depicts that more code wire tag groups and codes were incorporated into the latest version, as well as expansion of the data set by about approximately 20 years. And so these incorporations do result in parity with other data sources uh, for quality control purposes and sources of several stock distribution data sets, uh, such as far north migrating stocks <clears throat> and since these are more abundant over the course of this data set, it does result in lower abundances across the data set in the north of Falcon area. The patterns of abundance, however, for uh, the general ups and downs remain the same. And my next slide, please. So what I just said indicates on this slide in a visual depiction now it's important to note that this is only the North of Falcon area. And so you'll see um, in the supplemental STT report number two, there'll be a uh, table one, we'll have the numeric values that are associated on this slide. And I don't wanna leave you with the impression here that overall abundance is changing. I will get to that in the next slide. What's occurring in this slide in particular, you can see um, that the orange line depicting abundance over time goes from a subtle change with implementing the change from FRAM version 6.2 to FRAM version 7.1.1. And then when you go from that change down to the gray change, that's the implementation of the spatial distribution data uh, between Shelton 2019 and Shelton 2021. You can see the pattern doesn't change. You can see the occurrences that a threshold would be triggered also do not change. And you know the question I think most folks ask themselves is, okay, why does that happen? Next slide, please. So this slide hopefully completes the picture as to why. Um, you can see that going from FRAM round 6.2 to FRAM round 7.1.1, that none of the distributions between the first and the middle pie graph change. The, these uh, slices all remain the same. Yes, there is a, a slight increase in the overall abundance, it's about 5%, uh, but the distribution proportions in that case remain the same. What happens when you apply the Shelton distribution of the 2021 version is that you see on the third pi, uh, some of the abundance simply shifts to other areas. And so that is the reason for the change on the y-axis of the abundance in the prior a depiction in the North of Falcon area. Next slide, please. So um, in, in summary, I, I hope this presentation walked you through the general changes that we're looking at in terms of uh, both what the council anticipated as a process to review any changes to inputs that may come about that were anticipated when Amendment 21 uh, was approved. But most importantly, I think from a NIMS perspective, we'd like to stress the utilization of the same years that are outlined in the FMP. Um, that was a question I think that came uh, up fairly frequently through the process. And 
it's also important to think about that just from a relative perspective of uh, what we were analyzing in regards to the biological needs of the whales. And whether or not the council does deem an update here appropriate and necessary, uh, this slide also indicates that we would still request that the council report uh, the pre-fishing October 1 adult Chinook salmon abundance based on preseason forecasts for each of the five spatial areas defined by the ad hoc uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, questions for Jeremy on his uh, presentation? Bill Anderson, Bill? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Good to see you. Um, on the first slide, there's a, a note. Um, I'll just read the last phrase, but the methodology determining each value would remain fixed as described in, the re in this report. <coughs> and I don't know about all of you, but you know, we, we have models, we throw around terms like updates, we, I don't say throw around, we use terms like updates, recalculation, methodology changes, and I'm not sure I could define all of those terms. This note, however, seems to suggest that the methodology is fixed and that it's not changing, that these updates don't constitute a change. Recalculation or updates, depending on which term is the appropriate one, don't constitute a methodology change. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. That is correct. Can I, can I have one more question? On the second slide, um, we're, you know, the, we're aware of the, of the years, the 94 through 96, 98 through 2000 and 2007. We're generally aware of why, why those years were chosen. <laughs> Yet when I read the SDT report, well, I can't remember which one, and, and I just had a look at the SSCs, there seems to be some, um, I, won't, I don't know if it's confusion, but a suggestion that those years aren't necessarily fixed, that there may, not, there may be maybe those some other selection of years should be used. Uh, I don't know if I'm paraphrasing, but the, the, there isn't a common understanding that these are the years that are used. There, I think there's a common understanding these are the years that were used initially, but it seems from reading those two committees report that there isn't an understanding that they will, these are the years that will continue to be used. So I hope that if, if it's okay for me to ask him that question. Please. Just your thoughts about that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. If um, I, I may need to paraphrase your question as I understand it, but you are asking for whether or not my interpret, I, I should preface this by saying I have reviewed the STT's reports, I have reviewed uh, the SSC report that just posted, and the, <clears throat> the question as I understand it is, um, what is the clarity around the utilization of those particular years versus I think what the language uh, without having it in front of me within the FMP indicates um, the lowest seven. So there um, is a question mark uh, in terms of your question to me as to what uh, is the perf uh, interpretation of that. And um, for folks online, I see Mr. Anderson is nodding his head yes. And so 
our interpretation from a NIMS perspective does outline in the biological opinion that these years in particular um, are important, um, not simply the lowest years of Chinook abundance, but that these years are important specifically for some of the reasons that I outlined during and on this slide. And so therefore, if that question um, was to come, you know, to NIMS from its interpretation of the opinion, we would say these years in particular are, uh, should remain the years from which the threshold is calculated. And I would ask uh, if that answers your question, Mr. Anderson. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Jordan, yes. And the reason I asked you that question now uh, is because when you were speaking to this slide, I understood you to say that these are the years that should be used. And so that, that was the reason I asked the question at this time. I suspect we'll get a chance to talk about it further as we move along, but so thank you. And yes, that did answer my question. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Phil. Further questions for Jeremy? Danny? <coughs> Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Jordan, for the presentation. Um, first off, I want to say um, I appreciate NIMS's interest and uh, focus on updating uh, these analytics with the latest and greatest science. Um, we have come a long way uh, in a short period of time. You know, four years ago in 2018, we were doing the analysis on the impacts in Southeast Alaska to killer whales of those fisheries that went in our biological opinion. Uh, then we had the uh, lawsuit here and uh, the ad hoc uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group, which did a tremendous amount of work, uh, good work that arrived at Amendment 21. Uh, and we've also had a lot of science along the way. We've had the... Uh, Diet studies have been published. We identified priority prey stocks. We've had uh, the uh, distribution work of uh, Dr. Shelton in 2019 and again in 2021. And uh, now we're seeking to update the, uh, with, update the model with the data again. So my question to you is now we have a number of fisheries and biological opinions with um, that uh, need southern resident killer well impact analysis considered in them there's a number of them in play uh, based on the decisions made around this table today and any updates to amendment 21 uh, is it nymphs intent to use the same or similar methodology in the impact analysis for uh, other fisheries and, and you know in particular I'm most interested in Southeast Alaska but I would suspect the same would be true of Puget Sound and other fisheries that are currently in play. Thank you Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you uh, Ms. Evanson. Uh, as I understand your question yes this methodology would be used um, as uh, NIMS moves forward with other fishery analyses. Thank you for that. You know, I ask because this has very real management implications for a number of fisheries on the seaboard. So thank you. Thank you, Danny. Susan Bishop. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I didn't mean to, inter to jump in or interrupt here, but I guess I would just provide a caveat to that answer that NIMS is always going to be looking at whatever the best available science is to answer the question that's at hand. And so the question that we have here is how we are updating um, a threshold that's established for, and specific to manage the uh, PFMC fisheries. Um, and so our discussion with regard to um, other areas is still ongoing with the, regard to the question at hand there. Um, this is certainly the starting point where NIMS would stand, would start um, and anticipate that this is probably what we would look at doing, but it would again depend on the specific um, circumstances in those areas and the fishery actions that are proposed in those areas. 
Thank you, Susan. Okay, further questions on the next presentation? Okay, but I'll see any. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. All right. Um, next up will be the meal report. And I believe um, Angelica is who I have on the, my list. Yes, correct. Can everybody hear me? We can. Awesome. So I'll get started right away. So my name is Angelika hagen -Bro. I'm um, the chair of the Model Evaluation Workgroup. Um, and I'm reading the, the MU statement. Uh, the following two topics were presented at the methodology review with the model evaluation workgroup or MU as the lead. Uh, the first one, technical review of the base period updates associated with round 711 of the fishery regulation assessment model, FRAM, as they relate to model abundances of Chinook salmon stocks used in establishing the southern resident killer whale threshold. And second, FRAM technical detail documentation. For the first item, Mr. John Carey presented a summary of the four major changes in the new base period that affect model-derived estimates of Chinook ocean cohort sizes. These model outputs are used to estimate regional Chinook abundances using methods derived by the ad hoc SRKW workgroup, from which the abundance thresholds for the North of Falcon area was derived. Three of the changes were simply data updates or corrections to coded wire tag recovery information, stock-specific terminal run size estimates, and fishery catch estimates. The fourth was an expansion to the CWT escapement recoveries to account for inner dam loss to Upper Columbia River stocks. For the second item, the FRAM documentation, Ms. Angelika hagen bro gave a presentation of the FRAM documentation website and the newly added technical content the documentation uh, is an online living repository. It hosts previously presented a user manual and a FRAM overview. The newly added content focused on expanded equations to compute non-landed mortalities, evaluate size limit changes, and describe mark selective fishing equations. Additionally, additionally, all equations were formatted to denote the origin of terms. Future documentation will likely focus on providing additional detail on FRAM procedures, as well as adding a significant amount of content to the documentation of the current Chinook base period. This project was a joint effort between the Salmon Model Analytical Work Group and new members. And that concludes my statement. Thank you, Angelica. Questions on the new report? Bill Anderson. Thanks, Angelica or Ms. Hogenbro. Um, on the first topic, the technical review of the updates to the FRAM um, in their in the, in their uh, model evaluation work groups review, did you um, do you have an an opinion? Is this was this an improvement? Um, these these four changes were they, were these in, in from your pers or from the model evaluation worker perspective were these improvements? Most definitely, uh, we've um, covered um, most of the topics uh, that we expanded on were already uh, on the online uh, online site, but we just added more equations and we really got into the weeds for somebody who wants to understand the model very well. They are now able to follow the equations in detail. And we also followed up on an item that the um, uh, statistical uh, and scientific uh, committee requested so that they're able when they're looking at an equation to be, uh, determine whether the source is uh, something that's FRAM calculated or whether it's, it's, it's an input. So we've formatted the equation. Um, so I think both were a definite improvement to the existing documentation. Thanks, Angelica, and good to hear your voice. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Angelica. You're All right, we have um, numerous uh, STT reports. I think we start off with Mike O'Farrell, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, Council Members. I'll be referring to agenda item D2A, Supplemental STT Report 1, uh, STT Report on Methodology Review. Salmon Technical Team, the Chair of the Model Evaluation Workgroup and the Scientific and Statistical Committee, Salmon Subcommittee, met remotely on October 12th and 13th of 2022 to discuss the following Salmon Methodology Review topics. Number one, technical review of the updates associated with round 7.1.1 of the fishery regulation assessment model, base period as they relate to modeled abundances of Chinook salmon stocks and determining the Southern resident killer whale Chinook salmon abundance threshold. Number two, technical review of updates to the Chinook salmon ocean distribution models that derive from two publications, Shelton and all 2019 and 2021 and are used to apportion the modeled abundance of Chinook salmon stocks among ocean regions. Number three, progress report on any new and updated information available for the documentation of technical details of FRAM. Four, discussion of whether the Sacramento index forecast should be expressed as a mean or median. And five, review of the basis behind the Sacramento River Fall Chinook conservation objective. I'll now provide a little, uh, our, the results of that um, review from the STT's perspective. The first topic, technical review of the updates associated with round 7.1.1 of the FRAM base period. Mr. John Carey uh, provided a summary of FRAM base period round 7.1.1 updates that could potentially impact the Fishery Management Council's uh, salmon abundance threshold for southern resident killer whales. The focus this focus on four categories of changes that are expected to account for the majority of effects to stock specific starting cohort sizes. One, updated coat of wire tag recovery information. Two, accounting for interdam loss for Columbia River stocks that originate upstream of Bonneville Dam. Three, updated terminal run sizes. And four, updated catches in Canadian sport fisheries. Round 7.1.1 was used in the planning of 2022 fisheries and will be used for fishery planning for the foreseeable future. After reviewing these changes, the STT finds that FRAM base period round 711 represents an improvement over the previous base period, which is round 6.2. Next topic, technical review of the updates to Chinook salmon ocean distribution models. Dr. Ollie Shelton uh, provided an overview of two models, a 20, Shelton et al. 2019 and Shelton et al. 2021 that can be used to estimate stock specific spatial distributions of fall Chinook salmon for use in setting a north of Falcon fisheries threshold for Southern resident killer whale. The Shelton et al 2021 model features several improvements to the Shelton et al 2020, 2019 model, including the incorporation of additional more contemporary coda wire tag recovery data, improved stratification of Chinook stocks and new information for Hague fisheries. Furthermore, a, a sea surface temperature covariate was added to the model. The addition of the sea surface temperature information allows for year specific estimates of stock distributions that depend on sea surface temperature patterns. And considering these updates, the STT finds that the 2021 configuration of the Shelton et al. Ocean distribution model represents an overall improvement compared to the 2019 conversion co configuration of the model. Should the council decide to move forward using the 2021 configuration of the model, the ST recommends using long-term average stock specific distribution parameters. While there may be value in using distributions that vary annually based on sea surface temperature, further investigation would be required before Im implementation is considered. While reviewing the improved stock status stratification in the Shelton et al 2021 co configuration of the ocean distribution model, the STT also considered the FRAM slash Selton Shelton et al. model stock crosswalks as provided in Table 5.1 of the ad hoc SRKW workgroups risk assessment. For future assessments, the STT recommends one correction, specifically mapping the Lower Columbia River wild FRAM stock to the upcall or herb stock in the Shelton et al. 2019 and 2021 model configurations, respectively. This FRAM stock represents the Lewis River wild stock, which is a bright stock that exhibits ocean distribution patterns more similar to upriver brights than to lower Columbia River tules. Next topic, progress report on the documentation of FRAM technical details. Ms. Angelica Hagenbro uh, provided an update 
overview of updates to documentation of FRAM. The STT appreciates the work on this comprehensive documentation of FRAM and notes that substantial progress has been made on this task in recent years. Next topic, uh, use of mean versus median for the Sacramento index forecast. Dr. Will Satterthwaite provided an assessment of whether the Sacramento index forecast should be expressed as the mean, which is the status quo, or the median. Results of the analysis suggest that the forecast accuracy would have been improved if the SI were expressed as the median rather than the mean. The STT appreciates the work that went into this analysis and is supportive of expressing the Sacramento index forecast as the median beginning in 2023. Last topic, review of the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective. Dr. Will Satterthwaite uh, provided a detailed review of the origins of the current Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective. The conservation objective was established in the 1980s using data from the 1950s through the 1980s. The review found that the objective was difficult to reproduce using historical documents and available data. The council has frequently discussed formation of a working group to address updating the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective with more contemporary data and methods during its workload planning agendas. Given the conservation concerns and importance of the stock to salmon fisheries south of Cape Falcon, the STT supports elevating and prioritizing this work toward developing a new conservation objective for SRFC. And that concludes the STT statement. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Questions uh, on the STT report one? Okay, I'm not seeing any. And next up will be the um, STT report two, and I believe uh, Mr. John Kerry is going to do that for us online. John? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Excellent. All right. Uh, thanks. My name is John Kerry, and I'm going to be reading from agenda item D2A, supplemental STT report two, salmon technical team report on potential southern resident killer whale Chinook salmon abundance threshold updates. During the September 2022 meeting, the Pacific Fishery Management Council identified a list of five topics to be reviewed by the Salmon Technical Team and the Scientific and Statistical, Statistical Committee Salmon Subcommittee at this year's Salmon Methodology Review meeting. Included in this list were technical reviews of recent updates to the Fishery Regulation Assessment Model and Shelton et al. Ocean Distribution Models. Output from these two models are used to estimate pre-fishing adult Chinook salmon abundances in the north of Falcon region, which inform the Chinook salmon abundance threshold that was implemented in, in, in Amendment 21 of the FMP. Pending the outcome of these reviews, the Council may wish to consider updating or adopting an updated value for the threshold. In the event that this occurs, the STT provides the following options to aid the Council in determining the appropriate numerical value of the threshold. The SDT does not recommend moving forward with a recalculation of the threshold that does not incorporate the update, update to frame round 711, as this is the version of the model that's currently being implemented during the preseason planning process. The SDT notes that there is some ambiguity in the FMP language as to whether the recalculated threshold should be based on the seven years specified in the FMP or the seven years with the lowest abundance. In recalculating the threshold values for this report, the STT used the seven years specified in the FMP language as they were specifically linked to Southern resident killer whale status as described in agenda item D2A, supplemental NIMPS presentation one. Should the council decide instead to use the seven years of lowest abundance, this would only affect the option below that incorporates both the FRAM and the Shelton et al updates and the threshold value could be recalculated as needed. Also, with the exception of those under the status quo option, the abundances presented below incorporate the stock crosswalk correction recommended by the STT with regard to the appropriate ocean distribution parameters for apportioning the abundance of low, the lower Columbia River wild fram stock. So the status quo abundances in the table below reflect those originally produced by the ad hoc SRKW workgroup. They are derived using output from FRAM round 6.2 and the configuration of the ocean distribution model described in Shelton et al. 2019. The lower Columbia River, River wild FRAM stock was apportioned into regional abundances using the lower Columbia Shelton et al. stock. The existing threshold value is 966,000. 
The abundance is presented under the FRAM only update option. We're derived using output from FRAM round 711 and the configuration of the ocean distribution model described in Shelton et al. 2019. The Lower Columbia River wild FRAM stock was apportioned into regional abundances using the Upper Columbia Shelton stock. Updating to the use of FRAM round 711 abundances results in an overall small increase to the October 1 estimates of adult Chinook salmon abundance in the north of Falcon region. Under this option, the recalculated threshold value is 992,000. And lastly, uh, the abundance is presented under the FRAM and Shelton et al. update option were derived using output from FRAM round 711 and the long-term average stock-specific distribution parameters from the configuration of the ocean distribution model described in Shelton et al. 2021. The Lower Columbia River wild FRAM stock was apportioned into regional abundances using the upriver bright Shelton et al. stock. Updating to the use of distributions from the Shelton et al. 2021, 2021 model results in a considerable decrease to the October 1 estimates of adult Chinook salmon abundance in the north of Falcon region. This is primarily a function of modifications to the distributions for Upper Columbia River stocks between the 2019 and 2021 iterations of the model, where a single Upper Columbia stock was split into separate Upriver Bright and Snake River Fall components. While the total number of fish estimated to be in the ocean is not changing, the 2021 version of the model apportions a much larger portion of the upriver bright stock into northern regions as opposed to the north of Falcon region, which aligns better with the understood distribution of this stock. Under this option, the recalculated threshold value is 623,000. And then below you have a table that contains the annual estimates of abundance in the north of Falcon region for each of the three options just described. The shaded rows indicate the years that were averaged to calculate the thresholds. And that concludes our statement. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, questions for John on the uh, STT report two. Danny Evanson, Danny. Yes, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Mr. Carey, for that report. Hopefully, I'm asking the question to the right person. I have two. Um, the first one is, um, as you've done these updates um, from Shelton 2019 to 2021, you have a lot more coded wire tags, a lot more years. Uh, is that... Are, are the distributions allowed to vary every year or are you using an average? I think I've read in one of the reports uh, that sea surface temperature got added into the model. So I'm wondering how you would be forecast, if you're gonna be forecasting distribution on an annual basis, since we all know that changes. Thanks, Ms. Evanson. I appreciate the question. And if I, if I understand it correctly, uh, my understanding of the, the work for, with the Shelton et al. models is that the 2019 version of that um, provided just a single um, distribution parameter for each stock that was assumed to be static across years. Um, but with the move to the 2021 version of the model, you're right, there was a, a sea surface temperature covariate added that did allow for um, estimation of annually specific distribution parameters, or at least it allowed the distributions to vary within year, or between years. Um, for the purposes of the analyses done here, We've recommended using the long-term averages from that work as opposed to the annually varying averages. However, um, there may be value in considering using the annual, annually varying distributions, but we're, we're not at a point yet to be able to recommend that use as there might be some additional work needed to implement that. Um, and in addition, we would need to think about how to use or what distributions to use for the preseason process where we'd have to either forecast sea surface temperature or use an average in that situation as well. So I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, if I may ask one more. Um, I, I note in um, uh, the, uh, I think it's attachment D to attachment one um 
that there's uh, a number of Canadian stocks in the mix and we're now forecasting a northern area. And um, the report described how we got those estimates. I'm wondering moving forward, is this something that comes from published uh, Pacific Salmon Commission, Chinook Technical Committee, uh, reports if these are the the data we would use moving forward or if that's something that requires some level of bilateral cooperation and coordination with uh, Canada. Uh, thanks again for the question, Ms. Evans. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out which report you're referencing. Is it the, the methodology review um, reports and maybe table one in that first piece of it? Correct. Table one, uh, page five of 101 in the methodology review materials. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are those are stocks that are contained within FRAM. So the process here basically takes the um, total ocean abundance estimates derived using the FRAM postseason model runs, um, and those are the stocks that the model contains. So I hope that helps. Thank you for that. Thank you, Danny. Further questions for the uh, STT report too? Oh, Galatix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Mr. Carey, for the presentation. Um, wanted to confirm I'm thinking about this right. The report noted the ambiguity in the seven years in the FMP language and that there'd be a slight change to the seven years if you use the, the lowest seven abundances instead of the specific years mentioned in the FMP. If, if I think through what the implications are for calculating the threshold as presented, um, sticking to the seven years specifically identified in the FMP now results in a, a number that's slightly higher and therefore slightly more conservative than what we would get if we shifted and used the the new seven lowest years based on these updated abundances. Is that right? Thanks, Mr. Addix, for the question. Um, I believe just, just based on the way the math would work there. Um, yes. So if you were to, if there were to be a difference between the lowest seven and those seven years, um, the lowest seven number calculated threshold would be lower than uh, the threshold calculated using the static seven years. Thanks for that. Yep. Thanks, Kyle. Anyone else? Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Carey, for the presentation and uh, all your great explanations as the fire questions at you. Um, I, I do have just one, um, some, not really a question, a clarification. Um, so in the in the document we were just talking about the uh, STT report number two, just the paragraph just above the table uh, indicates that um, the uh, the recommendation of the STT with regard to the upper upriver bright stock. There's a phrase that says which aligns better with the understood distribution of this stock. Could you just explain that a little bit more? Sure. Thanks, Ms. Bishop. Um, I guess what was intended there is that the, the move, move from the 2019 version um, of the model with the distribution parameters for the upper Columbia stock versus the distribution parameters in the 2021 model for the upriver bright stock, um, the, the, the differences there seem to align better with the distribution that we would expect for that stock given other assessments that are out there. For example, um, coded wire tag exploitation rate analyses for that stock that are conducted through the Pacific Salmon Commission process. Um, the stock is a, definitely a much far, a very far north migrating stock. It primarily gets caught in fisheries uh, in northern areas, but um, the 2019 version of the ocean distribution model was apportioning um, a, a much higher proportion into the more southern um, north of Falcon and other regions in that area. Um, so just trying to indicate here that the, the, the change between the two models is intuitive and it makes sense given what we would expect. Hope that helps. Okay. Thanks, Susan. All right. Any more questions for uh, John? Not see any. Thank you, John. Um, next up is uh, Dr. O'Farrell. One more time. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Council Members. I'll be referring <clears throat> to agenda item D2A, STT report on investigation of effort forecasts produced for areas south of the Cape Falcon using the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model. Uh, I'm not gonna read this entire report. It's quite long or relatively long for this setting at least. And uh, it, the, the council has seen much of this before. Um, there's, it was a draft or a statement was presented on it in June of this year and uh, a, a report that was um, that this report has changed very little since the uh, report pr provided in September. I will go over some of the changes that have been made since September um, that will be um, of interest to the council, I think. Um, so let's see, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit here. Um, the very the first parts of the report are the same. I'll just highlight that um, the work here was um, looking at different ranges of data used to forecast fishing effort. We um, had three ranges identified, the status quo range of uh, 1998 through um, the year um, just prior to the management year. The second range was 2011 through management year minus one. And the third range was 2015 through the man management year minus one. Um, and we looked at, um, to evaluate these different uh, ranges, we, uh, evaluated performance by, um, calculate, we're doing like a one step ahead cross validation approach where we would forecast fishing effort in one year and we, um, in the past, and we would compare it to the postseason effort, um, in that year. And then we uh, calculated, uh, had a few performance measures, a couple of performance measures to, evaluate um, how they improved or made the event, uh, the effort forecasts uh, worse. And the results are in here. They have not changed since um, the September um, report. Um, in the September report, the STT had a preliminary recommendation. That preliminary recommendation is now our, um, our final recommendation on this. And you can find this on page 12 of our report. I'll just read it. Um, for effort forecasting in commercial and recreational fisheries, employ a 2015 forward data range for all management areas except for San Francisco and Monterey, for which the data range would remain the status quo of 1998 forward. And we then, the new content in this report um, is just following the STT recommendation. Table two shows the projected effort in the commercial fishery for the status quo data range, which is on the left-hand side of this table, and the STT recommended data ranges in the middle, and then the difference between the recommended and the status quo range on the right-hand side of that table. And what we can see here is that um, under most in most month area fishery um, combinations um, for or month area combinations for the commercial fishery, um, there was a decrease in um, uh, effort um, by implementing the STT recommendation, except for San Francisco and Monterey, which remain equivalent because the STT recommendation in that case was the status quo of 1998 forward. Table three provides the same information for the recreational fishery and the same general result here. Uh, overall, a decrease in fishing effort under the STT recommendation, with the exception of San Francisco and Monterey that would be identical to the status quo. Finally, on table four, um, we provide projected harvest and exploitation rates under the status quo and the STT recommended effort forecasting data range scenario, giving the 2022 fishery structure. So these are um, projections that we made during the preseason process earlier this year. Um, and we did it with um, our status quo weight of uh, or year range for making effort forecasts and the STT recommended range um, from this report. And for the Klamath H4 ocean harvest rate and the Sacramento River um, Fall Chinook ocean harvest rate, um, using the STT recommended um, data range re uh, resulted in a reduced um, exploitation rate and harvest rate for those two stocks. For Sacramento River winter Chinook, there's no difference between the two alternatives. 
um, because Sacramento River Fall Chinook are the model that only um, goes uh, only applies to the San Francisco and Monterey management areas where there's no change um, recommended. And um, for Lower Columbia River Thule exploitation rate, um, that uh, would that decreases slightly from 38 percent to 37.5 percent under the recommended data ranges. So that, that's my overview of um, the STT report. Um, I'd be happy to address questions if there are any. All right. Thanks, Mike, for that. Questions on the STT report three? Marcy Urimko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, appreciate the report. I want to make sure that I am understanding the takeaway conclusions that you've now um, reached at the end. Um, if I'm looking at the STT recommendation compared to the status quo um, <clears throat> for most of these stocks, um, the effort <clears throat> and exploitation rate um, will be lower um, making the adjustments that are recommended here um, on the whole. And, and I think that's because the projections for NOCO and Fort Bragg um, turned out to be higher than um, what comes out of the using the updated base period. Let me just stop there. Do I have that part right? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Remco. I, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I, I would say that uh, maybe to try to clarify, if we compare the status quo data range to the STT recommended data ranges, uh, the result, if we use the STT recommendation, is a reduction in effort in most, in almost all areas, well, is, is essentially a reduction in effort in Fort Bragg, um, NO, and CO. And as a result, um, we have lower projected exploitation rates coming from that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. As I recall, um, the KOHM has had <laughs> difficulty um, projecting and in fact has under projected substantially. Um, so I'm just trying to reconcile the recommendation that actually will lower projections with the, the outcomes that we've seen the past three, four years. Yes, yeah, so what you say is true. Um, and I will just say that there's uh, there are many components to the KOHM. Um, effort forecasting is one of them. Um, but another large component of that is the encounter rate or contact rate per unit of effort. Um, and, and so we have been severely under forecasting that uh, as we've chronicled in preseason reports and appendices therein. Um, and we've been changing data ranges to try to address that as well. And so um, what our recommendation in this report is based on is not um, how, how it's, uh, how the resulting changes to projections of exploitation rates and so forth. It's just whether or not our, um, if we use different data ranges, would that result in more accurate effort forecasts? And, um, and based on our analysis, um, these data ranges to, um, would reduce error, or at least in looking at past years where we could make forecasting compared to postseason estimates, would uh, reduce the amount of error in our, for, in our effort forecasts. Thank you, Mr. Rice Chair. Um, one more and a little different um, train of thought. Looking at the uh, recommended base periods um, for uh, NOCO, Fort Bragg, the changes, the shortened base periods that you're now recommending, 
um, versus the status quo base periods for Monterey and San Francisco, which are much longer time periods. I'm thinking about the incorporation of the 2022 data and that new information on um, the outputs when we get to the preseason process. I, I would expect then that the 2022 data would have a substantially greater influence on those cells where the shorter base period is used and much less of an influence in San Francisco and Monterey where the much longer base period is used. Is that correct? Yes, that, that would be correct. So if I may, I, I guess I'm um, just looking to reconcile um, or, or, or just ask a little more about the thought process in light of recent overages in the outputs, particularly for uh, San Francisco and Monterey cells. Um, and, and if you thought about that and um, how you factored that into the recommendations. You know, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, yeah, Mr. Chair Remco. Um, the recommendations um, are solely based on our, the analysis of effort performance um, and looking at these different range, ranges and see how it would perform and it would compare it to postseason estimates. Um, we weren't doing this um, with a, an eye on trying to, we're just trying to improve this one submodel within the KOHM and not necessarily trying to achieve a specific um, outcome in the KOHM. We're addressing that in other ways where we've seen, seen issues. With regard to the 20 uh, or the 1998 forward state of range being uh, recommended to be continued in use uh, for San Francisco and Monterey, um, 1998 was a while ago when it comes to um, commercial salmon fisheries in California. There was much more uh, there was a larger fleet. There was more effort per day open um, in those years. We've had high levels of effort very recently in California that even despite the smaller fleet is also, um, um, but is comparable to those um, effort projections from back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And um, I, I would surmise that that is why um, Maintaining that longer data range, reaching further back, um, would that would result in uh, what? How should I say this? Um, the data, the the effort, effort effort output that we're seeing from the fleet right now is similar to what it was back in those early days, and that's why the performance in our analysis um, suggested that we should keep that longer data range. Thank you, Mr. Reister. Thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. That clears it up. Much appreciated. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Further questions for, uh, for Mike? All right. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Next up will be SSC report and uh, Dr. Holland. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'm Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC, and um, I've also uh, brought uh, Will, Dr. Will Satterthwaite along with me uh, to help uh, in case there are some technical questions uh, that uh, I'm unable to answer. <clears throat> Um, I would like to uh, read into the record agenda item D2A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, November 2022, uh, SSC Committee Report on Final Methodology Review. The Scientific and Statistical Committee received a report summarizing reviews of salmon topics conducted by the SSC Salmon Subcommittee, SSC SS, 
via webinar October 12th and 13th, 2022, which are appended below to this, this report. The SSC received summaries concerning five topics. I'll note that these are in a different order than, uh, than was in the situation summary. Um, Sacramento index forecast calculations, That's number one. Number two, Sacramento River Fall Chinook conservation objective. Number three, FRAM technical detail documentation. Number four, review fishery regulation assessment model round 7.11. And number five, review updates to Chinook salmon ocean distribution models. The first of these Sacramento index forecast calculations, the SSC SS received presentations from Dr. Will Satterthwaite, Southwest Fishery Science Center, on the use of means versus medians and converting Sacramento index forecasts from logarithmic to arithmetic scale and reviewed a document by the same name. The Sacramento Index, SI, is an index of the ocean abundance of adult age three and older Sacramento River Fall Chinook, SRFC salmon. Each year, a preseason forecast of the SI is generated using a log scale regression of the previous year's return of jacks, age two, and is used to set harvest limits for the fishing season. Current management uses the predicted mean from the forecasted log normal distribution. Using the median value of the forecast log normal distribution will always produce a smaller forecast than the mean forecast. However, the use of the median forecast should provide equal likelihood of over and under forecasting. The SSC recommends that the preseason SI forecast use the median value when converting from logarithmic to arithmetic scale to improve forecast accuracy beginning in 2023. Use of the median forecast should not preclude the investigation of alternative analyses and measures of forecast accuracy. <laughs> Item number two, Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective. The SSC reviewed the basis for the current SRFC conservation objective by examining the literature cited within the salmon FMP. The SSC identified several places where the language and numbers of the salmon FMP could, be re could not be recre recreated from the cited source material, such as the mean escapements reported from 1953 to 1960. The SSC supports the specific language app appended to the end of this report to make the FMP consistent with this source material. The SSC recommends a comprehensive review as specified in section 3.2.2 of the FMP of the current SRFC conservation objective based on three main concerns. First concern, the conservation objective applies to both natural and hatchery spawners and reflects hatchery goals at the time of implementation. Assumptions about the lack of distinction between natural and hatchery fish in the Sacramento River may need revisiting <clears throat> based on recent tagging and genetic studies. The conservation objectives for many other stocks, including Klamath River Fall Chinook, were established for natural spawners. The current proxy for MSY is derived from the SRFC runs observed during a few years. The use of selected years of historical data to define MS and a MSY proxy is not compelling without additional scientific justification. And three, there have been changes to habitat, climate, and other factors since the 1950s when some of the data used to calculate the MSY proxy were gathered and 1984 when the current conservation objective was adopted. The lower bound of the conservation objective, 122,000 adults, and an interim goal until, was an interim goal until fish, pa fish passage problems with the Red Bluff Diversion Dam were rectified. The gates of the dam have been fully opened since 2011. The SRFC conservation objective should be assessed with newer data that captures the current conditions. There are several reference points and conservation objectives for other stocks that could be similarly reviewed, some of which are similarly dated, CFMP Table 3-1. The SSC reiterates its recommendation from October 2021 that a process be established to periodically review and if needed update reference points and conservation objectives for all salmon stocks in the FMP. The third item reviewed, FRAM technical detail documentation. The SSC appreciates the work done by the analyst to update and expand the online fishery regulation assessment model FRAM documentation. The online FRAM's user manual and overview are well-organized and do not require further review. 
the SSC recommends that documentation of existing methodologies be completed as soon as possible and updated regularly. The future reviews of to FRAM algorithms or portions of FRAM that have not been previously reviewed, for example, the backward FRAM, will require completed documentation of all the underlying concepts and algorithms. The last two items uh, I'll speak about together, review fishery regulation assessment models 7.11 and review of updates to Chinook salmon ocean distribution models. The SSC reviewed two short summary documents informing Southern resident killer whale, as RKW, management measures, section 6.6.8 of the FMP. Uh, these were Chinook salmon abundance fram version 6.2 versus 7.1.1 and ocean distribution, the Shelton et al. 2019 versus the 2021. The SSC appreciated the updates on both topics. The description of data changes to FRAM are reasonable. And since round 7.1.1 is used for preseason planning purposes, using the same FRAM based period for the SRKW threshold about calculations would provide consistency with its use in other areas of Chinook management. Shelton et al. 2021 uses 20 more years of data and provides estimated distributions for more stocks than Shelton et al. 2019. The SSC did not review how the two model components were combined to produce area specific abundances. The FMP states uh, in section 6.6.8 that the determination of Chinook abundance threshold is based on the on the best scientific information available, BSIA. However, it is the SSC's understanding that the adoption of the Chinook abundance threshold was a council policy decision. The SSC has never fully reviewed the information contributing to the SRKW thresholds, nor identified the inputs as BSIA for use in determining the Ch Chinook salmon abundance threshold. The SSC did review the risk analysis from the ad hoc SRKW workgroup, which used FRAM estimates of abundance combined with Shelton 2019 distributions as components back in November 2019. At that time, the SSC found the data sets used and the, and the analysis performed to be reasonable and appropriate for the questions at hand, where the questions at hand were examining relationships between indices of abundance and SRKW life history and body condition parameters. The SSC did not review area specific abundances for the purposes of management. Thus the SSC requests clarification from the council about what scientific information requires a BSIA determination. The SSC recommends that the, the analysis that motivates and produces a Chinook salmon abundance threshold be compiled into a single document for transparency. Currently, the analyses contributing to the SRKW threshold are spread across STT and SRKW ad hoc working group documents produced over a number of years. The SSC suggests clarifying section 6.6.8 of the FMP, for example, after updating the abundance and distribution parameters, the seven lowest years of Chinook salmon abundance in the north of Falcon area may not be the specific years listed in the FMP should the calculated abundance be derived from the years listed or the seven lowest abundances. Some additional remarks. The SSC identified language in additional places within the FMP that does not conform to current management practices. For example, salmon fisheries in California are not managed with the goal of maximizing natural production, contrary to page 51 of the FMP. And some ESA listed evolutionary significant units, ESUs, have gone more than five years without stock specific management for at least one stock in each ESU, contrary to page 39. The SSC is willing to work with the salmon technical team to identify areas within the FMP that do not accurately characterize current management practices and recommended updates. This concludes the SSC statement and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks Dan. Questions on the SSC report? Marcy Ripko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you uh, to both of you for coming forward and bringing us this report. Um, I have to say, I'm, <laughs> I'm still trying to take this in. That the SSC is recommending um, what sounds like um, language amendments to the FMP in an appendix 
as well as a suggestion that we do, uh, it sounds like some housekeeping um, elsewhere in the FMP where language doesn't conform to current management practices. And I guess I'm just um, wondering what discussion took place with um, council staff about the appropriate time and place to make such amendments. The, I think that these these suggestions come out of the ambiguity that's that's you know in that in in, in the first place the ambiguity that that was in uh, S SKRW but there are other places when there was when information was reviewed for example for the um, for the conservation objective in particular um, and the the analysis that was done and reviewed um, uh, in in the uh, uh, review that the SDT and, and SSC did um, found that there were factual differences um, between uh, um, what, you know, what was in the FMP and what's actually done. Uh, in the, in, so they're pointing those out, suggesting that those be, and, and su making suggestions of how that language could be made more accurate. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, I, I recognize um, that you're make you're identifying um, how we make corrections um, and what uh, language improvements we might make. But I'm just thinking about procedurally how we handle um, this advice from the SSC, and if you had discussions uh, with staff officers about. Um, what agenda item we might take that up in the future or how 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 to accomplish um, the recommendations that you've put forward no here. we have not had any 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 discussions about how to do that procedurally um, we did know we do note in the in, in those additional comments that there may be also other places in the FMP that should probably be re reviewed where there are other inaccuracies inaccuracies and that we would um, the SSC would be happy to work with the SDT to try and identify those. So, um, but we have not talked about a, a, a procedure or a timing to, to address changes. Just pointing out language that. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks to the SSC for their report. Um, I hope this isn't a stupid question, but uh, here goes anyway. Um, so I'm in the section dealing with the uh, PRAM and the, and the updates to the Chinook Salmon Ocean Distribution Model um, on page three, the top paragraph, near the bottom of that paragraph. It, Talks about it says the SSC did not review the area specific abundances for the purposes of management, and then there's a reference. And my question did not review the area specific abundances for the purposes of management is confusing to me. Management of what? Management of salmon fisheries, management, and maybe it, I would get that would be clarified if I went to this link, but. Uh, okay, thank you for the question, um, Mr. Anderson, and Vice Chair. Uh, I think what we mean here is that uh, that what the review that was done was done purely for a risk analysis, um, as opposed to reviewing how that information might be used in any kind of management measure. All right. Thank At you. like a threshold, for example. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Danny Evanson? Yeah, as a follow-up to this, and I'm not sure that I'm even asking the right person, but that same statement, at the time the SSC found the data sets used and the analyses performed to be reasonable and appropriate for the questions at hand, in quotes, where the questions at hand were examining relationships between indices of abundance and SRKW life history and body condition parameters. And as I recall, there were three of those 
that the ad hoc work group looked at, and I guess the C SSC did as well. And I'm wondering if anyone reran those analyses, and now that these we're working with these updates and evaluating them, how, how do they perform for uh, the three killer rail metrics? Has the SSC looked at that? Um, I'll, Will may be uh, better to, able to answer that. Thank you for the question. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. Yeah, so first of all, so the SSC has not looked at any of the killer whale analyses again at any time other than you know, the November 2019 review. Um, speaking also as a member of the SRKW work group and you know, one of the analysts for that, we, at least I have not been involved in rerunning the analyses with the updated abundances. Uh, did raise the question of, you know, should we be doing that with Eric Ward, who was another one of the analysts? Um, and we have not done it. I mean, there is some concern about um, simply rerunning tests again and again and again with slightly different inputs makes it hard to interpret your statistical significance that comes out of that. So we've been sort of reluctant to rerun analyses repeatedly sort of absent a very sort of either specific request or sort of a very strong motivating reason to think there's a need to do the analysis again. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Uh, uh, for the uh, response, I, um, or Dr. Sather, um, I uh, appreciate that. It's one of those things if we're going to be deciding on a new threshold, it's nice to know the relationship that it's actually going to be supporting. Uh, Southern resident killer whales. So appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Further questions for the SSC? Quick. This is Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. He's a cloaking device on. That's why I couldn't see that. <laughs> it must um, have been. And I would, uh, I also echo my appreciation to the SSC for all of the work um, that they've done on these on these various topics. Um, they're complicated and obviously a lot of work went into the, the report it's, that's uh, not reflected in the report, a lot more under it. Um, I did have a question on, I believe it's page three of your re report, where you say that SSC recommends that the analyses that motivate and produce the Chinook salmon abundance threshold be compiled into a single document for transparency. And I was just curious, um, my understanding is that the document that was provided to the council, I believe in um, maybe, I don't know if we call it, if it was September or November of 2020, that had all of the alternatives described um, with regard to the threshold, as well as the other management measures that the council was considering at the time in, in shaping its um, action, went into fairly significant detail um, about the thresholds and their derivations and where that information came from. So I was just curious if the SSC had seen that document or um, had was considering that in making its, its statement, and if not, would refer you to that document. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Bishop, uh, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I do not believe the the uh, SSC has reviewed that document. Um, I can't say whether some people have seen it. I have not re have not reviewed it. Um, as yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, so certainly I'm aware of that other document, but it was never presented to the SSC. And I think, you know, the sort of the statement mentions the sort of value just for transparency sake of putting the different parts of the, of the, you know, sort of greater decision making in one place so that somebody coming into the process can see it. Or, you know, like as you mentioned there, you know, there are analyses and, you know, arguments presented in that later document. There are a lot of other relevant information in the original risk assessment um, and this was just, you know, in the interest of transparency, how does somebody new to the process know to look at this report and this other report and maybe some other places too? So just sort of a central clearinghouse that says, here's sort of all of the reasoning that went into coming up with this. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Southerweight, for the response. Um, I would just um, suggest that if you have some time, you might want to look at that environmental assessment. Um, it did uh, it did uh, pull all of that information together um, and uh, explain the rationale for the various alternatives um, that the council used in making its its final decision. So I would just like to let you know that that document I believe exists. Um, let the SSC know that that document exists um, in response to a request in your statement. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I have a question about the first part, page one, the Sacramento Index for tech Forecast Calculations. Um, the last sentence in that paragraph says, use of the median forecast should not preclude the investigation of alternative analysis and uh, measures of forecast accuracy. Um, that read to me as a little bit ominous and a little bit confusing. So um, do, does the SSC have alternative al analysis and measures of forecast accuracy in mind? Is there something else in play that I just might be ignorant of? Um, was just curious if there was any additional discussion of that or suggestions that the SSC has for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Ridings. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, um, I don't believe it. If you'll let me, give me one second, please. I mean, the SSC did not specifically discuss yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. We, there was no specific discussions of any, of anything particular analysis. Um, it's just be, yes, be, leaving the door open for for uh, improvements in future, but nothing specific in mind. Thank you, Corey. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. That will take us to the SSC report or SAS report, I mean, and uh, Richard Deep, who I believe is online. Richard. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is Robin Ilkey. I don't think we have Richard Heap on the line, but I'm more than happy to read the SAS report for them. Oh, please. Thank you. So this is supplemental SAS report one under agenda item D2A. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel was briefed on the final methodology review by Dr. Michael Farrell at their November 2nd meeting, and the SAS is very appreciative of the work being done to update and improve the models and forecasting methodology. Of particular interest to the SAS, the review of the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective, the SAS SAS statement. Um, I'll also just add a little bit, the SSC statement wasn't quite out yet uh, when the SS when the SAS was meeting. So they refer particularly just to the STT report. That's what they had in hand. Um, so other than that side note, that concludes their statement. Okay, thank you, Robin, for that for clarification. So very good. Well, that concludes our reports. It takes us to public comment and I did not see any 10, 15 minutes ago. Get clarification on that from uh, the tower. Okay, very good. That takes us to council action. So with that, um, I'll open the floor up for discussion. Kyle Addix, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll just start by saying thanks to the STT and SSC, as well as the MU, for their work on salmon methodology review this year. I expect the council discussion to wander a bit given the diversity of topics in the review, but I'll try to hit briefly on my thoughts on some of the tele topics most relevant to North of Falcon. On the FRAM documentation, thanks to the salmon, salmon model analytical work group referenced, referenced by Ms. Hagenbro in the MU report for their work that's continued to ad advance the model documentation. They've made great progress in recent years and I expect that progress will continue into the future. I know that the council, the STT, and the SCC are all appreciative of their efforts and those improvements. 
The investigation of effort forecasts produced by the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model was not a formal methodology review topic, but was of high interest north of Falcon due to the impact of some of the south of Falcon fisheries on lower Columbia Thule Chinook and the direct crosswalk between effort forecasts from the KOHM and FRAM and the potential to overestimate Thule exploitation rates if effort is overestimated. I appreciate the work that's been done in evaluating effort projections and support the recommendations in STT Report 3 for using more contemporary sets of years for fisheries where it is appropriate. The technical reviews of the latest FRAM update and the newer Chinook Salmon Ocean distribution model were tasks that traditionally would not have been assigned through methodology review. I believe the council thought it made sense based on the FMP language to have the updates reviewed through the methodology review pro process to confirm that they were appropriate advancements of modeling relative to the Southern resident killer whale management threshold that was previ previously adopted by the council and incorporated into the FMP. I understand there was confusion and or misunderstanding about the intended scope of the review when the council adopted those topics for method methodology review, given that they normally would not trigger methodology review under council operating procedures. That said, we heard that both the STT and SSC think that the new FRAM version is appropriate for use and would provide consistency with its use in other areas of Chinook management. The STT endorsed the use of the newer 2021 version of the Chinook Salmon Ocean Distribution or Shelton model. The SSC acknowledged that the newer version of that model used 20 more years of data and provided distributions for more stocks than the previous version. Given that the 2021 version was published as a peer reviewed paper that built on the earlier 2019 work, I have no doubt that it is the best information to use for establishing an updated Southern resident killer whale threshold. And I plan to support moving forward with an updated threshold that incorporates the updated Fram and Shelton models. I made a pushback in September to ask the STT to calculate and bring forward the updated abundance threshold for this meeting. They've done so, and I think it makes sense for the council to take action on a new threshold now, as we know that the council will need to assess preseason abundance in 2023 relative to that threshold, the threshold that is in place. I believe there were some valid questions raised about the language in the FMP and the role of the SDT and SSC in future reviews of updated information that deserve some discussion. If not today, then prior to future assignments to the SDT and SSC related to this topic. One of the questions was about the range of years used to calculate the threshold. I do, do believe the intent was to continue to use the specific years referenced in the FMP due to the combination of Chinook abundance and SRKW population parameters represented by those years. This approach does result in a threshold that's slightly higher and slightly more conservative than a recalculation using the lowest seven years with the abundances from the updated models. Um, I think I'll, I'll wrap up there, but I'm interested to hear the thoughts of other council members on these topics. Thank you, Kyle. I see uh, Joe. Joe? You're muted, Joe. Yeah, Joe, your, uh, your mute's still on. There you go. Yeah, Joe, we're still not hearing you. Yeah, we're still not uh, getting anything here in this end, even though you're unmuted. Yeah, yeah, Joe, we'll, uh, we'll come back to you. So hopefully you can figure out what, what's happening there on your end. So with that, anyone else? Marcy? Please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. A um, couple of thoughts uh, relevant to um, the issues for South of Falcon. Uh, first, just want to speak to the um, SI forecast calculation and, and just um, thank um, the uh, methods review um, analysts for um, conducting this evaluation. Um, I think it is um, going to be an improvement using the median uh, that will provide equal likelihood of over and under forecasting. Um, so appreciate you taking a look at that. Um, moving to the Sacramento Fall uh, conservation objective, there have been a number of discussions on this topic uh, over the years, and um, that's recognized in the 
SSC report um, certainly agree um, that uh, it is it is time to um, do a little work in this area. It's uh, long overdue. Um, I appreciate the literature re review that was conducted to uh, attempt to kind of recreate the basis for the existing goal range and um, providing clarity here on uh, what did form the basis for that goal range and um, suggesting to us how we um, might want to amend um, the language describing the basis for the goal range in the existing uh, language of the FMP. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with the recommended language amendments and reconciling that with the SSC's recommendation for a comprehensive review of the comprehensive uh, of the conservation objective, which I think we've all talked about uh, as being a priority, just exactly when we take the work on is somewhat in question. So I think I'd, I'd, um, I'd want to weigh the value of amending the language in the FMP uh, against continuing to um, prioritize the, the actual scientific work to, um, to uh, perhaps revise the conservation objective um, to address the concerns that the SSC has identified um, in its report um, about the current objective. Um, so with that said, I, I certainly um, appreciate the recommendations, it's, it sounds like, from the SSC, uh, the STT, and the SAS that we prioritize the work um, of looking toward building uh, a revised conservation objective. Um, a lot has changed in the Central Valley, and um, it is certainly, <laughs> um, when you think back about the, the foundation of the goal range and that we've been using it um, without taking a new look um, at the science and the habitat conditions um, and the, the basis for the, the existing goal, I think um, on, on scientific grounds, there's no question that um, this work is overdue. Um, I think I struggle a little bit with the timing. Um, there are recommendations for a work group to take a look at this and get going. Um, there are some other recommendations for work of a work group uh, in California, particularly surrounding the Klamath and Klamath Dam removal. So that's another consideration as we think about staffing work groups and um, putting more on um, on the plate for Sam and staff that I know, um, at least in CDFW's case, uh, we are very much understaffed at the moment and working to build capacity in our new staff. So um, I'm just uh, thinking about how we plan this out. And, and that's a discussion for agenda planning, of course. But um, I do want to just, I think, echo the recommendations that are contained uh, in the reports we have in front of us to um, get um, get a plan going on how we um, begin to review um, and develop a new goal. Um, this first step, we were very deliberate in our direction to the STT and the SSC to just stick with the literature review and let's let's take that you know bite sized piece uh, this cycle and um, certainly can say job well done. Um, it certainly gives us a lot of food for further thought, um, and I just think we need to be deliberate about mapping out our, our next steps. Um, moving to uh, report three, the work on the KOHM, um, I want to thank uh, Dr. O'Farrell and the others that have added that item to the methodology review list without actually adding it to the methodology review list. Um, that guidance came from us, I believe, out of the April meeting, and I appreciate that you've worked on it all summer and um, brought us back kind of the, the culmination of that work. Um, I appreciate getting the, the final um, report back here in the methods review item, even though it's not a methods review item. Um, I think it certainly is appropriate to, to keep it in the 
umbrella of um, methods review content. So um, I support the recommendations of the STT that came out of it. I appreciate the interchange that we had up here uh, regarding the base periods um, and certainly understand uh, the basis for the recommendations and appreciate that um, you, you did as the council requested and, and took a hard look at it um, by region and how we um, move forward using the best base periods we can uh, on a regional basis. So um, just thank you for the work. Thank you, Marcy. Um, I see Joe still has his hands up. I did see his, um, his uh, chat that he provided comments later, but Joe, you wanna try one more time? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We got you. Great. Yeah, I'd like to provide some tribal comments on the, on the uh, Southern Resident Killer Well uh, items. And so I want to note that the uh, tribe support using the updated models for the threshold in the area of North of Falcon. Uh, the tribes, however, do not want this PFMC work to presuppose the collaborative efforts uh, in the Puget Sound. They are also supportive of updating the Amendment 21 uh, settlement FMA, FMP language. Uh, the updated FMP language should not just provide clarity uh, on whether it is the lowest seven years or the seven years specified that are updated based on model updates or improvements. The FMP, FMP update should provide a pathway for a broader review of the models as they are used to develop a threshold. Now that may include uh, addressing uh, the following questions. Do the years that the threshold is based on still make sense? Do the relationships with the model outputs and SRKW demographics still support the threshold? And lastly, are the model outputs and or threshold approach the best available scientific information? So thank you for allowing me to uh, provide uh, that comment. Okay, thank you, Joe. And your hand's still up, by the way. So, uh, okay, Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, uh, my council colleagues have, have largely stolen a lot of the talking points that I <laughs> planned to say, so it's good to know, it's always good to know you are on the same page with others. Um, I would support definitely, I mean, I, I would echo what Marcy said about the um, conservation objective for Sacramento Falls being at this table for, for quite a few years, and I think almost pretty much every year that I've been in that conversation, it has been noted as very important, given the importance of the stock um, and what's been happening in recent years. I would, uh, NIMS would very much support um, the uh, recommendations that have been put forward um, from the advisory bodies. Um, I would also say that that if we're successful in that endeavor, it is it is likely to better inform the FMP. So my suggestion is that you know we would delay any revision in the FMP on that topic until we until it was fully informed by the work done on that on that topic. Um, I'd like to speak in particular to methodology task two. Um, and that regard, uh, that uh, was the review of the Shelton model. Um, it, it seems to be the focus of some confusion in, in some of the uh, discussions that I've heard over the last week or two. Um, I think the clarification that, that the task was to conduct a technical review of the updates to the Shelton model and not the thresholds or other applications of the model. That seemed to be a point of confusion at some, some venues. Um, the decision on whether to update the threshold is the council's consistent with the language in the FMP. Um, and I also agree and sympathize with folks that have noted that the language in the FMP is a little bit confusing, at least with regard to uh, the technical review, and that would recommend that we would revisit that as well uh, to offer that clarification or to clarify it. Um, I would say that consistent with the SSC statement um, in September when this doc, when this a task was originally assigned, uh, they had requested a, a document describing the changes between the 2019 and 2021 document, uh, 2021 Shelton models to be provided. And that uh, documentation, in fact, was submitted to the SSC 
per the timelines described in advance of the October methodology review. And including, included in that documentation was a table mapping the relevant information in each document. And so there seemed to be what was requested by the SSC in September seemed to be delivered, in fact, to the October session. Um, I'm not disagreeing that there's always additional information that would be helpful for, to look at, that kinds of things, but in terms of what the task was, what the information that was requested was, and whether it was delivered, that seems to have been the case. Um, um, the, as as uh, Mr. Addix observed, the Shelton 2020 model documentation, as was the 2019 version, uh, went through a rigorous scientific peer review prior to its publication in a uh, respected professional journal. So um, I would like to, to highlight that with regard to uh, a peer review as part of decision of BSIA. Uh, the document provided to the SSC and the STT describes how the models are different and the improvements of the Shelton 2021 over the Shelton 2019. Um, again, I think Mr. Addix noted several of those, as did some of the documentation received, the larger and more extensive analysis, the inclusion of, sufficient, of significantly more years, um, stocks and tag codes. And also I would note uh, the comment that uh, by one of one of the authors who is also an SSC member, that it improved biological interpretability, which I think is very important. Um, in, a, in the new model, Shelton 2021 builds on the previous model, but it is otherwise used in the same way as Shelton 2019. Um, which the SSC previously found to be reasonable and appro appropriate. Um, I did note the statement in the SSC report um, about the clarification that it was referred to the questions at hand um, and that in that context, they were examin examining the relationships between the indices of abundance and killer whale life history and body condition parameters. However, I would, uh, in, I would like to note that those relationships were area specific, the threshold is area specific. And in fact, those relationships largely informed the derivation of the threshold that was ultimately adopted by the council. And I think again, if you refer to the, or look at the, the uh, alternatives document that was provided to the council, and I believe November of 2020, um, you'll see those connections made. Um, the updated model configuration includes improved stock stratification. Um, for which the estimated distributions align better with results from other analyses used in the management assessment of stock, salmon stocks, um, as the back and forth between myself and Mr. Carey indicated. Um, so based on all of those um, considerations, uh, at least from NIMS's perspective, we would see the use of both the FRAM, new version of FRAM and the improved versions of a Shelton uh, model to, to uh, inform the uh, threshold uh, to, to be, um, I, we would recommend using both of those. Thank you, Susan. Bill Anderson. Thanks, um, Mr. Vice Chair, and um, thanks, Susan, for those those comments and, and also those of uh, Kyle Attix. Um, I do uh, just some observations. I do, you know, if you look at the FMP language as it relates to SRKWs, I think it's on page 70 of the of the document. We we need to get in there and address the the uh, the uh, the language in there that caused the the confusion, well, confusion, I don't know if it's confusion, but the, um, the uh, different views on what, what years should be used, uh, as well as the roles of our SDT, SSC, the MU, um, so that there we have a greater level of clarity there and, and can avoid some of the confusion and, and angst I'll call it, I guess, that occurred uh, when those groups were trying to reconcile what the what the council was asking of them. Um, in that in that vein, I also think um, we really need to think carefully about uh, how uh, about being clear on our assignments. If we're making an assignment to the SSC or the STT or whatever group, we've got to make sure we're clear. And, and that, that may require some back and forth uh, just to make sure that those that are 
taking those assignments to those groups uh, that, that, that we uh, have a commonality and understanding of what's being asked of them because that did not happen here. Um, and I, so it's a, it's a lesson learned we, and, and stepping back and how do we do better? Um, I'm not sure that the question about, um, the FRAM updates, the, the improvements to the Shelton model, whether that was a good fit for the methodology review. Uh, which is one of the reasons I asked the questions is this is this a change in methodology or is is this a, um, update uh, in the data the inputs does it qualify does it meet whatever threshold for methodology review that qualifies as a methodology review and I just put that question out there because I'm not I'm yet not yet convinced this is a methodology review no no that we're being at, that we were asking of the SSC and the STT as it relates to the language in the F salmon FMP on SRKWs. All that being said, I, I, um, I'm supportive of, of the, of recalculating, reestablishing the new threshold based on the improvements made to both FRAM, the updates to FRAM and the improvements in the Shelton model, um, the, S, the STT did a good job of laying that out in the table as to what the changes in the threshold would be and the rationale behind it in terms of the changes in the understanding of the distribution, particularly of those more northerly migrating stocks that come out of the Columbia River in particular. And I, I'm, I'm also mindful that that salmon management in not only here but in other areas where we don't operate in a vacuum there are there are consultations taking place for other fisheries in other areas and we have to be cognizant of the base that's being assumed in other areas and other fisheries when those consultations are going on um, and so that's again important here to make sure that we're using consistent applications and information about establishing the threshold and what is being understood about is the base for, for PFMC salmon fisheries when those consultations and for other areas are being done. Um, thanks, for, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Phil. Okay, anyone else? John. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think previous speakers have covered everything well and and uh, laid out the logic behind uh, why why this is a good move going forward with some of these re recommendations. I'd like to thank the SDT, the SSC, and SAS for their work. I, I really enjoyed some of the products that they produced, and and uh, I you know I just. I'm fully supportive, I think, of everything that's been proposed here, including um, developing a new threshold uh, as proposed by Mr. Addicts. So uh, just wanted to add that. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, looking for motions, I guess. I think we're there, maybe. Kyle Addicts, go. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion, which we should be able to put up on the screen. I move that the council adopt an updated Chinook abundance threshold for Southern resident killer whale management measures based on improvements made to the models originally used to develop the threshold and consistent with section 6.6.8 of the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management Plan. The threshold is based on pre-fishing Chinook salmon abundance in the north of Cape Falcon area and the updated value is 623,000 as reported as presented in agenda item D2A supplemental STT report 2 dated 11 to 2022. Thank you, Kyle. Is the language on the screen accurate? It is. Very good. Look for a second. Second by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Um,
speak to your motion if you uh, desire to act out. Thanks again, Mr. Vice Chair. I made a lot of the points I wanted to make during council discussion, so I won't rehash those. I'll just say that back when the, the Southern Resident Killer Rail Work Group developed their recommendations for a range of alternatives, and as the council adopted the final measure, management measures, we knew there'd be a, there would be future model updates that would need to be considered and would result in recalculation of the threshold. I believe this action is consistent with the intent we had as we tried to anticipate the future back then. We have um, updated versions of both models in hand today, and I think it's appropriate to update the threshold accordingly. And just thanks again to everyone for their work that went into updating and, and improving the models and bringing forward a new threshold for the council's consideration. Thank you, Kyle. Questions for the motion maker or discussions on the motion? Not seeing any, I'll, um, oh, I saw a hand come up, but I guess not. I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Rice Chair. Prepared to offer a motion. Thank you, Sandra. I move the council adopt the recommendation that the Sacramento index forecast be expressed as the median rather than the mean beginning in 2023, as described in item four of agenda item D2A supplemental STT report one, November 2022. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Close for a second. Second by uh, Chair Grumlick. Thank you, Mark. Marcy, please uh, speak to your motion. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I spoke to it earlier, but uh, both the SSC and the STT suggest that um, accuracy would uh, be improved if we express the SI as the median rather than the mean. So, thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay, questions for the uh, motion maker? Discussion? Okay. I'm not seeing any, so I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'm not seeing any. Motion passed unanimously. Very good. Um, I think that's the end of the motions, I believe. Um, any further considered a, a discussion on this uh, on D2? As far as guidance? Eric. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, there was some talk about uh, clarifying, uh, perhaps even amending uh, uh, the FMP to clarify some of these issues around southern resident killer whales. And so I guess the question is still out there whether uh, this council does want to pursue that. If so, I would propose that uh, some of council staff cooperate with NIMP staff and bring that back probably at April is what I'm looking at at the moment, uh, but I did want to float that out there and see if that is the desire of the council to pursue that angle. Thank you, Merrick. Phil Anderson, Phil? I would support that. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just to clarify, there were recommendations in the SSC report about amending the FMP language surrounding the Sacramento uh, false conservation objective and the the history and derivation of that objective. And they included that language as an appendix in their report. And I think uh, Ms. Bishop and I both spoke to uh, our thoughts on that proposal, which is um, rather than spend time um, amending the FMP language when we've already identified a need to revisit the conservation objective itself, we'd rather um, pause on spending time um, amending the language in the FMP and instead focus on the analytical work to update the conservation objective for Sacramento Falls Chinook. Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. J just in the interest of uh, clarity, Mr. Remco, so there would be there are two uh, types of amendments or refinements that are being discussed right now. One pertains to the Southern resident killer whale issue and the other you're speaking to is the 
Sacramento conservation objective. So uh, your remarks wouldn't, you don't wish to hold back on the Southern resident killer whale. Precisely. Thank you. Okay, very good. Susan. Thank you. Um, I, I may just have another suggestion. I, I support uh, revising the SRKW language as well. Um, if we do identify a few other housekeeping um, um, revisions to the FMP, those might, the council staff might bring those back as well. You know, we have done that on a couple of other occasions just to be efficient with regard to uh, the FMP amendment process since it takes, you know, sometimes several meetings and quite a bit of time to do it. Um, if if uh, council uh, staff identifies those, it might be helpful to bring those as well. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else? Okay. Well, with that, I'll turn to uh, Robin, and uh, she'll tell us how we're doing here, yes. officially. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, everything looks good. You guys had an awesome discussion, and it was uh, very informing. So I do appreciate that. I I do have a question, and I I I think I know the answer, but I do want uh, to get clarification on the STT report three with the uh, Klamath Ocean Harvest model recommendation that the council uh, don't necessarily need a motion, but just uh, approves that recommendation of the STT to use a different range of years in their data for that model. Thank you, Mr. Reister. Yeah, I, I believe I spoke to that in my yeah. remarks. Certainly support the recommendations and appreciate the dialogue with Dr. O'Farrell. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, uh, Robin. Yep, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, yes, so yeah, I have um, the SI forecast median being approved uh, starting in 2023. I have uh, an adjustment to the killer well uh, threshold for Chinook abundance of 623,000. I have a uh, recommendation of the KOHM model uh, to use a different range of years in the data set for that effort forecasting. And I am understanding that uh, for FMP language, uh, we can revisit the language and clarify on the uh, killer well topic, which I definitely agree. Uh, could use some refinement and um, perhaps bring forward any housekeeping efforts. Uh, council staff will work with NIMPS um, over the winter months and hopefully have something for them come April. So that's what I've gathered through this conversation. You guys are right on track for timing. So um, you've done your job and thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, Robin. And with that, we're going to take a break. We've been out for over two hours here. So see everybody back here at uh, 315.
Okay, we're back in session here. I'm uh, ready to go to D3 and I'll uh, ask Robin to um, give us a summary. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item DT, where we're going to talk about the 2023 preseason management schedule. Uh, we do this every year in November. We're preparing for uh, things to come as we start our preseason process, uh, at least through the council in March and April. So in order to plan on that, we need to um, put forth some schedules and ideas about how things are going to uh, play out as we move through up to and through that uh, salmon schedule. So for 2023, uh, well, I guess I'll start also by saying we do have an attachment one that uh, has a table that has a series of dates and events associated with them that get us from uh, this November meeting all the way through May 16. Um, and then in the situation summary in the center of the page, um, there's a recommendation from council staff to have uh, one salmon uh, management alternatives hearing uh, per coastal state. Uh, we do that every year. These are our salmon public hearings. Uh, the proposal is to have those hearings be conducted in person uh, starting Monday, March 20, 2023 uh, in Westport, Washington and Coos Bay, Oregon. So we'll have um, uh, one meeting in each state that evening. And then on Tuesday, March 21 of 2023, have a hearing conducted in Eureka, California. Um, we also plan on having the 2023 March meeting uh, to occur in Seattle and the April meeting is going to occur in Foster City. Uh, public comment uh, is available uh, for everyone at both of those uh, council meetings. So that's another opportunity to bring forward any uh, public comment opportunity. And certainly the states are more than welcome to conduct their own public uh, hearings if they want to hear additional public comment as well. Um, and also on this situation summary, you have a table that outlines participation in all of our public hearings for the past 10 years or so. Um, We'll also note that for the past couple of years, the hearings have been held uh, virtually uh, due to uh, health concerns from the COVID pandemic. Um, going back to uh, the attachment one that has the list of tables, um, I would also note that the uh, January and February STT meetings, uh, the Intention is to also have both of those uh, four day meetings occur in person at the council office. And I did, well, it was brought to my attention. There's one mistake, well, maybe more than one, but um, for the April council meeting that's described in attachment one, it says it's in Seattle, uh, but in fact, it is in Foster City. But after reviewing all of this, we're just asking the council to um, approve the overall schedule and process for developing these 2023 ocean salmon management measures and um, adopt the, this schedule, if you will, as tentative and acknowledge the uh, public hearing uh, venues and dates as well. And so I think, I think that concludes my situation summary. You do have a, uh, report from California Department of Fish and Wildlife under this agenda item as well. So that concludes my summary. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Robin. Okay, questions for Robin on her summary? Okay, very good. With that, we'll go to uh, CDFW and Marcy Ripko. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, appreciate the Council's indulgence, I'm gonna go ahead and read this into the record. Uh, report was submitted just yesterday, so folks may not have had a chance to uh, take a look at it. The Department of Fish and Wildlife or CDFW is concerned with a number of recent trends observed by our agency with regard to Sacramento River Fall Chinook. In light of these concerns, CDFW requests that the council consider recommending new and additional measures in the upcoming 2023 annual fishery management and season setting process to provide better assurance 
that the fishery and stock will perform as the forecast and harvest models suggest. In recent years, the California commercial ocean salmon fishery has outperformed expectations significantly, while the in-river fishery has fared poorly. Furthermore, the escapement, used to estimate river and hatchery adult returns to the Central Valley, has repeatedly fallen below projections. Persistent drought conditions in California are having significant impacts on Sacramento River Fall Chinook stocks. Migration into the river the last three years has been delayed, resulting in a very poor inland fishery. So far, the observed 2022 inland recreational harvest is about 50% or less of what it was at this time last year, despite a somewhat optimistic 2022 preseason inland harvest forecast of over 32,000 fish. At the end of 21, under 15,000 fish were estimated to have been landed in the inland fishery, despite a 2021 preseason forecast of 21,800 fish. In 2020, in-river fishery performance was even worse, with less than 40% of the 41,148 fish forecast landed. The current catch rates indicate the inland fishery will severely underperform again in 2022, perhaps even falling short of the 2020 catch estimate. There is also documented widespread elevated pre-spawn mortality of Chinook salmon throughout the valley. Observations have been made in the Sacramento River downstream of Calusa, the Lower American River near Sacramento, the Lower McCollumy River below the Kasumnas River, and the Lower Feather Rivers near the confluence with the Sacramento. The number of observations, though qualitative, are similar to previous drought years, which were 2014 and 2015, and are more than double those observed in 2021. The CDFW Fish Health Laboratory has also verified that severe columnaris disease is contributing to some of the mortalities observed. The prolonged period of high water temperatures likely played a significant role in disease development and progression. The conservation objective for Sacramento Fall Run Chinook, as described in the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management Plan, sets an escapement goal range of 122,000 to 180,000 adult spawners quote, to provide adequate escapement of natural and hatchery production for Sacramento and San Joaquin fall and late fall stocks based on habitat conditions, end quote. Earlier this year, under agenda item D3D supplemental CDFW report, uh, that was from March, uh, recommended, uh, CDFW recommended the council target the maximum of this escapement goal range of 180,000 adult spawners for a number of reasons. The stock was declared overfished by NOAA Fisheries in 2018 due to chronically low spawner abundance and was only recently declared rebuilt last year. Yet in its first year as a rebuilt stock, 2021 escapement was estimated at 104,483 adult spawners, below the 122,000 adult fish minimum level of the escapement goal range and well below the projected return of 133,900 adults. And significantly, over a longer time period of 2006 through 2021, returns have failed to meet the minimum of the goal range in, range in nine of the last 16 years. Despite the council ultimately targeting an escapement even above the maximum of the goal range in its spring 2022 preseason planning process, which was 198,694 adult spawners, indications suggest that once again, both inland fishery and escapement projections will not be attained by year's end, and in fact are likely to fall well short of expectations. In addition to the higher escapement target, in response to NIMF's guidance, the Council supported adding additional precaution to the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model outputs by targeting an impact rate cap of 10% rather than the ESA required 16% to account for continued model underperformance. The adjustment resulted in significantly shorter commercial fishing seasons off California compared to 2021, especially in the northern part of the state. However, despite the shorter seasons and higher projected escapement identified in the final preferred alternative, the preliminary California commercial Chinook catch, meaning the landings of all Chinook stocks, so not just limited to the Sacramento Fall Chinook, uh, for 2022 is over 213,000 fish, which is even higher than the 2021 total of 2,419. 
I, I should have included a reference here to uh, Supplemental Information Report 2, which is uh, in the briefing book. Once again, this preliminary data from the 2022 California Commercial Ocean Salmon Fishery suggests that landings have outperformed expectations again in 2022, with totals to date coming in at roughly 250% of the preseason projection. This follows an exceptional 2021 commercial season where the fishery landed 303% of the preseason projection. By comparison, the recreational ocean salmon fishery has performed about as expected in both 2021 and 2022. CDFW appreciates the work of the council to undertake the annual salmon management process and recognizes the great value the council process offers to bring together fishing industries, agencies, tribes, and non-governmental organizations to comprehensive, comprehensively consider the latest and best available science and data in making management recommendations. The process serves as an excellent forum for which varying perspectives are considered and decisions are made with some expectation that projected stock abundance and projections of fishery performance will be realized year over year. While CDFW acknowledges the modeling adjustments and actions taken this spring to curtail 2022 commercial fishery impacts and improve fishery escapement and in-river fishery performance, these actions appear to have fallen short. As a result, CDFW requests the council recommend direct measures to curtail the commercial fishery in 2023 and beyond as necessary to ensure that catches do not continue to substantially exceed projections. Catch controls warranting consideration might include vessel-based commercial, commercial fishery landing limits, predefined catch triggers, or other measures to be implemented both pre and in season in order to ensure commercial fishery performance keeps within expectations. While there is no guarantee that constraining the commercial fishery will produce the additional river returns needed to support and restore the inland fisheries or escapement, such actions would have only a beneficial effect on those elements of the Sacramento fall run Chinook life cycle. Although stock forecast information will not be available until February, 2023, CDFW offers this recommendation at the council's November 2022 meeting under the preseason management schedule agenda item in order to allow for adequate time in the preseason meetings and process to develop and implement new commercial fishery measures for effectiveness in the 2023 season. Thank you. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Question on the uh, CDFW report. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Marcy. All right, uh, with that, um, that's, the, that's the end of our reports. And um, I don't think there's any public comment, but I'll wait for the official. Okay, no public comment. So that takes us to uh, council action and um, Saw our screen before us. So uh, with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just looking at the SITS, um, um, I noticed we don't have a SAS report on the preseason schedule with any recommendations or discussion from the SAS on the proposed hearing schedule. And I'm just wondering if maybe Robin might elaborate for us on any discussion the SAS had and if they um, had any indications of supporting either uh, remote or in-person meetings. Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Mr. Armco. I did uh, go over this report with the SAS and I did uh, say that the intention was to have these meetings in person. Um, I didn't get a response one way or the other and don't recall any uh, deep conversations about that. Um, I will say that the SAS was unusually quiet uh, this time around, but um, uh, for the record, yes, they were informed that the intention was to have these meetings in person, these public salmon hearings, and I didn't get any feedback one way or the other from the team uh, how they felt about that. 
Hey, thank, well, thank you, Robin. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Robin, for that. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe you can uh, explain for me what the, uh, I know you're looking for uh, a confirmation from the council today to confirm the hearing sites. And I'm just wanting to know if um, that means that you'll proceed with making room arrangements and potential contracts for space and, and travel plans, et cetera. Um, at least in California, we haven't had a lot of discussion on this and are still um, similarly having discussions about our uh, state uh, hearing plans uh, in early March and whether they will be virtual or in person. So I'm just wondering um, if we have time to provide further guidance on this topic in March or if um, you're looking for a decision from us here today to confirm. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Yurinko. It, um I think that we at least could um, get tentative uh, dates uh, for these meetings and and locations and um, certainly the venues, uh, whether they be in person or, um, or or maybe they can't, you know, because of the health concerns. I think um, we can at least do the dates and the uh, state that they will be in. I think when we did this last year, we were a little uncertain on how things were going to go. Um, and so we kind of left the door open, but I think we made that decision um, or at least we're able to confirm um, prior to coming into the March meeting that um, we w wouldn't be able to have them in, in person, um, that it was safer to have them uh, participate remotely, which is what we did. So I think we can adopt it as is um, and we can put a, a placeholder or a disclaimer, I guess the word would be as far as whether or not they're in person or not, but it would help the public at least understand to uh, save the date, if you will. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Jerry Rolex. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, Robin, I know that back in the day when we had these uh, hearings in person, we tried to, at least in California, move the location around a little bit so that uh, we would share the inconvenience um, amongst all the folks that are interested. Um, and so I see here you're proposing Eureka, which is pretty close to the far north of the state. And I'm wondering, do you recall where the last couple of in-person meetings were? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that table in the middle of the sits um, uh, gives us that answer. And so I think in 2018, we were in uh, Salinas and in 2019 we were in Ukiah and for two for 2020 our plan was to be in Eureka and I think that is why this Eureka uh, was carried over uh, typically the council will try to have the salmon hearings um, in a geographic location in California that um is probably going to be needing the most discussion. Um, and so uh, perhaps uh, Northern California may be the best fit, but um, that's where we were for the past couple of times we've been in person. And uh, the, the suggestion of Eureka um, is essentially a carryover from from past years and that Eureka was was next up, if you will, and um, could be a, a good port to um, have some discussions and maybe maybe where some of the bigger salmon issues might be occurring. Thank you, Robin. Jerry Rolick? Yeah, I, I just, um, I mean, Eureka is pretty far north. Fort Bragg mm -hmm. has, um, is still in the north part of the state but um, is probably more reachable uh, by more folks. Um, it, it would be a trek for folks from Crescent City and Eureka, but it would not be, um, uh, it wouldn't 
be as burdensome as folks from further south. I don't know. We may end up going virtual anyway. That's a discussion, I guess, for, for March. But um, I guess my input is I'd rather see uh, Fort Bragg than Eureka just because it's not so extreme geographically. Okay. So I didn't I want to make sure the California discussion was wrapped up before I jumped in with something else. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I appreciate your remarks, Mark. Um, I, I think I agree, um, but I'm listening to Robin's advice about um, tentatively approving the schedule and having some additional discussion. Um, I'm thinking about Santa Rosa myself rather than Fort Bragg. Um, if in fact our normal, uh, state pilgrimage to Santa Rosa, um, can't commence in person, um, that location, at least along the 101 is, uh, fairly central to Northern and Southern interests. And so, um, if we don't use that as a location for an in-person meeting, that the state will host, then that might be an appropriate location if there's a council sponsored hearing that's in person. Executive Director Rubber. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I did want to uh, go back to um, some of the discussion here a couple of minutes ago about when we would need to pin down uh, locations and what it would take to do so and uh, part of what we do on staff for a living is planning meetings and uh, getting things in place. And um, as we saw earlier this year, when we got behind the eight ball, it was difficult to find a place for next April. Um, the salmon hearings are much smaller, but we still do need quite a lead time um, of several weeks. If I look at the calendar, I think we have to make that decision before we hit the March meeting. Uh, if we make it at the March meeting, there's just not enough time to guarantee we'll have a spot in the place that we want it. So um, all that is to say, it's going to be easier for us to reserve a spot now. And if we do decide to go remote, we can back away, but um, we should make that decision at this meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Bill. Uh, and, and I can't see if Kyle's hands up or not. So I didn't want to jump in front of him, but um, we did talk a little bit about the uh, Westport meeting um, in person versus remote. And um, I think our, our general thinking is that having a remote virtual setup has worked well in the last couple of years. Um, and we would likely be recommending that again for this year, um, understanding the timing issues and the need to to book space, I, I think the, the the location you've been using in Westport is we can probably reserve that and cancel it if we choose to go uh, virtual. So just wanted to flag that, that we had been talking about that. I also had a an addition to at least put in front of the council to think about relative to the proposed schedule and process. And um, I sent it to uh, Sandra a bit ago, just so you could see what I was uh, suggesting. And uh, if you choose to, if you don't think it's a good idea, that's fair enough. Um, but it has to do with, I, I, I note that um, on the schedule, on the March 11th to 31st references the management agency tribes North Falcon, and all that stuff. Um, the other thing that's important, I think, as far as our process is when the PSC sets the catch limits in northern fisheries. And oftentimes we're, we're waiting for that in the public as well as the manager. Sometimes they're uncertain to, when to expect that. And so I was thinking of um, um, something along the lines of what may come up on the screen here uh, could be added. Um, and I would, if, if the council were, thought this was a good idea, I would insert it after the March 2021. I would just put April 1 
and then the text would be by April 1, PSC sets catch limits in northern fisheries, southeast Alaska, northern BC, and west coast of Vancouver Island. And the reason I'm saying by April 1 is, is the um, oftentimes, the, well, ideally the Sea Act catch limit will be set at the February PSC meeting, whereas the Northern BC and WCVI aren't set until closer to April 1. So that's why I use the, the, the uh, language by April 1. Uh, so for someone reviewing the schedule and wondering when we that are aware that that's a part of our process, I thought that addition might be beneficial. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Kyle Addix? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, similar to Mr. Anderson, I didn't want to jump in front of the California discussion. Um, as as Phil said, we've discussed it, and and I support either a, an, a virtual hearing or an in-person hearing. Um, there's some expenses with in-person hearings for council staff to travel out to Westport um, to rent the space, and I think the virtual hearings have worked pretty well. Um, just an FYI for the council, the um, co-managers in Washington are working on developing our our schedule for state tribal meetings as well for the WDFW series of public meetings that occurs every year. We're planning to try to return to partial in-person public meetings. Before COVID hit, we were already planning to sort of transition to a hybrid approach with in-person attendance as well as virtual attendance. Obviously, that got put on hold for um, two or three years here through the pandemic, but we are planning to return to a partial in-person, but with a virtual option too for some of our public meetings through the process this year. I'll also just point out that the it's a short window this year between the end of the March meeting and the start of the April meeting. So we'll be cramming um, the same or more meetings into a smaller space this year. And it's, it's gonna make it a, a busy March for all of us. Okay, thank you, Kyle. And if I could, maybe uh, Robin, can I go back to you and make sure that what Phil laid out there, is that pretty clear what we're talking about there, incorporating that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I made a note and um, it'll be next year, but certainly you can add that, that line if uh, the council finds that helpful. Okay, very good, so, oh, Phil. So I'm understanding that we couldn't add that now we have to wait until next year. Robin? Thank you. Um, well, I don't really think we use this particular table again as far as it being submitted as a council document. I guess that was my point. I, I populated every November for this meeting, um, but I don't recall a place uh, for the March or April meeting that this particular attachment one table comes into place. And I can certainly submit it um, again in March, no problem, with that extra information. Well, it was, it's not a big deal. I just thought if we were going to approve the process and schedule today, we could approve it with this addition, and then it'll be on the website. And if somebody utilizes the schedule to make decisions on when they're going to engage, it would be there. But if yep. it's a problem, it's you know, there's some sort of process issue with doing that. No problem, no issue. I can uh, we can put out a revised attachment one and, and insert that in there. Okay, very good. Okay. Anyone else? Marcy? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, state folks are trying to connect here. I, I think we're uh, zooming in on uh, a recommendation to go ahead and change the tentative location that's reflected in the schedule uh, for California to Santa Rosa. Um, I'm since my audio, there we go. I'm sensitive to Merrick's uh, remarks on uh, investing in planning and travel and the staff time and cost involved in planning for an in-person event um, that then we uh, switch to virtual. So I think I, I heard slightly different things uh, first from Robin and then Merrick uh, following up to 
kind of clarify or maybe add some um, additional uh, considerations. But I, I, I guess I would say on, on the face of it, um, I'm recalling what happened. I believe it was last year uh, when we had an in-person March meeting of the SAS and the STT and council and groups got together. And then uh, after the SAS conferred and having spent a week together um, in, at the March meeting, they um, then reevaluated the prospective value of an in-person hearing. And then we went virtual as I recall. Um, so I, I have a feeling that um, if we were to dig a little deeper with our SAS, they might move to a virtual recommendation. And so this is why I'm, I think um, we'd recommend showing Santa Rosa, but um, I, I guess noting that Robin says it's it's tentative. Um, if, if we need to go ahead and recommend a fully virtual option or recommend the virtual option here and now, then, you, you know, I guess I'm prepared to do that um, to save the startup costs with planning, et cetera, if, if that's your uh, preference, Merrick. Merrick? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and thank you for your uh, remarks, Mr. Remco. A uh, couple of thoughts about the hearings that uh, I think Robin and I were trying to convey. One is uh, we do have um, you know, planning that has to take place to secure a location. We also have federal register notices that have to be done by a certain time period. All of that means that we need to make a decision about what we're going to do for a hearing before March. Um, so that was one, one point I was trying to get across. The other is um, I think what Robin was conveying and uh, things we have discussed earlier this week, uh, for instance, as part of the budget committee discussion and certainly going remote helps us financially. So I would, I guess I would advise um, if it's your uh, preference to have an in-person meeting or to hold the possibility of an in-person meeting, we are more than happy to help secure that even if we wanna make that tentative. Uh, if you do wanna be clear right now and just go ahead and go remote, of course that would make things easy too. But either way, uh, a decision here is what we'd be looking for. Okay, thanks, Merrick. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Merrick. Um, I guess with that, we'll go ahead and keep the Santa Rosa tentative location um, and then um, have uh, confer further and potentially recommend uh, remote at a later time. I, I believe that looking at the the participation levels, uh, we we had much higher participation virtually um, in 2020, 21, and 22. Um, almost those are the highest numbers on the page, except for the Salinas uh, 2018 hearing. So um, I think we certainly had an effective and efficient. Uh, virtual hearing process and with uh, 1,100 miles of coastline in California, um, virtual does seem to reach the most people. Thanks. Thank you, Marcy. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, Go back to Robin. Okay, Robin, do we have, uh, do we have uh, enough guidance here to move forward? I think so. Um, I was just looking at the list of things here for the council to do. Um, I don't think we necessarily need a motion, but certainly the council um, has approved the overall schedule and process for this ocean salmon uh, management measures that's going to take place in 2023. And we've heard the recommendation from California that uh, we publicly noticed that the California hearing will be held in Santa Rosa, opposed to uh, what's stated as Eureka in these documents. So we'll make those changes and uh, keep the disclaimer in our, our notices that we may have to uh, revert to a virtual platform um, if needed. 
So um, I'll also adjust the uh, attachment one to include uh, the April 1 date as suggested by Mr. Andis Anderson and um, it'll give me the opportunity to also uh, correct the venue stated in that attachment one for the April council meeting as well. So with that, yes, I think you finished your work under this agenda item. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robin, and thanks to everyone involved here. Just a lot of a lot of balls up in here. So, well done. So, with that, I'm going to give the gavel back to Chair Rolnick and uh, go from there. Not that this is a hot potato, but I'm going to pass it on to Vice Chair Hossamer. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. We're going to move on to agenda item E1 Halibut. Uh, just a few minutes here, there are, or seconds, there are chairs changing place. Let's see, Frank Lockhart will be at the table for NIMS. Heather Hall has joined us for uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Jessica Watson is stepping up for Oregon. So I'll give them just a little while to get all settled in here. And this, this is our 2023 halibut catch sharing plan and annual regulations final action. So I think everyone's ready here. I will then turn it over to Robin for an overview on this agenda item. Robin, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, again, this is the 2023 catch sharing plan and annual regulations, final action. Uh, we've talked about uh, changes to this plan back in September uh, and we had proposed changes um, provided from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, both of those changes uh, proposed uh, are outlined in the situation summary. Um, and since that time in September, uh, public meetings have been held and both Oregon and Washington Departments of Fish and Wildlife have submitted reports that um, outline the results of that and their uh, final proposed recommendations for changes. So this is all part of um, getting everything set up for uh, 2023 and getting our catch sharing plan, uh, which typically focuses just on the recreational fisheries, getting those all set and ready to go for next year. And also under this agenda item, besides the Oregon and Washington reports that I've mentioned, we have a report from NIMPS uh, that's uh, updated the catch uh, for the 2022 halibut fisheries in area 2A. And we also have a report from uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife that is given us a update on their 2022 uh, sport fishery for halibut in California. And there's a couple of attachments which are pretty status quo under this agenda item, the catch sharing plan itself, and then a visual representation of how the uh, allocation is shared among the different user groups. So your job under this agenda item is to adopt the final changes for the catch sharing plan as necessary, and then any annual fishery regulations as necessary also for 2023. So that wraps up my summary of agenda item one. Thank you, Robin. Any questions for Robin on the overview? I don't see any questions there, so we'll move right ahead. I see we do have a NIMS report in the briefing book. I'll ask Mr. Lockhart Frank, Was did you desire to speak to that? No, traditionally we provide the report. Uh, report for your information and if there's any questions uh, we can try to answer them but uh, it's just uh, in there uh, no presentation is necessary all right thank you the report has been in there uh, are there any questions on that before we proceed and i'm not seeing any so then we will uh, move on to the state management entity reports. Uh, we seem to always go north to south or so south to north, and Oregon never gets a chance to go first. So today I bestow the honor of being first to Oregon. Jessica Watson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. 
Um, I'll be summarizing the ODFW E1A Supplemental Report 1. Uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife solicited public input via email, phone, and online survey, as well as conducted a hybrid public meeting to discuss these proposed changes to the Pacific halibut catch sharing plan for fisheries off Oregon in 2023. Considering the public input, our report provides information and recommendations for consideration by the council in determining which alternatives to adopt for the 2023 fishery. With regards to allowing all depth halibut fishing and long leader gear fishing on the same trip, ODFW recommends alternative one, which is to allow all depth halibut fishing and long leader gear fishing on the same trip with Pacific cod, sablefish and other flatfish to be adopted instead of the status quo, which requires anglers to choose between retaining sablefish, Pacific cod or other flatfish or participating in the long leader fishing trip. Anglers have requested this opportunity be expanded to allow retention of the groundfish species that are otherwise illegal to retain when participating in the all depth halibut fishery. So that sablefish, Pacific cod and other flatfish. This alternative meets the original intent for this use of this gear, which was to provide additional opportunity with all depth halibut fishing rather than alternative opportunity. Um, and we see minimal risk to yellow eye rockfish, Chinook salmon and coho salmon with this alternative. With regards to the central Oregon sub area, there are several options that we're suggesting maybe use separately or in combination. Really, we're looking at these alternatives as tools in our toolbox to increase opportunity when appropriate. Um, with regards to the Central Oregon, Oregon Coast all depth opening date, ODFW recommends the council adopt alternative one, which states if the Central Oregon Coast sub area spring all depth allocation is greater than 100,000 pounds, the season will open May 1st as it will allow anglers additional opportunity at high allocation levels. Um, the spring all depth season would open on May 1st, approximately this would be 10 to 12 days earlier than the traditional second Thursday in May opening. ODFW would still meet with anglers after the International Pacific Halibut Commission annual meeting, which would announce the quota to determine how many days per week would be open, uh, which weeks would be open and if there should be if any should be skipped due to large morning low tides, as has been done in the past. Uh, at the recent allocation and effort levels combined with harvest rates, opening May 1st would have been accommodated without exceeding the spring allocation, even with being open seven days per week in May and June, as in 2022. So ODFW is recommending a trigger at 100,000 pounds for the the spring all depth season so that at lower allocation levels, the season would retain that current second Thursday in May opening. And really we're looking to spread the opportunity out through May, June and potentially July, which we have heard from anglers is now the preference. With regards to the Central Oregon Coast all depth open days, ODFW again is recommending alternative one be adopted. This alternative states, if the central Oregon coast sub area spring all depth allocation is greater than 100,000 pounds, the season may open up to seven days per week during months when the bottom fish fishery is not depth restricted. During, during months the bottom fish fishery is depth restricted, it would be open Thursday through Saturday. Um, and if it is estimated there will be 60,000 pounds or more remaining on the central coast combined near shore and all depth quotas after August 1st, the all depth fishery may be open up to seven days per week during months when the bottom fish fishery is not depth restricted. And again, this alternative provides additional opportunity and more flexibility in management during those high allocation levels. ODFW received a lot of positive feedback about the fishery being open seven days per week in May and June of 2022 and the expressed desire for it to continue and possibly expand. At the recent allocation and effort levels combined with harvest, harvest rates being open seven days per week for a longer period of time would have been accommodated without exceeding that spring allocation. So ODFW is rem recommending this trigger of 100,000 pounds for the spring all depth season so that at lower allocation levels, the season would retain the current three day opening, spreading again that opportunity through May, June and potentially July. For the summer all depth season, ODFW would consult again with NIMPS and the IPHC in July to determine how much quota remains in the central Oregon coast sub area, all depth and nearshore combined and other Oregon sub areas. Uh, 
how fisheries have progressed to date and bycatch impacts on key species such as yellow eye rockfish. And based on those consultations, it could then be announced before August 1st whether the fishery would be open to seven days per week. Um, this proposal does not include the Columbia River subarea due to co-management with Washington and trying to align openings in that subarea with other open Washington subareas. And the southern Oregon subarea is already open to all depths seven days per week with bottom fish retention allowed in areas open to bottom fish. With regards to the central Oregon coast subarea daily bag limit, again, ODFW remember recommends our alternative one, which states if the central Oregon coast subarea allocation, all depth and nearshore combined is 2000 pounds or greater, the daily bag limit may be increased to two fish per day based on consultation between ODFW NIMFS, IPHC and the council with the intent of taking the entire subarea allocation by September 30th be adopted as it provides again additional opportunity. Modifying the bag limit earlier in the season would provide additional opportunity for anglers to harvest the allocation. Um, during public meetings, anglers expressed interest in now front loading the season with additional opportunities rather than towards the tail end of the season. Uh, increasing the bag limit to two fish per day in May or June could increase effort and catches enough to take the entire spring allocation as well as eat into the summer and or nearshore allocation, and the bag limit has not been two fish during May or June in over 20 years. Therefore, it is highly uncertain what the increased bag limit would do to angler behavior and catch rates. Uh, this request to front load the season is a departure from recent years' desire to have the season spread out as long as possible. Uh, it stems from leaving a significant amount of Oregon recreational allocation unharvested in the last four years and wanting to attain more of that harvest level. ODFW will track yellow eye, rockfish bycatch, and mortality carefully to ensure it does not become too high and potentially impact the recreational fishery with a need for depth restrictions or, or closures. Really, under all the recommended alternatives, ODFW would still consult with NIMS, the IPHC, and the about the proposed in-season changes and meet with anglers after the IPHC annual meeting, which it would announce the quota to determine which week's dates would be open and if there should be some skipped, as I mentioned. Um, additional fixed openings would be identified as well as potential backup dates for the preseason. Uh, ODFW has also included in our report draft changes to the catch sharing plan language um, and staff are more than happy to work with council and NIMS to further refine and draft that language after council takes final action. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Any questions on the ODFW report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so I appreciate your report. Um, it looks to me like you've done a fair amount of analysis on how to um, consider better utilizing or more for, fully utilizing um, the Oregon recreational allocation. Um, I'm just looking at um, the complexity in the alternatives that are recommended and I'm just wondering if you did any projection modeling on opening the fishery May 1, uh, which is the traditional opening date, and um, not having any periodic closures and letting the fishery uh, run continuously through um, the season end date, um, what that projection looks like in terms of your um, the, the allocation that, that you've been receiving each year. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Remco. I would like to ask if it would be okay to bring, um, my staff member, Ms. Lynn Mass to the table to answer that question as yes. she's more familiar with the projections. Yes. Come on up, Lynn. I forgot how to do this in person. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Uremko, um, we would meet with the public ahead of time uh, after we get the quota to set up what we think would be the number of fixed dates we could open, and those would be announced pre-season. Then after those fixed dates, the catch sharing plan reads that we would be open every other week. That allows us to have a week to uh, analyze the data, see how much is left, and whether or not we can be open the following week. So we would look at catch rates once we get our quota to set up how many days we think we can get, 
without exceeding the quota. Um, in the summer, in our spring season, on a really good weekend, we can average about 15 to 18,000 pounds a day. If the weather's snotty, we've le uh, averaged less than 500 pounds a day. Uh, so we try to take all those factors into account, as well as if there's really negative tide cycles, because that impacts um, particularly Garibaldi and Band and being able to get out onto the water. Hopefully that helps some. Thank you. Further question, Marcy? Yeah, thank, thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I, I'm just, I guess, thinking about the structure that you have in Southern Oregon um, with the opening May 1 and letting it run continuously. Um, I don't think you've hit that limit in some time. Um, if you just, for simplicity's sake, um, did that, looking at your recent fishery performance in um, the last couple of years, if if there was any possibility of uh, structuring the Central Oregon coast that way. Um, I, I hear you on the process that you're proposing, which is consistent with how you've been doing it and, and looking at working that out after the allocation or the quota amount is settled. But I'm just, I'm just wondering based on your most recent look of your fishery performance, if um, how far you would get through the season in the central air, sub area um, opening May 1. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Mr. Gramko, the Southern Oregon sub area actually this year, not Southern, yeah, Southern Oregon sub area actually this year exceeded 8,000 pounds for the first time in a very long time by about 50 pounds. <laughs> Um, so they, they hit their allocation. We had enough allocation to keep it open further. Trying to make a projection right now with a two fish bag limit and seven days a week and May 1st would be a little tough not knowing what our allocation is going to be. At our current allocation, what we've had the last four years, um, quick back of the napkin in the, in the back of my head calculation, we would probably make it through at least the beginning of July, if not all the way through July on our spring quota, um, because we are fishing on a large cohort of fish in the 2012, 2013 year class uh, that are kind of small. They are uh, about 30, 31 inches this year, average size. Next year, they'll probably be 33, 34 inch. So best guess right now, if we put all of the potential changes in place for next year at the quota we have this year, I'm guessing we'd get through early July, maybe even full July. And that's a lot of ifs in there, um, but that's based on you know, doing this for a decade and a half and having a decent idea what our fisheries look like and how they behave. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Lynn. And uh, I appreciate your reference to the two fish bag limit. And I guess I would just um, look for confirmation that uh, you're still operating with an annual limit per person of some amount to kind of aid with that two fish daily limit. Through the vice chair, Mr. Remco, that is correct. In state regulations, we have a six fish annual bag limit. In order to retain halibut, an angler has to purchase not only a recreational fishing license, but they also have to purchase a combined angling tag. And that combined angling tag has a six fish annual limit on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Other questions for Jessica on the Oregon report? I'm not seeing any hands, so thank you very much. And we'll then move to Marcy Uremko for the California report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, referring to uh, supplemental CDFW report one, agenda item E1A, uh, the 2022 Recreational Pacific Halibut Fishery in California was open May 1 through August 7th with a daily bag limit of one fish per person per day. The fishery closed for the year on August 7th due to projected attainment of the 38,740 net pound quota. CDFW tracked Recreational Pacific Halibut catches daily during the season and consulted with NIMFS, IPHC, and council staff to take action to close the fishery. Monthly catch is estimated by CDFW's SURFS program 
The 2022 total season catch estimate for the California recreational sector is 48,009 net pounds or 124% of the quota as shown in table one. Similar to 2021, the fishery began slowly in May and then rapidly intensified in mid-June with periods of high catch rates associated with fair weather events. Uh, and just uh, looking through table one, working through it, um, this is how uh, we illustrate our in-season process where we first make a projected catch for the month and then we subsequently revise that projection once the surf's estimate becomes available. So we make make a projection of, a, of an amount based on what we're seeing daily in the field, what's reported to us uh, in terms of fish that are observed in the field um, to generate our projection and then replace it with the surf's estimate when that becomes available six weeks after the end of each month. So, um, as you can see, we um, did fairly well on our projections in the months of May and June, and then July and August, our projections and our surf estimates um, didn't match as well. Um, in addition to daily tracking in 2022, for the first time, we utilized weekly reports containing lengths of the fish sampled. Lynn referenced uh, the small fish in their fishery. We'd been seeing that as well in uh 2020 and 21. Um, we use that information to determine if the average size of fish in 2022 showed a significant deviation from the multi-year average size. And if so, uh, to consider that information in evaluating the quota attainment. The monthly catch projection and surfs estimates for May and June were in close agreement and indicated the adjustments to the catch projection procedures to incorporate size information from the 2021 fishery were suitable. July and August estimates and catch projections were not as close, but rather than unusual fish size being the primary reason for the discrepancy, in these cases, the differences can be attributed to surf statistical expansion process that incorporates monthly effort information from various geographic areas and fishing modes. Variations in effort cannot be captured in determining the catch projections and is a variable, variable treated as constant when the projections are made. Since active quota management for the fishery began in 2015, California's quota has lasted the entire season in only one year, that's 2019, and has extended from May continuously through Labor Day weekend in only 2019 as well. Anecdotal information from anglers indicates a very high catch rate in each of the last three years. The catch projection model used to determine fishery quota dates, closure dates in season suggest that if the fishery had not been closed in 2022 upon reaching the quota, between 54,000 and 92,000 net pounds could have been caught during a full season lasting from May 1 through November 15th. When 4% of the non-tribal area 2A FCEY was allocated to the California Recreational Fishery in the catch sharing plan beginning in 2015, there were concerns of stranding fish if the California fishery did not have the capacity to catch its allocation each year. Fishery performance from 2015 through present dispels this concern and suggests the opposite, that the allocation and resulting quota are perhaps constraining the fishery more than anticipated, and the California recreational fishery may have a greater capacity than was assumed in 2015. CDFW will again closely track the fishery in 2023 and will incorporate relevant updated size and catch information to refine the tracking process. Thank you. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Marcy. Any questions for Marcy on that report? Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Marcy, for this detailed report. Um, just as a clarification, I noticed in the report it states, you know, that the 2022 recreational halibut fishery in California was open May 1st and this year through August 7th um, with a daily bag limit of one fish per person. Can you please clarify, were there any day or depth restrictions during that time period as well? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you for the question, Jessica. No, we, we do not have our halibut fishery tied at all to depth constraints. Um, we do have um, ground fish depth constraints that are present um, at this time in the areas that the halibut fishery operates. 
Um, I'll note that moving toward 2023, um, our groundfish fishery uh, in the North Coast will no longer be subject to depth constraints. They'll, they'll have a much shorter recreational season. Further question, Jessica? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just one more follow-up, Marcy. Um, can you please remind me, do you have an annual recreational halibut limit as well? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. No, we do not. We do not, and we don't have a, a tag or a card program um, but we do, um, again, um, closely monitor our fishery through our surfs program, and um, that's, that's what we have. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Further questions? Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Marcy, I, I'm looking at your, um, your projection. Uh, deal you have here and in those may june july days and i can obviously see what the august day you know the august one through seven only in the close i can i get that are you open um for angling seven days a week is that is that those represent full months of angling or do you have days of the week thank you mr rice chair we open may one and run continuously without uh, any day of the week closures um, in past seasons, we have had uh, block time closures of several weeks um, in the months of July or August, spanning two weeks, um, like so half month closures. In the past, we have had those, um, but we uh, conduct um, a survey of anglers as to their preference about how to best utilize the available quota and, and how to um, maximize the opportunities and, and also spread them um, as long through the season as practicable. And um, the survey, um, the last, I don't know, several years, um, the constituency has overwhelmingly recommended that we open May 1 and run continuously without those uh, staggered closures in the summer. Which follow up? Richard. Um, Th thank you, Marcy. And, and so just to make sure I understand, so that that uh, um, chart you have here represents roughly 97 days or they're pretty close to, and not, uh, not exact, but pretty close to. So, all right, th thank you. All right, thank you. Further questions from Marcy on the report? And I don't see any hands, so thank you very much, Marcy. And then we will move to Heather Hall and the WDFW report. Heather. Thank you. I'll uh, summarize supplemental WDFW report um, under this agenda item. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife held a meeting with recreational halibut anglers on October 4th, 2022. Uh, this meeting was held to discuss proposed changes to the CAT sharing plan for 2023 and refine the proposals that were developed uh, during our public meeting held in August and that were adopted for public review in September. In September, the recommendations for 2023 uh, seasons adopted for public review included options that would increase access to the Puget Sound sub area allocation by allowing more days open per week um, and options that included either up to five days per week or seven days a week. Uh, there was broad interest uh, in a status quo season structure for coastal sub areas, which are marine areas one through four. From our discussions in October, um, oops, page down, um, proposed changes to the cat sharing plan are recommended and presented um, below that allow for expanded opportunity to achieve the Washington sub area and overall sport allocation. And although bag limits are not provisions of the catch sharing plan, request, request to increase the annual bag limit from four to six fish for 2023 were received and discussed at the October meeting. Um, our stakeholder responses to this idea were mixed with some voicing support for a six fish bag limit while others opine that the status quo or the four fish bag limit provided sufficient opportunity for anglers. Uh, we'll consider this further um, 
throughout the next year to allow an updated bag limit analysis, um, which we hadn't completed since 2013, and explore how to address uh, practical and regulatory constraints associated with the current catch record card system to allow reporting up to six fish. In summary, for all of our Washington catch sub areas, changes to the catch sharing plan, supporting flexible in season management have pr proven particularly valuable and aided responses in 2020, 2020 and 2021 to reduce access to or closures of some of our ports and to severe inclement weather in 2022. This flexibility has allowed consideration in early June after getting through the spring fishery dates of shifting allocation between sub areas based on a review of catch information to understand whether port closures, low catch rates or other factors were restricting or likely to restrict the ability for sub areas to achieve their allocation. For example, attainment of the North Coast sub area allocation has been it significantly impacted by reduced fishing effort, a residual effect from the port closures in 2020 and 2021, mm -hmm. and severe inclement weather, particularly on the coast, in, and increased fuel prices statewide impacted fishing effort in all areas in 2022. Catch rates in the Puget Sound sub area have been low in recent years, also resulting in under harvest allocation. During these years, stakeholders have supported an in-season management approach that utilizes remaining allocation to provide the South Coast and Columbia River sub areas where the sub area allocation has typically been taken uh, mainly in the spring, some additional fishing opportunity in June. And it also allows for late season, season opportunity in August and September for the North Coast and Puget Sound sub areas. Uncertainty about whether reduced or shifted, shifted effort will persist. Uh, flexibility in the number of days per week and the ability to share allocation between sub areas is critical to meet allocation objectives for the Washington sport fishery. Our, we have a WDFW recommendation to revise the catch sharing plan language to allow halibut fishing up to seven days per week in August and September to maximize fishing opportunity and achieve the Washington sport allocation. For the Puget Sound sub area, our discussions re regarding this area were focused on a season structure that would allow more open days per week in April and May, and that aligns the season start dates in Marine Area 5 with Marine Area 6 through 10. This is a departure from past practice in which Marine Area 5 seasons were aligned with the North Coast sub areas, um, Marine Areas 3 and 4. This change from Marine Area 5 and the recommendation to open more days per week in April and May, when halibut fishing is generally more productive in Puget Sound, are responding to a recent pattern where Puget Sound allocation has not been attained. Oh, should I did it again. Uh, so our recommendation here for the Puget Sound sub area is to revise catch sharing plan language to um, allow halibut fishing in Puget Sound up to five days per week. That's Thursday through Monday during April and May, and then up to seven days per week during June, August, and September. For the North Coast, Columbia River, and South Coast sub areas, which are on the coast, our discussions uh, relative to these areas centered mainly on a largely status quo season structure and stakeholders agreed to the status quo season structure um, that's really supported by flexible in-season management approach, um, which is the preferred alternative for 2023. Um, departing from the status quo, uh, stakeholders in the South Coast sub area, which is Marine Area 2, did request opening three days per week instead of just two. This is a change that is currently allowed under the existing catch sharing plan language. And the request for three days per week anticipates the likelihood that weather conditions may preclude fishing at least one day per week, and thus intends to prove the, the opportunity achieve, to achieve two actual days of fishing per week. Uh, so again, um, an, this is a repeat of the recommendation from earlier where we would revise the catch sharing plan to allow opening coastal uh, sub areas up to seven days per week during August and September. And uh, based on the input we received, 
we recommend the council adopt the following season dates for the Washington sub areas. Um, and I just want to note that um, under Marine Area 2, we missed a date. So um, it would be open May 4th through May 23rd, three days per week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Um, but it would be open also um, Thursday, or excuse me, Tuesday, um, May 30th. We didn't get that date in here. And then uh, we do provide um, our proposed changes to the cat sharing plan here um, down below. Um, but we'd be happy to work with uh, council staff and uh, National Marine Fisheries Service um, as those changes are um, drafted, if there are any questions. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Heather on the report? And I don't believe I see any, so. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Marcy Aramco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Heather. Um, <coughs> forgive me. Um, <laughs> there, there's a lot of detail um, in the proposal and in your existing season structure. And uh, given your, you know, the number of coastal sub areas that you have, um, I'm. I, I always struggle to put together all of the pieces. But can you refresh me what the situation is in the month of July? Um, there are references to all the other months in your report, but I'm I'm just not clear on. July. Thank you. Good question, Marcy. Um, we typically don't have our halibut season running during the month of July. That's it's a very salmon um, focused month. It's it's a challenge for our sampling program to produce uh, weekly estimates uh, that we manage our quotas to for both of these high intense fisheries in July. So that's the primary purpose for the pause. It focuses generally, um, and, and, and I'll step back a little bit to say, we really hadn't ever had any halibut fishing opportunity in August and September um, prior to the pandemic and our port closures and all of that. Um, so we generally didn't have to consider any dates past the end of June. Um, so it's, it's primarily a sampling issue. Follow up, Marcy. No, thank you very much. That's that's very helpful. <laughs> right, thank you. Further questions for Heather on the WDFW report? And now I think I see no hands there. So that completes the state management entity reports. We have a gap report and Bob Alverson is here to present that. Good afternoon, Bob. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. This is agenda item E1A Supplemental Gap Report 1, November 2022, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel thanks Ms. Robin Elke, Pacific Fishery Management Council, and Ms. Lynn Mattis from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Resources Program for their assistance in reviewing this agenda item. The GAP supports the analysis of certain changes for coastal Oregon and Washington recreational opportunities suggested by ODF&W and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife at the September 2022 Council meeting. Those suggested changes were reviewed by the public in meetings conducted by Oregon and Washington prior to the current November Council meeting. The GAP supports those proposed changes as listed in the ODF and W and WDFW reports for implementation for the 2023 season. Additionally, the GAP supports the Macaw Tribes International Pacific Halibut Commission regulatory proposal, which would retain the area 2A 1.65 million pounds fixed total catch exploitation yield adopted by IPHC in 2019. As noted in the tribe's proposal, the fixed TCEY has provided a consistent and biologically justified TCEY for an area which has minimal impact on the larger halibut biomass in the north. 
Regulatory Area 2A represents a small fraction of the Region 2 allocation and of all the overall Pacific halibut stock. As such, a higher IPHC Regulatory Area 2A TCEY than what may be indicated by the biological distribution of the stock estimate, which the IPHC Secretary generates, will not create a biological conservation concern. The fixed TCEY has benefited both recreation and commercial sectors and eliminated much of the conflicts between the sectors. It also reduced the vari variability and uncertainty of all Area 2A fisheries. The gap supported the Macaw tribe's original proposal as noted in our November 2018 gap statement under agenda item F1 and we support the tribe's request for the 2023 catch sharing plan CPS. The California Rec Recreational Sector appreciates the comments from California Department of Fish and Wildlife Supplemental Report under this agenda item. The allocation and resulting quota are perhaps constraining the fishery more than anticipated and California Recreational Fishery may have a greater capacity than assumed in 2015. California recreational fishermen would like to consider changes to the CSP in the future in order to maximize their fisheries. Therefore, the GAP supports additional consideration of CPS changes as the process moves forward. The GAP, the GAP recognizes the council will take final action on the 2023 CPS CSP at, at this meeting and that it is too late to make changes for 2023. The GAP requests potential changes to the 2024 CSP be con scheduled as early as possible in 2023, specifically June, to accommodate further discussion. As a matter of process, the GAP could begin scoping this agenda item in March uh, gap agenda only, no council agenda item, to identify the primary concerns. This would serve to focus the range of suggestions for public scoping during the June council meeting. More information from this year, including the fishery changes and landings will better inform the scoping process in 2023. That concludes our comments, Mr. Chairman, under this agenda item. Thank you, Bob. Any questions for Bob on the GAP report? Phil Anderson. Uh, with your indulgence, Mr. Vice Chair, we're very fortunate to have an IPHC commissioner sitting with us here. Uh, Mr. Alverson has uh, done a great job of representing the interests of, of the U.S. and in particular 2A in that role. And as we know, the Halibut Commission is confronting a significant um, challenge and issue relative to allocating um, the quotas between the various catch areas. And I'm just wondering if Mr. Alverson could give us an update on the, uh, the commission's deliberations. And uh, he was kind enough to do that at a previous meeting and appreciate an update. Yes, please, Bob, if you yep. can. Mr. Chair. <clears throat> About two weeks ago, we received a uh, proposal and we exchanged proposals with Canada. Canada's proposal is a request for a national share and they would like to have 20% of the coastwide distribution of, of halibut, um, o o over 32 inch distribution of halibut. Currently in the four year agreement that we've had, that was based on a 70% on their historical landings and 30% based on uh, the um, halibut surveys. And that produced approximately 18 to 18 and a half percent of the coastwide uh, harvest of, of halibut. So they've upped their game, they're up their request to 20%. Um, additionally, they, they would like to see a 10 year agreement the U.S. commissioners would like to see a longer commitment if we can get uh, agreement on a core allocation scheme. They've also requested some uh, oversight of the North Pacific Council's partial coverage observer program, which is not being taken too well. And, um, and then um, 
they have a charter boat request. Uh, they'd like to start their season or, or implement a three fish limit. And this is a big issue for Southeast Alaska uh, uh, for um, charter boat operations beginning in June. If someone can, when they have a two fish limit in Alaska and if Canada could start with a three fish limit, this would be a real problem. So the Canadians have, have um, up their requests and uh, the U.S. position uh, is trying to keep the allocation scheme within region two. So uh, our proposal is basically looking at their 20 year history of landings um, out of out of region two and coast wide and that comes to about 15.7 percent. And so which is about 50.1 percent of region two. So our proposal back to them was um, to keep it within region two and um, at the at what a number that creates that 15.7 percent. And in both the Canadian and the U.S. position, uh, the two-way proposal is one at 1.65. So you guys are being held harmless at this moment, but we are a long ways away from uh, an agreement. Um, we have a meeting November 9th, and then um, we added a day to our interim meeting, which will be the last week of this month. And then we have a couple scheduled for December and um, and uh, Jan early January if we need it, but uh, we're a ways apart on any agreement at this point. Thank you, Bob. I'll look around for uh, any other questions for either uh, Bob Elverson, the GAP representative, or Bob Elverson, the IPHC <laughs> commissioner. And I'm not, oh, excuse me, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Bob, and thanks for your service there in the IPHC for all the years you've been doing it, so thank you. Um, I had a question, you, you mentioned that the Canadians are questioning the electro, is it the electronic monitoring or is it the monitoring in general in the fishery in Alaska? What are they, what, what, is, what are the specifics of that if you know? It, it has, Mr. The Chair, it deals with the partial coverage observer program we have on the catcher vessels. So the catcher vessels have a, currently this year, for instance, the fixed gear people will be monitored at 15%, the trawl fleet at 20%, 25%. And they wanna look at statistics and analysis of that if that's adequate. Um, so this is rubbing the US kind of raw. If you, and so this is. Thank you. And they know that, you know. So 85% of this is what percentage they're gonna take and the rest, a lot of these other things will fall away or we can find agreement on, but. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Further questions? And I don't see any, so thanks very much, okay. Bob. That completes all of our reports. We'll next move on to public comment. I know there are at least three signed up while that screen is coming up before us. I'll remind everyone that there were five comments submitted through the web portal that were available to everyone uh, prior to this meeting. So we'll just give our technology a minute to catch up here. And we'll get to the signups. So we will start with Tim Klassen, followed by Wayne Cotto. Uh, Tim is here in person, so welcome. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, representative for the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association. It's a charter boat association in Northern California. I'm also the Northern California charter rep on the GAP. And I have my own charter boat in uh, Eureka. And I'm here to support the GAPS position that uh, we evaluate the um, catch share plan this next year, set some uh, the time aside for the meetings in uh, June uh, or sooner. I believe the GAP discussed uh, um, 
having a discussion about that in their March meeting. So uh, we'd like to see that go forward. Um, it's too bad we can't go backwards. Uh, you know, as you heard, California ran out of fish pretty early this year. Um, there was a lot of fish left on the table that uh, we could have used. Um, but I understand that uh, a lot of those fish couldn't be used used uh, in their own states in in uh, in good ways too, and we encourage that as well. Um, this next year and for a few years, I think we're going to have a problem with uh, our coilback rockfish in Northern California. We've already lost uh, over a third of our rockfish season there, um, so we're definitely looking for other uh, options to fish for something that uh, can take the effort uh, off of the rockfish. Um, a lot of times salmon does that for us, but uh, in the Klamath management zone, we don't have super high hopes for early plans for uh, full salmon season. So anyways, I just want to uh, uh, voice my support for uh, evaluating the catch share plan here in the future and see if we can't uh, scrape together a couple of fish for California. That's all I had. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim on that? Jessica, Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Klassen, for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Can you uh, let me know? So we've had issues, at least in Oregon, with gas prices. Can you elaborate on how gas prices affect your operations? Yeah, so thanks. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so we have an interesting situation. Probably the um, biggest port for Pacific Halibut is out of Eureka, Humboldt Bay, and then probably Trinidad would be second. Um, out of Eureka, our rockfish grounds are about 25 miles from the port and our halibut grounds are about six miles from port. So we definitely can save fuel fishing for halibut and, uh, you know, salmon would be even better. And then of course, weather's the other thing. There's days that uh, you can get out and fish for halibut when it's too rough to uh, make the 25 mile run to the rockfish grounds. And, uh, you know, salmon would be even better because they're usually closer and stuff. And can I, I want to add one more thing that I forgot to mention before is California does have a one fish possession limit also. So if, if you're a single person, you can only have one fish in your freezer. You can't load them up with 20 or 30 fishes, even though we have a one fish, uh, we fish every day. So thank you. Thanks for that question too. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Further questions? And I don't see any, so thanks very much, Thank Tim. You. Next, Wayne Cotto. Wayne will be followed by Dave Kashida. Good afternoon, Wayne. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, Chair, Council Members, Staff. Wayne Cotto again with CCA California. The California Recreational Anglers also appreciate the comments for a CDFW supplemental report under this agenda item, as well as the GAPS report. We believe that the underutilization and available of the available resource opportunities exist for others, and it's unfortunate that we're wasting, uh, as we all struggle to get more time and, and maximize our catch for business and pleasure. It goes back to that needing of flexibility and trust that we are looking for, for the best outcome for all. With the track record the last five years, we would like to consider changes to the CSP in the future in order to maximize our resources for all. What we're looking for are crumbs in the overall scheme as we only have 4% now. We understand that the, these are late changes and probably unusual, unrealistic for this meeting, but we're looking at the future to take advantage and show the public that we understand what's going on and we can make these changes for the good of all of us for 2024. Uh, in closing, again, we, we, represent, or we re take the recommendations of GAP. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Any questions for Wayne? And I don't see any hands, so thank you very much. And finally, uh, Dave Kushida. Welcome, Dave. Mr. Vice Chair, Council staff, 
I'm just identifying as a recreational angler today. You know, I just want to say I su support the state and advisory bodies, the written comments, and the comments from Tim and Wayne. In the ocean waters off of San Francisco Bay, the Pacific halibut are there in a population usually in late fall, but by that time, the California allocation has been met. So the opportunity for us to actually target and catch Pacific halibut is not really there. So I think uh, an increase if we get it from the uh, salmon bycatch or maybe the unused portion from other states, that might be an option. So I just want to bring that up. I talked to Marcy earlier today in the uh, California delegation meeting. She said that was something we'd look at. So I just want to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Dave? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Dave, for coming to speak to us today about um, halibut. I um, recall our discussion and I was wondering, can you just clarify um, the circumstances? I, I believe you're fishing out of the San Francisco Bay area where um, other targets, other fishery targets are taking place um, earlier in the summer. You, you mentioned um, you don't have an opportunity to target halibut earlier and then you've run into fishery closures, but maybe you can elaborate on um, the earlier spring and summer activities and how they relate to, to halibut that do incidentally show up in San Francisco. Yeah, well, usually in, in a, like I said, summertime, there's salmon, there's also California halibut inside the bay, and there's rockfish. So Pacific halibut aren't a targeted species. And they show up in abundance later on in fall, late fall. And uh, by that time, usually the California halibut's not really happening. Rockfish, if you want to try, salmon's done. So, but the quota is filled by then, so we don't have the opportunity to even target the uh, Pacific halibut. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Further questions for Dave? And I don't see any hands, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you for listening to me. That concludes all our reports and the public comment on this topic. And gives you a, as our screen comes up here, a little chance to digest the information. The action before us is up there. Adopt any final changes to the 2023 catch sharing plan and final changes to the 2023 annual fishery regulations as necessary. So open the floor here, look for any hands, uh, initiate the discussion. Phil Anderson. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just had a couple comments I wanted to make before we dive into the business of motions. Um, the uh, recreational fishery in, in Washington, um, up until the pandemic times, um, was fairly predictable. Um, the um, the quotas in Puget Sound were being taken or exceeded. Um, the quotas in our North Coast, South Coast areas were were being taken in six to 10 days of fishing for the year. Um, but the, the pandemic um, wreaked havoc on a lot of things, including our recreational fishery for halibut. Um, probably, I mean, uh, setting aside the, the effects of individuals venturing out to go fishing, um, we had a host of state uh, restrictions on, on our boats, on charter boats. Um, we had our, our, our probably the, the two ports that had the highest catch rates over time Nia Bay and the push were both closed by the tribes. So you couldn't, there was a little bit of access to area four, but had to come from CQ in order to do that. Um, people were driving 40, 50 miles to get to the grounds. Um, there was some effort change or effort transfer, I believe. I, I uh, just, 
uh, this, the Westport and Ilwaco both experienced um, higher, higher effort um, in proportion to the North Coast areas, which had kind of been the predominant uh, areas. Um, and then this year, um, we were hoping to see things settle out a little bit, but um, I don't know about the rest of the coast, but we had some of the worst weather in May and June when the majority of our halibut catch had been taking place than, than I've seen in, in a long time, which um, made a lot of our openings non-events. That coupled with the, the fuel prices, um, um, people are, you know, we're are from Nia Bay, it's a five, six hour drive from Seattle, four hours, four to five hours to La Push, a couple, two and a half, three hours to Westport. And Ilwaco's two, two and a half hours from Portland area. And, you know, people were just, if they're either bringing their boats down, just getting the boats there, let alone the cost of fuel, um, also had an impact on our fishery this year. So we've had three years of just um, very unstable, abnormal conditions. And so it really makes me nervous about trying to dive into a big review of our catch share plan as it relates to Washington's fisheries in a time period when we've had so much upheaval uh, in the fishery and we're looking for how is this, how's this gonna settle out uh, once we get back to some, whatever normal, whatever the new normal is. I'm pretty sure the new normal is going to look different than the old normal. Uh, so I'm just expressing that as a concern from a Washington perspective and just expressing and sharing a little bit of things that you've already heard about what's going on in, in our fishery and perhaps the other states have experienced similar things. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Further dis discussion, comments or discussion on this? Marcy Remco. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just thinking about the uh, discussion um, we've undertaken here since September and the scoping of proposals and the um, acknowledgement that there have been um, some changes both uh, in the environment and um, uh, seemingly somewhat with availability of fish, which may be connected to weather or um, any other number of things. Um, I appreciate the um, the proposals that both states have brought forward, and I do think um, they will um, make a difference uh, looking to 2023 and better utilizing um, our available uh, resource. Um, just looking at the some total in the NIFS report um, looks like a, we're totaling up around 84% of what's available. Um, so there's some some room to to grow in some sectors. Um, that said, I um, I want to acknowledge uh, the GAP report and the thoughtful remarks that they've made about um, their willingness to begin some discussions early, uh, perhaps in March. Um, there are other sectors here too um, that I think might um, warrant consideration um, in looking at the CSP holistically. Um, we've looked at uh, the performance here pretty closely in the uh, recreational fisheries. Um, I'm just thinking about, for example, incidental salmon. Um, we haven't attained those uh, allocations uh, in full, I think, for a, a, a few years, we've, despite making adjustments. Um, so I, I just appreciate, I think, the GAP's um, willingness to have some discussion um, and think about potential changes as needed to, to better utilize um, what's available to us. Um, I also want to just 
point out that they're not suggesting the council take anything up um, at in March, but just that the gap have some discussion. Um, so I think that's a a thoughtful plan, and um, that might allow us to consider um, adjustments to the catch sharing plan through a three meeting process rather than a two, um, as I think they've recommended that we um, have a a council hearing um, in June in addition to September and November. So um, just wanted to echo support for that recommendation from the gap. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Further discussion or not seeing any up, oh, excuse me, Heather Hall. Thank you. I. I'm ready to make a motion if we're if there's no more discussion. Well, I'll ask once more, but uh, I'm not seeing any hands for discussion. So please go ahead with your motion. Thank you, Sandra. I'm ready. I move that the council adopt the proposed season structure, season dates, and proposed changes to the cat sharing plan for 2023 as described in agenda item E1A supplemental WDFW report one, November, 2022, including adding Tuesday, May 30th to the proposed season dates for Marine area two. Thank you, Heather. What's on the screen is as you intended. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Seconded by Butch Smith. Go ahead and speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, the recreational seasons proposed in the WDFW report reflect a significant input and compromise from recreational stakeholders uh, from our multiple sub areas. Uh, the sport fishery is still stabilizing followed, following the pandemic where we saw closures of two ports that provide access to coastal areas and productive halibut grounds. We have a history of sport seasons that last a matter of days rather than months. We've carefully considered season structures that maximize access to the sport allocation, but in a precautionary way. Um, and I would note that the recommended season structure for the Puget Sound sub area is a compromise between the two options that were proposed for public review uh, by opening earlier in the season at a five day per week, and then adding um, transitioning to seven days per week later on. Uh, and this motion also includes a correction that I mentioned when reading the WDFW report um, in order to align the season dates that were recommended um, for three days per week in Marine Area 2. All right, thank you. Any questions, clarification for the maker of the motion? I don't see any questions, so open the floor to discussion on the motion. Any discussion? I'm not seeing any of the discussion, so we'll go ahead and call for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Heather. Any further motions? Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I have a motion. I move the council adopt the recommended changes to the Pacific halibut catch sharing plan for the 2023 fishery as outlined in agenda item E1A supplemental ODFW report one. Thank you. What's on the screen is as you intended. It is. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Seconded by Krista Svensson. Go ahead and speak to your motion if you desire. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. In addition to the rationale provided for each of these recommendations in the ODFW report and mentioned in my summary, all the ODFW proposed changes are meant to allow more flexibility for fisheries managers to react to the 2023 allocation and allowing more opportunities for anglers to achieve that allocation at higher levels while remaining precautionary at lower levels. Uh, as I stated, all these measures do not need to be used at once, but can be used as needed. Thank you very much. Any questions for the maker of the motion? I don't see any questions. Any discussion on the motion before us? 
And I'm not seeing any discussion, hands for discussion, so I'll go ahead and call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And are there any other motions or discussion here? I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to turn to Robin and ask if uh, we have done everything we need to do on this agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, you have. We have the WDFW recommendations uh, as uh, provided in their report with the addition of the May 30th date and the ODFW uh, proposals as recommended consistent with their uh, report under this agenda item. So I think that does the work. All right, thank you. Any other comments before we close out this agenda item? And I don't see any hands, so we'll close this agenda item and I'm going to turn the gavel back to our chairman. All right, well done, Vice Chair Pet, uh, Hessemer. So we have one more agenda item for the day, um, and I, I think we should be able to get through it and still be able to make um, the banquet this evening. So uh, Robin, please uh, get us started here on E2. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I am aware of the time constraints. So um, this is agenda item E2 for the 2023 commercial directed fishery regulations. This is final action. You'll remember back in September, the council adopted for public review a status quo season uh, for the structure of 2023, which is a three day opening beginning at 8 a.m. on the fourth Tuesday in June and going through 6 p.m. of Thursday of that week and then have additional fishing periods occur um, every other week as um, until the allocation is taken. Uh, so this is what you guys did in September and you have some reference materials um, under this agenda item. You have a gap report uh, from your advisory body and you also have uh, a supplemental attachment one. Uh, this attachment was a little bit late to the party but Acknowledging that NIMS is taking over the management of this directed fishery, um, it seemed appropriate to be prepared to include some language in the catch sharing plan, plan acknowledging that transfer, so omitting some of the references to IPHC and inserting uh, some of the tasks that NIMS will be now doing, so that is a strikeout document um, that we would like to be able to include those administrative changes. Um, so with that, then your action under this agenda item would be to um, adopt the final 2023 commercial directed fishery regulations for NIPS impl implementation. And I think that wraps up my summary for E2. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much, Robin. Are there any questions of Robin? All right, not seeing any hands. So we will go to, uh, we have one report, it's from the GAP. So Mr. Alverson, front and center. So Mr. Chairman, this is agenda item E2A, ground fish advisory subpanel report. The ground fish advisory subpanel received an update about the commercial directed halibut fishery for 2023 from Ms. Robin Elke, Pacific Fishery Management Council staff officer and Ms. Lynn Mattis from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and offers the following comments and suggestions. In September, the GAP recommended analysis of the 2022 commercial directed regulations under management of the IPHC beginning imp being implemented for the 2023 fishing season under National Marine Fisheries Service Management with no changes. That analysis has been completed and the GAP members are not aware of any suggested changes from the public to this recommendation. As noted in our September 2022 GAP report regarding the 2023 season, the GAP supports the continuation 
of the current regulations for this fishery for the 2023 fishing season. For reference, those options include three-day openers that run from 8 a.m. Tuesday to 6 p.m. Thursday, and openers set every two weeks. The GAP acknowledges that vessel limits for the third and subsequent openers may differ from IPHC managed limits as necessary. As noted in September, the three-day openings provide flexibility and improve safety. The recent shift to a Tuesday to Thursday opener also provides benefits to fishermen and buyers. The GAP reiterates the need for certainty and regulations as much as possible regarding vessel limits and subsequent openers. This, fall, this allows fishermen to maximize their business opportunities regarding halibut and other fisheries. In contrast, the uncertainty of vessel limits and three-day openings beyond the first two openers could negatively affect fishermen's plans. For example, some may opt to switch their deck gear to, for, or equipment to participate in a different fishery or make other business decisions that would preempt their return to halibut fishing if the openers were set more than two weeks apart. Furthermore, the GAP suggests the addition of halibut to the electronic logbook being developed for the non-trawl groundfish fishery. This would make more information available to NIMS and for better management for the fishery in real time. It also might allow the fleet to only fill out one logbook rather than two logbooks. The GAP thanks Ms. Elke and Ms. Mattis for their continued assistance to the GAP regarding halibut agenda items. That concludes our comments. All right, thank you for that report. Are there any questions on the GAP report? Thank you very much, Bob. That completes all the reports. We have no public comment. That takes us to our council action here. We have a final action on this, on these regulations and there was the additional issue of administrative changes perhaps to the plan. So let's get started with any discussion on this agenda item. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question if it's appropriate to ask uh, Mr. Lockhart. Of course, put him on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Lockhart. Uh, we heard just now in the GAP report that it's important for the fleet to have certainty of the additional openings. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to the likelihood of being able to keep kind of that status quo on those initial openings or on those additional openings. Um, thank you for the question. And um, this has been a topic of discussion for a while now and our ability to kind of to, to do that. Um, we do have more process involved than IPHC does uh, with regards to that. But um, right now we think it's possible and we certainly will try to meet that. But I can't absolutely promise that it will be done. Thank you. All right. Mr. Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another question for Mr. Lockhart, if I could. Frank, you heard the request for an a electronic logbook that the GAP report mentioned and being maybe uh, part of the non-trawl groundfish fishery request as well or regulation. Is that something you think is doable? Could it piggyback that and would it be a mandatory logbook and perhaps solve some of the delay in data that we have in that fishery? Um, thank you for the question again. Uh, we haven't had a lot of time to, to, to think it through, but um, I think our initial thinking is that it is potentially something that we could adopt, um, but we still need to work through some of those issues. <clears throat> Any other questions for Frank, or is there any discussion on this agenda item? or I would entertain a motion if there's no discussion. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Gralnick. I do have a motion. Thank you, Sandra. I move that the council adopt a season structure for the directed commercial fishery in 2023 
that would be a series of three day openings beginning at 8 a.m. on the fourth Tuesday in June and ending at 6 p.m. on the Thursday of that week. Additional three day openings would occur every other week or as soon as practical Tuesday through Thursday until the directed fishery allocation is obtained and if NIMS implements final regulations transitioning management of the directed commercial Pacific halibut fishery from the IPHC to NIMS, make administrative edits to the catch sharing plan as needed to reflect the final regulations consistent with agenda item E2, supplemental attachment one, November, 2022. Thank you, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Jessica Watson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, this uh, motion basically captures uh, the status quo season structure for the directed halibut fishery. Uh, the gap supported the season structure uh, in their statement in September. And then again, um, at the November meeting, um, it includes the idea that these three-day openings would occur every other week, but also noting the effort by National Marine Fisheries to do that as soon as practicable for their um, these changes that are um, shifting management. Um, and then also recognizing uh, the final regulations are coming that shift uh, transition of management of the halibut fishery from IPHC to NIMS. This would um, update the catch sharing plan to reflect those changes and and align with that new um, management structure. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there questions for the maker of the motion? Is there discussion on the motion? All right, I'm not gonna drag this out. Well, uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. Abstentions, motion passes unanimously. Heather, thank you very much for the motion. Let me, before I turn to Robin, let me see if there's any other action under this agenda item by the council. I'm not seeing any hands, I'll go to Robin. How are we doing on E2? We're doing well, Mr. Chair. We've adopted a season uh, consistent with that provided in the uh, situation summary and also have language uh, ready for the catch sharing plan once the uh, final rule is uh, gone through for NIMPS uh, transition of the management of the directed fishery. So yes, we've done it. Thank you very much. Well done. All right, well, that concludes our scheduled business for the day, but I will turn to our executive director for any announcements or predictions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I predict that we have a banquet this evening. Um, it begins at uh, 5.30, doors open. Uh, we'll start uh, the meal at about 6.30. Um, if you head out here and take a left and go past uh, the Starbucks, there will be signs and it's that way. Um, so again, doors open at 5.30 if you're planning to attend. And um, we'll see most of you there. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. All right. Have a great evening. We'll see you tonight. And if not then, we'll see everyone tomorrow morning.